a fantastic race, and thank you so much, Couch, for that illuminating commentary. Very nice. <laughs> All right, guys, that was the Super Mario Sunshine race. Coming up next, we have Final Fantasy. Uh, you know you're going to want to stick around for that. We've got a couple messages from our sponsors, and then we will be right back. All right, and we are back. Looking forward to that final fantasy run coming up next. Uh, we're going to have a couple donations here. We got $200 from Top Hatta. Thinking of the aunt I lost this year to cancer while watching my girlfriend's favorite speed run. Thank you, AGDQ, for your good work. And we got $500 from the Dope Fish because it would be tragic for Dan to get left behind for the FF1 run. We've got $100 from Anonymous. I lost my uncle to cancer a few years ago after a very long fight. Here's to you, Uncle Anthony, and to hoping no one else has to go through that same struggle. We've got $20 from Pyrosaur. Super Mario Sunshine, more like Sun Fine. Brofist to all the runners and staff. Keep up the excellent work. We got $50 from JagJ97. Got to donate for a sunshine race. My favorite game as a child. Shout out to Bouncy Boy. We got a $10 anonymous donation. Shout out to everyone running the event. You guys kill it every year. 
Also, Nick, will you marry me? We've got $30 from Anonymous. Hey, GQ, how could I not donate when my favorite streamer is racing my favorite game? This goes to Bounty Boy's Choice, and good luck to all the runners. Hashtag Shred Squad. We've got a $500 anonymous donation. Hey guys, I figured that since I finally have money to spend freely, I donate for the first time. My aunt had breast cancer and passed away from leukemia a couple of years ago. My dad also had a mild case of melanoma several years ago, and both of my grandmothers have had also had breast cancer. $100 goes to Paper Mario's incentive, and $100 goes to each of the runners for their choices. Good luck to all of you guys on the race. We've got $5 from Prince Gooby's 129. It just says, Happy birthday, Panga. Okay, and before we get to the next run, I'm going to throw it over to the interview desk where Spike Vegeta is sitting with our sunshine runners. Everyone's celebrating having are. that many viewers and the donation shows <laughs> and everything. Um, okay, so I had all these questions prepared, but uh, I'm going to start with this one. What? That was amazing. That was <laughs> an absolutely unbelievable race. Uh, I don't know. What are your guys' general thoughts just right now? What's running through you guys right now? Wow. Uh, <laughs> it was amazing how that, that close. That close. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was so much fun watching each of you guys because as Bouncy got the last hit for Bowser, all of a sudden Trey's coming around the side, Razzy's fishing, Panga's coming around the side, and then the green glue. I mean, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that was just so that was so Bowser just does that. I want to oh, wow. ask each of you guys a few individual questions before we get to the questions from you guys. Again, if you guys have any questions for any of our runners as we're doing these interviews, make sure to send them at Games Done Quick on Twitter, use the hashtag HDQ 2017. Bouncy Boy, I want to start with you. You beat yourself up a lot, honestly. I saw you, I watch your streams enough to know you beat yourself up a lot for your run at SGDQ. You feel like you kind of underperformed. You did a good job on commentary, you felt like, but you come back now and you do great. You get a one high 117 in this race. You even won it. How does that feel for you right now? It feels amazing. I mean, yeah, I was like super nervous the past two runs I've done. The first one, I like lost a terror, like, terribly in a race. And then I had that run where everyone remembers I jumped over the shine. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, How did that feel, Bianco 6 diving right into that shine? I, I went right into it, and I just had a little pop-off right there. <laughs> it was good. Trey, you were right there. You kind of, early on in the race, you kind of fell back, I think even into fourth place, maybe beating yourself up a little bit right there, but you were slowly gaining with your consistency all throughout the run. And then you're, not to pick on you, Bouncy, but you're seeing, I'm sure, out of the corner of your eye, Trey, <laughs> There was a little nokey chokey going on there <laughs> right near the end. For sure. What's uh, I mean, what's going through your mind at that point? Do you think you could actually catch him? Like I knew the bouncer was going for green cycle, which is insanely hard. Like I can't do it myself. Mm -hmm. So I figured like maybe there's a chance that he'll choke. And when he did, like my heart started <laughs> racing. Like if you have a shot at this, I don't know. Um, but you know, I didn't choke quite enough. Honestly, like <laughs> me starting out kind of behind. I've raced SMS a lot in my career, and that's been like a common trend. Where, like I start out kind of bad, then like slowly. I gained my consistency, and sure. then I've been in that position a lot. Have so. you played the most out of anyone at this table? I've been playing the longest, for sure. For sure. Um, I mainly do 120 shines, and any percent yeah. is also like one of the main things. So. 120 shine, I find to be an amazing speedrun category. Defend to me why this should be at a GDQ in the future. Again. 120 shines? Again, because I know you've done it at a GDQ yeah, recently. Yeah. Um, it's, get, it's gotten a lot of like unique tricks in recent months and years mm -hmm. since the last marathon run right it's gone in like 15 minutes like in the total world record time wow and i think like in the next couple of years we could see like a sub three hour maybe oh wow if i grind it some more and some other runners do as well so i think we can all look forward to that coming up here pretty soon in a couple of gdqs just throw that out there <laughs> strong man i don't know if a lot of people know this you weren't even supposed to be in this race <laughs> yeah <laughs> You know, like I, I walked backstage, you guys are getting ready for commentary, it looked like you were kind of the main commentator, and then they're like, oh, by the way, 30 minutes beforehand, switch roles, you are in the race right now. 
What was going through your mind at that point? Well, I knew I was the backup runner, so I was like, I was prepared to run, and I thought I had a pretty good run at the big, like, 28-person race the other day. Mm -hmm. And so you beat me in, like, th 30 minutes. It was crazy. <laughs> I was a little yeah. nervous. I decided to listen to some, some chill tunes, listen to the theme of King JJ from Your Ice. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. Pretty good song. Calm me down a little bit. <laughs> I'll trust you on that one. I might check and, it out myself. Uh, yeah, I was just pretty confident in my consistency, so I was, I was fairly calm going into it. <laughs> Penga. So the opposite of Trey, you are extremely new to this game. How long have you been playing Sunshine now? Almost a year. Almost. Mm. Almost a year. Almost. This is, by the way, you're yeah. already in, I believe, the top 15 or 20 of SMS any percent. Yes. For anyone who doesn't know, SMS is one of the most competitive speed games in the entire world. There's like 700,000 times in it. Um, I'm like top 500. I feel pretty good. You, Ray, <laughs> in less than a year, you've achieved that. Are you just addicted to Sunshine? What's going on, man? I think uh, when I first started the game, I felt I had some potential to be one of the top runners, so I just kept playing it. And then after watching like Bouncy Boy stream for like almost a year, I was like kind of inspired to also be as good as him. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan. Do you intend on keep grinding at this? Do you want to keep climbing those leaderboards, look at top 10 and beyond? I think I might take a small break because I have grinded for a while, so sure. it's easy to get burnt out. But eventually, I think I'm going to try to get top 10, if not top 5. I want to go ahead and knock it over to some Twitter questions. Again, at GameZoneQuick, use the hashtag HDQ2017. Let's go ahead and start off with this one. We've got from Eli Hodab. Which of the tricks or techniques used in this run was the most difficult for each of you to master? Honey skip. Oh, I am a honey skip master. You were beating oh, yeah. yourself up about it. You didn't <laughs> want to go for it. <laughs> I would say the eel fight took me the longest to learn overall. Sure. I don't know how you guys are such good dentists in that. It's impossible. <laughs> uh, I would have to say EYG. That was like kind of a new trick, and it's, it's kind of hard. There's a lot of stuff you got to adapt with, so sure. I think that was definitely for me the hardest. I'm going to say Noki 6, because that movement took me a couple of days of just straight grinding to learn. Sure. I want to ask you guys from Jimmy DeMello right here, how did you guys get into Sunshine Speedruns? What is it that, uh, there's a lot of questions like that, just what drew you to speedrun this game? Um, a while ago, I saw some GDQ videos, uh, specifically OOT, and then I was like, well, I played Super Mario Sunshine a ton as a kid. So I looked it up, I found uh, Samurai Man's uh, world record at the time, and I watched his stream a bunch, and uh, eventually decided to just like do a run while watching his like tutorial video. And I just got hooked right away. Uh, there was a really funny like Let's Play series called Super Mario Sunshine Versus. Oh, okay. It was about, like, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I've seen like, the Josh SM64 Jetson version of that. Two Cans. Yeah. And that kind of hooked me into like, oh, maybe people do this like really seriously. Sure. And that got me like the, the I saw the GDQ videos online, mm -hmm. and you know that sort of you know snowballed. So. I love hearing that every time we have runners on stage putting on amazing runs, and it was GDQ runs that initially brought them to it. That's <laughs> yes. awesome. You? Uh, well, I was a huge fan of Sunshine as a, as a kid. I played it every couple of years, and uh, eventually I was like, oh, I wonder how fast I can beat this. Like, I hadn't even heard of speedrunning. And I beat it, it was like two and a half hours, and then I went online and saw Samurai Man's, I think it was like a 13108 or something. And I was like, oh, this is super cool. Watched some streams a couple months later. It was summer, so I had like a lot of time. So I was like, oh, I think I can maybe try to get in this, you know. I was another one of those people that watched the GDQ VODs, and I watched Bouncy Boy and Cap race Hoverless at SGQ15. And it kind of got me, didn't, it didn't inspire me quite yet, but when I went to HDQ and talked with all the Sunshine Runners and the whole community, they kind of, they kind of, that's when they inspired me to run it. So that's when I started learning after talking to them and say, hey, this is a really cool game. Has it been almost a little bit surreal for you, Panga, that it was right there, I think it was about Rico 2, you and Bouncy were literally frame for frame right there at the start. <laughs> yeah. It's a little surreal that you've come that far, you've caught up with a lot of your inspiration for it. It is, because I don't expect, like, or even imagine people to be as good as, good as fast as I did in, mm -hmm. within a year. So being able to be neck and neck with Bouncy is pretty, pretty impressive to me. I got one more question I want to use for you guys right now from Misty, the one and only Pokemon. Any tips on someone who wants to get into running Sunshine? Uh, definitely talk to the community. We're like, I would say Sunshine is like one of the most friendly communities in the world, not just Absolutely in speedrunning. Agree. So uh, yeah, just come into our chats, talk to us. like. There are tons of tutorials and resources, so yeah. Uh, make sure to watch a variety of runners, because often there's like different yeah. strats used for different levels, so you can like really like judge which one works best for you when you're learning. Yeah, kind of going off that, I would say definitely don't be afraid to like try slow, easy strats first. Like that's what you do a lot of the time if you mess up the fast strats, is you know the easy strats from when you had lower or higher times, so you can get those back. Another general tip: just keep practicing. 
Yeah. If you see yourself wanting to get better, try new strats, practice that, gain consistency, and eventually you'll be able to get better times. I definitely recommend talking to any of these gentlemen or any of the other like 500 people in this community about something <laughs> called practice codes. I'm just throwing oh, that out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still yeah. not practice, but I should get them. <laughs> Those are pretty good. I want to, once again, thank all of you guys for being here. I want to remind you guys, coming up right after this, we have got Final Fantasy by Feasel and Jire. Unbelievable this game can even be done in a marathon. we got a couple of awesome prizes you guys can donate for. We've got these adorable little chocobo cubes. We've also got, oh, a little further on screen. Oh. Here's the full thing, what they look like. Two different pieces. There you go. We've also got an awesome garland curler for the game. Oh, a little shine on it. There we go. All right. I'm not Vanna White. I never claimed to be. And also, all throughout the night, you guys can donate. You guys can check out more of the details on the tracker, exactly how much you need to do, uh, donate minimum. But we've got the NES Classic here coming with a second controller. Uh, lots of great prizes. We're not even halfway into this marathon. We're already coming up on $500,000. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to all four of you. Bouncy Boy, Average Trey, Strongman, Lynn, and Benji and Panga. I'm surprised I remembered all your names right there. Thank you everyone for the questions. Send it back up for Final Fantasy I. What is up, stream room? What is up, chat? We are back here at AGTQ 2017. We're about to kick it off with Gyre and Fiesel on Final Fantasy 1. I'm going to just kick off a couple quick donations that have piled up that uh, have some money attached to them. We've got Rabram85, no comment, but a $1,000 donation there. It's okay to clap for that. We have Get a fix from France with a no comment $300 donation. And Fuzzy Commando with a $502 donation invited all my friends over to watch this craziness. We all love AGDQ and everything it's doing for PCF. Shout outs to Wintergreen, Laser Bomb, Sporty EDR, Pixels, and the rest of the 502 crew. All right, and they are just finishing up with some preparations. We're just about ready to get started. All right. With that, I think I'm going to kick it over to Gyre and Fiesel for Final Fantasy. Please enjoy. Hey there, Hello. everybody. Hi. Welcome hey. into Final Fantasy. So I'm Gyre. I'm Fiesel. Hello. And I'm Poexel. So this is probably, well, one of my favorite games of all time. It's one of the classic RPGs of our uh, kind of generation for everybody up here on the couch and stage here. So Absolutely. I'm hoping we're going to have a good time. And let's go ahead and get this show started. Are we ready for everybody back here to get started? I think so. Man, I'm not I'm hearing ready. anybody in the crowd being ready. Are you guys ready? They're asleep. Yeah. They're already <laughs> asleep. <laughs> all right, there we go. Yeah, this will be a pretty comfy stream. So pull yeah. out those pillows, pull out those blankets. Um, we're going to have all kinds of butt-clenching moments throughout the run, but at the <laughs> same time, it's also a run which has a lot of good times and memories in it. So let's go ahead in three, two, one, go. All right. Now, like any classic 1980s RPG, they throw you in with absolutely no gear at all. Um, if you take the wrong step outside of town, you're probably going to get killed off pretty quickly here, so we're gonna go ahead and get some melee gear for all of our characters. Yeah, when the prologue says four warriors arrive, each holding an orb, they mean that. They're yeah, holding an orb and it. nothing else. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So, find uh, rapier is a pretty good sword uh, for the red mages and the fighter, and we're gonna get the chain armor. That will go on all four of our characters as well. Uh, and that's gonna use up pretty much all of our money. Just start out with uh, 400, all right, so. Yeah, even though we've got caster classes here, we don't have enough money to buy any spells, and you don't really have any spell charges to use those much. Um, it's kind of a limitation for this game in terms of the overall mechanics. Like, you are very, very restricted as a magic user, although they do become powerful towards the late game. Yeah, but in the early game, the red mages are really nice because they do uh, serve as decent fighters. They're not great, but uh, two fighters and two red mages, that's probably my favorite party combination for a casual playthrough. And even the world record run used uh, two fighters, two red mages for a while. Right here, you get five first inches encounter. chance to strike first. There, there it is, goes. five inches chance to strike first. So that so means I've done all my RNG manipulations correctly. Now, Mr. MV ran away, and this could be the best possible Garland time. 
Um, we're trying to get frame perfect inputs on those actually. There is a lot of detailed RNG work that's going to be done throughout this game, starting with this next battle, which is going to be a ghoul by himself. Now, the reason we know what was going to happen in that battle is because the game, uh, the in-battle... Oh, oh, we didn't is, get it. We didn't get it? Oh. Yeah, it was two frames off. Right. So uh, the in-battle RNG, it, there's a, a table for it, and that uh, in-battle RNG, when you beat the game or when you start up a fresh cart, like if you take a new cart out of the box that's never been played before, the RNG is going to be in a certain state. And the battle RNG is actually stored on the cart. So if you use the cart at all and then you know try to start a new run, it's going to be different RNG. Only things that reset it are beating the game and letting it play out to the very end of the credits. That'll reset the battle RNG. Um, taking the battery out and letting it discharge, that'll reset the RNG. You know, taking a fresh card out of the box that's never been used. Or you could sit there and spam the power button on and off and on and off for a while and, you know, really just blast that cart. And if your cart survives, then that will also clear the RNG. Yeah, yeah we, we recommend uh, beating the game instead of right. the uh, alternatives. It's not yeah, actually not all that difficult to beat the game once you get the speed run right down. Um, this is a game which, for casual play, is really frustrating, and for you know, world record attempts, as Beazle can probably attest it's to, it's extremely frustrating. Oh, really frustrating <laughs> there, but um, we have built up over time a lot of really good strategy for making this a marathon safe run. So here we go. I've beaten Garland, our first boss. He failed to knock us down. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead and collect my princess, which is eh, kind of an okay reward. Bridge, this is a little bit more valuable. I'm going to take a bridge in exchange for the princess here. And because we're stuck with it, might as well get one musical instrument as well. Yeah, we'll be kind of bored along the way, so yeah. play us some tunes. Let's yeah. play some beautiful music. Yeah, you don't want to forget the loot. Sometimes that happens, and you won't find out to the very end of the game that you wish you had it, but you don't. Uh, so now at this point, he could go back in there and refill his health, refill his spell charges. Yeah, why not? You know, but he's we'll, not. We'll, he's go, we'll go past right it um, and go and get some spells for our mages instead. This is going to be setting up an RNG manipulation, which allows me to skip the very first encounter coming up here. We're going to go ahead and get cure spells for both of our mages. And you want to get the cure spells first because you want them to be in the first slot in your spell list. Otherwise, you're going to uh, lose a lot of time menuing because you're going to use cure a lot. I think I'm going to grab here is a 10. This is going to be used to set up the RNG. And I noticed the Townsman has just walked directly in my path. So I've got bad RNG on Town Guy. Let's see, does he go right? No. Nope. There you go. Let's me out. So there are three exits there, north, south, and east. The east one is the fastest, but uh, we don't always have the opportunity to do that. Now here we go, the Bridge of Destiny. We've beaten the game, we've gotten the princess. We beat the game, like, there's the credits. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, woo! All right, time. Yeah. All right, and I want to stop with this game, yes. programmed by Nasir. Uh, Nasir is a real person. Nasir Gabelli was the main programmer for this game. Probably you could describe him as almost the only programmer for this game. Um, and he went on to do all three of the Famicom Final Fantasies as well as Secret Amana. Um, prior to that, he was doing Rad Racer, 3D World Runner, other games for Square. So this was really his first RPG experience. We've now completed all cutscenes in the game, too. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it for cutscenes. Cut yeah. All right, you saw uh, he used the tent, and then he walked a little bit till an encounter was about to happen, and then he reset, and then he was able to keep walking right past that encounter. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that's uh, part of the step manipulation um, that we're doing in, in this route to be able to avoid uh, a lot of the enemies that we would normally face. And as I walk over to Paroka here, um, since you guys did meet the... Erdrich and Senef. Um, we decided to attach a little bit more to that than just visiting Erdrich's grave. There was, back in the days when um, Final Fantasy first came out, a series of trivia contests that Nintendo Power did. And so we're going to ask you questions from those trivia contests. Go ahead, donate with the correct answer, as well as name your favorite Final Fantasy 1 monster. And since we're starting with Erdrich, the very first trivia question is, how old was Erdrich when he died? That's right, so donate and put the, uh, put the answer in your comments. Ooh, all right, so the Yeti already took a bit of a pounding. Yeti is uh, taking the role of Dan in this. If you've watched <laughs> any of these runs, you know that Dan uh, meets a lot of misfortune during these runs, and so already it's beginning. Yeah, that was a pretty unfortunate hit there. So hopefully we will get a good battle with these ogres here. I need to get the ogres plus pirates of Provoca in order to get level uh, three here coming up. But again, we get an ambush to start with. So that's going to be already the ogre getting a little bit ahead of us. And I'm down to one single cure spell, so we might have to stop in a town if we uh, are going to be completely uh, in trouble here before getting into the next battle. Yeah, this is probably the riskiest part of the game here, just these first few fights. As silly as that sounds, like at this point we're so under-leveled to be fighting ogres, but they're the best source of experience in gold, so we're just going to suck it up and do it, and we'll see what happens. This is real dangerous uh, stuff the next few battles. That went well. Now, since I didn't get my double ogre there, which is what I wanted, I'm going to go ahead and provoke a second battle here. Um, hopefully, this is only going to be a single ogre. 50-50 each time that we do one of these, where they're going to get one ogre or two. The worst case here is two ogres in an ambush. So 
Again, we're hoping one ogre. Ideally, chance to strike first on top of it. Good. Oh, nice. perfect. That's nice. wonderful. Look at that. That's not something they can manipulate, by the way. They, I mean, they can manipulate um, certain things about which monsters they get and which tiles they encountered them on, but uh, pretty much everything that happens inside the actual battles is random. Right, yeah. The in-battle RNG, it covers uh, damage, it covers um, the hit percentage, uh, which who targets whom, and it also covers how many monsters appear. Each of these monster formations, it's like from you know this number to some other number of each of these monsters, but how many you actually get is all dependent on that in-battle RNG. So we don't manipulate any of that other than in the very first encounter that you saw with those five imps. That's the only time in the game we'll do that. I mean, if you could be frame perfect throughout the entire game, it's 1,500 frame perfect inputs or so to beat the game optimally. <laughs> um, that's probably <laughs> a little bit hard to get done, but you know we saw some really good Mario runners, and they do a lot of frame perfect inputs in those runs. So maybe one of those guys could sit down and show us how to do this. I think eventually we'll see a run of this that looks sort of like the new Dragon Warrior runs, to be honest, eventually. But yeah, tell us a little bit about Dragon Warrior runs, because you did bring that up. That's something that's been relatively recent in terms of RNG manipulation. Uh, yeah, just um, using buffer techniques to basically replicate uh, kind of what the task does, to be able to do things on exactly the right frame to manipulate the RNG. That technically is possible in this, it's just that that, hasn't, that whole strategy hasn't been developed yet, but uh, it's definitely something a couple of us are, are looking into, so you may see that sometime. So these pirates are noteworthy in that they are the lowest HP enemy in the entire game. They only they have two fewer hit points than even imps have. I mean, the only real danger here when he has uh, four characters that have chain armor is getting a crit by one of the pirates. It's about right. a one percent chance for the crit. So as long as you've got thirty-five or more hit points coming in this battle, you don't really have to worry about it. And you can also um, get some wood shields, which I'm going to do after this, which will decrease the amount of damage that the fighters are taking as well. So there we go. Good pirate fight. And we get level three, and that was the reason why we had to fight two ogres, because we wanted to make sure that after we beat these pirates, we're at level three. That gives us uh, additional spell charges, and it gives us additional hit points, and that's going to be, both those things are going to be critical. All right, we got the ship, and it kind of smells of pirates, so we're going to try to get rid of this as soon as we can. Yeah, he just tossed us the keys to the, to the pirate ship. All right, so now I'm going to do those wood shields that I promised, and shields are one of the best items that you can get in the early game. They're very cheap. They give you a decent amount of absorb rating, um, which is how much damage is subtracted from every single one of the enemy attacks. And they also have no weight penalty. Um, weight is going to impact your ability to evade whenever a monster attacks you. Yeah, each bit of defensive item, it gives you increased absorb, but it also decreases your evade percentage. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Go ahead and get three tents there. That's going to be used for some more of those RNG manipulation setups. And I'll go over to the other side of town and pick up a black magic spell, the ice spell for one of my mages. I'd love to get more. Um, by the time that we finish this, we're going to have two ice spells and two short swords. Look at that guy go. <laughs> this guy, what's this punk doing? I don't know. Thinking like he owns this place. Now, those guys don't actually become visible until after you've beaten Vicky. So the townsfolks in uh, this particular town are all hidden uh, because they're being terrorized by the pirates. And then evidently they feel free to roam around and block your progress whenever you get <laughs> Look visible. At that. It's a stare down <laughs> contest. <laughs> At two Mohawk man. So now he's going to save the game, and he's going to immediately hit. Uh, he's going to hit the uh, power button there. He's going to do a hard power cycle, and what that's going to do is reset the Ooh. monster group. And there's he knows exactly where it is. Mm -hmm. The monster uh, monster RNG and the step RNG are both going to get reset back to their initial state. Now, so ideally, I'm going to have four or five Kaizus in this fight. There's one to five that's going to appear at random. Um, so I'm going to hope that in the second battle I get a little bit more. I want to get enough money from the Kaizus plus some ogres coming up in order to get a level four plus be able to do the rest of my shopping. Yeah, secondary benefit too is skipping having to walk out of Provoca too after he stays right. at the end. Yeah, he could have done that even with a soft reset. The nice thing about doing a hard power cycle, and you can do this even in a casual playthrough, this is a really good way to get gold. These Kaizukus are worth uh, 120 each, and anytime, just go save your game someplace, uh, power the console off, power it back on, and go out into the water. First encounter you get is gonna be Kaizukus. Just keep doing that over and over again. That's a really great way to get gold in a casual playthrough. Well, maybe, because there is actually differences between systems. Yep, Why don't you explain a little bit about that? Okay, yeah, so some, most top loaders, well, all the top loaders we've seen all have the, the, the standard RNG, as we call it. But some of the front loaders do, some of them don't. So you might find, you might want to just test your console out and see if you get that. Yeah. The reason why, too, is that Final Fantasy is a game that uses what we call uninitialized memory, which uh, kind of the short version is that um, it beh the RNG behaves differently on s different model NES consoles. So a little, uh, another Kaizuku fight. If he had had more Kaizuku in the previous fight, he wouldn't need to do this necessarily, but we need a certain amount of money because we have to buy two short swords, 
Uh, we have to buy another ice spell. We've got to buy the iron armor. And then eventually, once we move on, we're going to have to buy uh, two lightning two spells. And that's going to be 3,000 gold there, uh, plus uh, some heals and some cures and some tents. Yeah, this is also the game's amazing English translation at work, too, because we fought pirates in town, and now we're fighting kaizakus, which means pirate in Japanese. Right, so that manipulation that he did right there gave him enough steps. It put him to the right spot in the step RNG table that he was able to walk that whole distance. So at this point, we should probably talk about the two different um, RNG tables that we're manipulating here. There is, is uh, one thing that we call the monster uh, monster formation RNG. And uh, there's a table of 256 values in memory, uh, each one from one to eight. And that uh, number tells you which of the eight monster groups that you're gonna get in a particular zone, one through eight. And that's gonna vary uh, based on what zone you're in. Uh, a zone can be an entire floor of a dungeon or in the overworld, it is a grid of the overworld map. The overworld map is uh, it divided up into an eight by eight grid of squares. And uh, in each zone, the, those numbers, one through eight, correspond to different monster formations. The other uh, bit of RNG that we're manipulating here is the step RNG table. There's another table of 256 values that lists uh, this, the threshold for whether, when you take a step, you're gonna get uh, a monster. So every time you take a step, it advances you one unit through that table. And in that table, there's a number, and you compare that number to a certain threshold that's based on the zone. Or, uh, I mean, that's based on where you are, the overworld, or a dungeon, or the or the ship, uh, and there's a few dungeons that have certain floors with special um, special values that are different than normal dungeons. Uh, but essentially, we know exactly what encounters we're going to get on exactly what steps. And if you find, you'll find that if you play through the game the same way, taking all the same steps every time, you'll always get the same monsters. So what we're going to do now, we need to fight a lot of ogres. Ogres are our best source of both experience and gold, which both we need right now. We need both of those things. And we're going to hop around between a couple of different zones and sort of cherry pick all the ogre battles out of them. And there's a surprising number of them if you know exactly where to go. Yeah. And so that's how we're going to really uh, shortcut this, this grinding. Yeah, because I think the, be the beginning of original Final Fantasy is just pretty notorious for how just grindy and slow paced it is. Just because you need some levels and you need good equipment in order to have any shot of getting the crown, which is our first main... Uh, storyline item and if you're if you're just walking around and fighting battles in this area uh, you're not going to be seeing anywhere near this many ogres there's going to be a lot of various kinds of poisonous enemies that yeah. you'll uh, run into regularly yeah, yeah i think it's about a 25 percent chance of running into ogres and you'll see that we are we are going to get far beyond those it's lucky be almost here. completely ogres that you're going to see here in the early part and that's another thing about the, uh, poison uh, poison is expensive because every time you get poison it's 75 gold to buy a pure potion to undo it um, so we're not even going to buy pure potions yet, and that's going to save us a lot of money because we're able to just avoid all the poisonous encounters and not even worry about that until we get to the Marsh Cave. But right now, our target is to get our mages to level 6, which is the minimum level you need to be to use the tier 3, the third tier uh, magic spells. And the other thing we're going to need to do is buy the Lightning 2 spell for each of those mages. And the reason we're doing this is to get by the wizards in the Marsh Cave. The Marsh Cave is our first dungeon that we have to do, and the wizards, I don't know if you've seen a Final Fantasy run, they often end the, the run right there. You know, even in a casual playthrough, you probably had trouble with it. But going in at level six with Lightning 2 on both of our mages, it should be no problem. We'll mow them right down. Because yeah, right. a lot of elements of this game uh, came from Dungeons and Dragons, uh, one of which being how the magic system works. There's basically every time, or th there's levels for each spell, and every time a mage type character levels up, they gain um, a number of kind of charges of uh, certain levels of spells. So even though you can buy spells if you have money, there are level requirements just to be able to cast them at all. Yeah, very much like D&D. And in later versions of this, they replace it with the magic point system, where you can use the same MP for all the different spells. But in, in here, it's like each level of spell has a certain number of charges, and those get restored only when you either stay at an inn or whether or if you use a house. Those are the two things that'll bring it back. Yeah. I think another thing worth pointing out about these two ogre battles, too, is that like a lot of um, older um, NES RPGs, if, if you target an enemy and then that enemy dies, any additional attacks you have targeted towards them will just whiff completely. So as once he's done some damage to the first ogre, he's going to start splitting up his attacks to try to minimize his odds of just wasting attacks. Right, and people sort of prefer that rollover. You know, if you attack an enemy that dies, you want it to roll over to the next one. But actually not having that rollover adds a lot of strategy. Mm -hmm. The combat 
you have to really be thinking. You have to be watching how much damage you do. You have to know the hit point values on all the enemies. Yeah, versus the way this would be, where you yeah, just, you just, you're just hold holding a, the A button, and, and basically. the battle would be yeah. over. Yeah, for Otherwise. example, those ogres, I know they have 100 hit points each. I have to count how much damage is done to each one of those to make sure that I split them up optimally. And then try to guess also about things like, well, how much is the mage going to do? What's his chance of actually hitting versus he's just going to whiff and cut me into another round for those. So. Those are like kind of the calculations going on. I'm going to go ahead and buy that ice spell as well as get short swords for each of my fighters. Short swords are a really good weapon in the early game. They're not quite as powerful as this hand axe that you have as your second choice in here, but short swords got more accuracy. That's going to be really important when we get um, up to this uh, next level here, which is going to be level five. Okay. Hey guys, guess what? Hmm. Yeah, it's me, the donation guy. We've got a donation with the correct answer to our first trivia question. Oh, nice. So Test Zero sent in $25 and says, Erdrick was 29 years old when he died, or 28 if he died mm. before his birthday. Good call. We Both answers. Right we would have accepted yeah, either one. one. Yeah, but we'll see Erdrick's grave here pretty soon once we get over Delfland. All right, he's bypassing a couple of encounters. He wants to get the nice ones, not the obnoxious encounters. Yeah, I can skip past the Kaiser Cruise as well now that I've got enough cash. So this is actually a little bit faster to skip them on the boat because if you've got a certain number of steps that you need to hit for the next encounter, the boat's going to move more quickly than you walk on land. Right, but you have to know that the next encounter that you're going to hit is one that would occur on both land or on water because um, water has the, lowest, uh, has the lowest number of encounters, the fewest encounters. So there are things that would be an encounter on land but would not be on water. And uh, dungeons also have fewer encounters than, than the, the outside does. So yeah. it's just a matter of knowing, you know, which encounters you're going to get where. Yeah, and since we're starting a new loop of ogres here, did we want to use this as an opportunity to talk about the character classes we're using for the run? Yeah, why don't you go ahead, Beezer? All right, sure. So two fighters, the red party here, two fighters, two red mages, is a really good party all around. Fighters are probably the best source of uh, physical attack damage. Black belts, people talk about black belts a lot, and they are really cool, but black belts don't even start to become comparable to fighters until you get them over level 20, like the early 20s. And they're definitely not going to outpace a fighter with the Masmune until they're in the high 20s, maybe even 30. So Black Belt definitely seems like it's really appealing, but the fighter for a speed run, the levels we're going to be at, the fighter is absolutely the way to go. And any run that you do, is gonna, you're going to want to have fighters in it. Now, as for your mages, you got Red Mages, Black Mages, and White Mages. Red Mages give you a little bit of both. You get some of the Black Mage spells, some of the White Mage spells. There's a few things they can't use, but all the really important stuff they can use. Probably the only thing the Red Mage is lacking that you might really miss is the Harm spell. That's an excellent spell that the White Mage, only the White Mage can use. But the nice thing about the Red Mage is they're not half as squishy as the, as the Black and the White Mages. Uh, the Red Mages are, are definitely much better hit point wise. Yeah, and along with Red Mages being able to equip much better armor too than that's White true. and Black Mages. Yeah, so. they can use a lot of the same stuff the fighters do, and so we're able to actually hand down our equipment to them. Uh, al al almost all the weapons and much of the armor it can be used on the, the Red Mages. Um, the Thief. The poor Thief. <laughs> the poor Thief. Um, that's probably the worst character, and it's not the Thief's fault. It's just a bug in the way that running was programmed. Uh, when you run away, it's, well, it, it's uh, supposed to check your luck value against the enemy's agility value. But because of a bug, and there are many bugs, which yeah. we'll be talking about through this whole run, the running is bugged, and instead of checking it against the monster's agility, it checks it against something in the, the character's data instead of the monster's data. So for the person in slot one, it checks it against the status of uh, like the like poison, stone, etc. the status uh, data for character three. For the person in slot two, it checks it against the status data for the person in slot four. The person in slot three, it checks it against the status data for the person in slot five, but there is no slot five. So it ends up looking at just some junk memory. That junk memory that it's looking at happens to be about 50% high values, 50% low values. So we say that the person in slot three has about a 50-50 chance of getting away. The person in slot four is checking against some different junk value, but those are mostly really high numbers. So that person only has a, maybe about a 10% chance of getting away. So the person in slot four almost never gonna run. Mm -hmm. And the thing about the thief was it was designed to be a really high agility uh, guy that you could use to run away from battles easily. But without that, the thief really is no better than anybody else as far as running goes. So thief is just a bad fighter who can't equip anything cool. Yeah, and then this, this glitch with running away is one of the few glitches in the game that actually helps the speedrun, too, just because it makes running away more reliable at lower levels. At least in the late game. In the early game, yeah, you really game, feel it. Like, yeah. I've had on that very first battle, if you don't have the cart set up correctly for the RNG, my record is 25 can't runs in a row on that first <laughs> set of bips. Yep. Um, but the late game, you really make it up because you're going to be going through a lot of some very difficult dungeons where you just want to get rid of all those monsters as quickly as you can. 
right? There's a few other helpful glitches, but uh, for the most part, there's almost nothing that we really use in the speedrun. The fact that darkness doesn't work, that's something that's helpful, mm -hmm. sort of. And the fact that you wake up from sleep uh, more easily than you're supposed to, that, that I helps. Think that's actually well, I think that's actually there's intentional. There's so many things in this game where, um, because of the fine line between game design versus bugs, I don't like to characterize every single thing as bugs. There's some that are really clear, like you know that um, you can tell that they indexed the wrong thing of memory or there was a programming error, but uh, for game design things, it comes down to, well, you know, they had a lot of people that were doing their first RPG game. There was not big development teams with big QA processes, and so they didn't quite have those discussions about game balance and choices in there. Um, and that is, you can just argue back and forth all day for what was intended for the game um, versus what, you know, in hindsight, they realized would have been better choices for some of the design elements. Yep. And it, for such a broken game, a game with so many bugs, there's a, a list of all the documented bugs, and there's, there's something like 50-something bugs that people have found in this game, stuff that's broken. Um, but none of them allow you to sequence break. There's going to be no sequence breaking in this run at all. We're going to do all the quests in basically the order they intended. Uh, we're going to do the entire game here, just yeah. like you would if I mean you were this your own Because this route's designed to be um, consistently completable for the marathon purposes, but even using a uh, route designed to go for the world record, I mean, the current fastest completion is uh, three hours and six minutes, as uh, kind of buggy and broken as this is, th uh, for the English version at least. The Japanese version actually has some glitches of its own, one of which uh, kind of allows actually some actual sequence breaking. But for the English version, yeah, we're, put, we're basically doing pretty much everything as intended. And earlier during the discussion about the character classes, um, I wanted to say that when we first kind of started putting together what the marathon safe route would look like, and this was, I'm talking about like three, four years ago when we were kind of doing the early explorations, I actually did Fighter Fighter Red Mage White Mage. And it turns out the White Mage is not too bad in terms of the early game because they got that harm spell, which was mentioned there, that lets you mow down undead creatures pretty quickly, get to things like Peninsula Power much earlier than you'd expect. Uh, but in the late game, they just don't have the buffs that the Red Mages are going to be. Uh, so they're going to be uh, very tactically useful for the late game, whereas the White Mage kind of falls off of utility. Yeah, the, the world record run, before I picked the game up, the world record run, uh, it may even still be posted on SDA, I don't know. But uh, that run actually used a White Mage, and it would do stuff like put the White Mage in slot one and then have him cast Ruse on himself. And that was actually a neat strat, but, you know, for little gimmicks like that, you know, to have a character that you're going to take carry with you through the entire run who only gets used for a couple little things like that. It's not really all that worth it. So this is definitely a better party. Um, the current world record run for any percent uses two fighters and one black mage and not, uh, you know, and a dead person in the fourth slot. So that actually is a, a better party for a lot of reasons that we won't get into, but also much riskier having a black mage because that thing will just get knocked out at any point in the game. You could lose it. So um, we mentioned Peninsula Power. Uh, this is something I think came back from, uh, from the Nintendo Power days. People knew about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I talked about the way the overworld is gridded uh, up into squares. And, uh, you know, those are squares, but the, the continents themselves are not squares. So there are some places where the continents actually, po like one continent will poke into a, a, a zone that is part of a different continent. There's a few places in the map that do that. The one that's really well known is uh, if you were to go to the right from Provoca and then go north, you find this little peninsula and you go up to the tip of it and the four squares up at the tip of that are actually part of the same overworld zone as Lefim, which is a place we won't get to uh, get to to the very end of the game. And it's got some great encounters, real juicy encounters, lots of experience there. But the reason why we don't do it in this run is it, the you have to be a high enough level to be able to, to grind there. You need to get that fire two spell and you need to be probably I'd say level five or six, maybe level six before you even have a chance. And there's just at the levels we're at, there's just much better places to grind than that. There's for a us. lot of preparations you have to make for each trip to the Peninsula of Power, too, as far as uh, item, like items to recover your spell charges for the battles and stuff, too. Right, yeah. By the time we're strong enough to be able to grind there, we'll have a much better grind spot available to us, so we just don't bother with it. Now, I just hit level 5, which is a magical spot for these fighters. You have enough accuracy for the base accuracy of the fighter, plus those short swords we bought earlier to get two attacks per round. We can see how much more damage we're doing now. And it was almost a one-shot on that ogre right there. So you very quickly are going to be um, hitting this level curve progression where you're starting to be able to overwhelm the individual enemies that are out there. I'm also taking one enemy that's not ogres in the section. You saw that iguana there before. Uh, iguana is not quite as good as an ogre. 153 experience points versus 195 for each of these ogres that is um, being fought here. But uh, those are just one of those spots where you just don't have any nearby available ogres to go and pick up. That, igu that iguana has a much, much nicer cousin that we'll be seeing later on, though. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
And again, we'll be going up to level six or so for this. So this will be a trip back to town so that we can buy all of our supplies from Marsh Cave as well as give me a chance to get all my spell charges and healing back. So this will be one more loop back out. Um, usually, depending on how many fights there is, it's usually like five or six coming out here. So until we get to level six, why don't we go ahead and read some donations. All right, sounds good. And I do just want to remind everybody listening out there, we're getting a ton of awesome donations in. Um, if you don't hear your donation read on the stream, definitely know it's being read by our donation processors. Um, so, with that said, we've got $50 from Profane Gaming, who says, Hey, Fiesel, I'm not sure how many corn dogs this will buy. I don't mind if you share them with Jire, so long as you save at least one for Warmack. I do like corn dogs. Okay, well, we'll save one for Warmack, though. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are going to see Warmack in this run. Mm -hmm. I know people are probably Thanks asking our, about that in chat. Kind donators. Um, we've got another $50. Uh, from Anonymous, who says, this is for one of my favorite GDQ commentators, Quexel, on the couch, for one of the most important RPGs of all time. Always look forward to his notes on the run. Thanks to all the runners for uh, volunteering for this great cause. Let's see here. Got $50 from Anonymous, who says, had to donate during one of my favorite games. The Final Fantasy music is some of the best of all time. I agree. $100 from Vermilion Core 49 I've been a huge Final Fantasy and Square Enix fan for many years, and it's great to see such a legendary series represented at AGDQ. Good luck with the run. $25 from Anonymous, who says, Two fighters with two red mages? What is this composition? I am hyped to watch this run. <laughs> kind of finished on a positive note there. I guess one more thing to throw out for talking about all those... Um, party formations. There is one really famous formation, which was um, back in the day we had uh, in Nintendo Power once more coming about doing four white mages. Uh, it's a pretty tough run if you've ever tried it. I've done that on the Game Boy Advance. I've got a run on that. It's actually speed run about under five hours for doing that, but on the NES it's a little bit harder. Yeah. <laughs> There's a really good test though of it. Yes. The, 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 the way it defeats the final boss is something you we're you not really going to spoil too. Yeah. yeah, you need to watch that. I guess just search for uh, White Mage TAS on YouTube or something. Final Fantasy. Getting some more tents here. Again, we're going to use this to skip encounters in the overworld and set up some of the RNG manipulations here. Time for more donations, or yeah, you can go, yeah, go ahead. Okay, we've got seventy-five dollars from. Demonware LTD. Final Fantasy for NES is my favorite and my first RPG. I play it once a year and love watching Fiesel and Gyre play it so efficiently. Keep it up, guys. $50 from Rocket Number 9. Wanted to donate during the run of my favorite Final Fantasy. This is in honor of my brother who passed away from cancer last year and who introduced me to video games at a young age. I miss you, bro. By the way, right now I'm kind of feeling the pain of Final Fantasy, which only lets you buy one item at a time. There's going to be some really big shopping trips that will happen here. So this is where we'll have some good times for those donations coming up. We'll be giving you guys a heads up for whenever we're going to go into one of those. There we go. I'm done. Yeah, say what you will about Final Fantasy 2 for the Famicom, but at least it'll let you buy items in multiple quantities. Yeah, buying heal potions is going to get real old. And he's doing that hard reset there, both to leave Provoca quickly, but also to reset his um, random encounter table back to a, uh, a known starting point for future manipulation. And whenever I'm doing these walks around, um, I can go pretty much anywhere as, well, as long as I don't go on safe squares. Um, why don't you explain how safe squares work, Fiesel? Sure. Um, there's Normally, every time you take a step, it advances you one unit in the step RNG table. But there are certain squares, when you step on them, it doesn't advance you. Uh, in the overworld, some of the most notable ones are those docks, uh, the dock the, uh, that you dock the ship at. If you walk around in that, those brick tiles, those are all safe squares. Towns are safe squares. Walking into a cave is a safe square. Anytime you walk onto the boat or off the boat, that first step is a safe square. Same thing with the canoe, onto or off the canoe, all safe squares. Let's see, the gray areas around the town are safe squares. There's a bunch of stuff around Coneria, the very first uh, first town, that are all safe squares. The desert where you pick the ship up, the airship up, that's uh, safe squares. Just a few random things. The, the shadow of Mirage Tower, that's a safe square. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and then we'll talk, once we get in the dungeons, we'll talk some more about safe squares. But generally, this is, um, there's some ones inside dungeons that we make a lot of use out of. And that's why you saw me take that very weird pattern for walking. When we went up to the very first ghoul at the beginning of the game, um, that is something which is actually really tricky to kind of learn the steps that you want. You can actually push the ghoul as far back as where Garland is standing if you want to take every possible safe square. But we do it so it's the very first step inside the Temple of Fiends for getting that battle. All right, so we're just going through the grind again. We need a little bit more money. Uh, the main thing we still haven't bought, uh, we didn't get the iron armor yet, or did you? I got the iron oh, armor already. Oh, so the, the two things we need are, are lightning two, the two lightning twos for the, the mages. And that's expensive. It's going to be 3,000 gold for that. We could run over and pilfer the gold in the uh, the dwarf cave, but we're going to save that, that gold for later because we also need experience, not just gold right now. Yeah, level six is the first time that you're going to get a third tier spell charge, and that's what lets you cast lit two, fire two, cure two, all the good stuff that's going to be coming up at Elfland. I'm about to fight the Green Ogre party here. Green Ogre is the best XP monster in the game. And recently, I didn't know about this, Fiesel found one of those one tile squares that is poking out like a peninsula power. Uh, but this one's a little bit more interesting because it is uh, positioned so that you can actually get this particular battle, the very first battle after power one, for one square near Aston's castle. And I never saw it because it's actually a half tile visually. So I thought, you, like, you know, don't even bother trying walking on that. Right, yeah, it's a single tile. Yeah, what I did is I took a map of the overworld and I, I opened up in, in MS Paint and I actually counted out all the tiles and drew lines for what the overworld zones looked like. And then I went and I scoured all the zones to see if I could find any other places that were Peninsula Power-like things, a, a spot where you could get you could access a late game zone uh, much earlier. And I did find that one tile near Northwest Castle that is part of the Melmond monster set. And yeah, like Shire said, the cool thing about it is you can set up a tent there, uh, save your game, power on and off, and the first encounter you get from that is that um, one Groger and one to two regular Ogres, which is an excellent fight for experience. Um, but I, I used that in my Best of NES run. Uh, I used that grinding spot, but what Jire is doing is actually slightly faster than that, so that's what we're doing here. Yeah, the big thing is you have to take time to get a bunch of tents, um, ideally all the spells and the iron armor so that you don't have to go back to Paroka here. And it turns out that that setup just is a little bit too long to make a difference. Although, for learning the game, that's actually a really easy way because you only have to memorize one spot. You're seeing I'm walking with a really particular pattern going back and forth between all these zones. This is a lot of information for uh, people to pick up as well as um, you have to be cognizant of the fact that when you get to an encounter, it's the, z the tile that you're walking from rather than the tile that you're walking to that's going to determine what the battle is. Um, so that makes it really important that you're being very precise with all of your steps. I've got a $512 donation from Welkotar. Warriors, revive the power of the orbs. <laughs> okay, Sorry, we'll do dramatic that. Voice. Yeah. Just, give, just give us a bit. On it. And Wilkotar was one of the people that actually helped me when I was developing the glitched Famicom route. Uh, one of the people that's really knowledgeable about the in-depth mechanics for Final Fantasy. So there's a lot of great people in the community that um, have worked together to really take this game apart. And there's too many to thank during this run, because uh, I know that I'm going to forget them. I don't have them written down for me, but uh, just everybody that's out there that has worked on Final Fantasy for routing, for game mechanics, for all the different explorations for it, your help has been very much appreciated for the entire community. For Absolutely. That. It's kind of helped get us to this point of being able to do a uh, marathon safe route of this game too for awesome games done quick. Got fifty dollars from Big Fong Balls. Jire, when will you speed run Saga at GDQ? Good luck to my buds on the cam. I mean, I submitted it. I'd love to get into the Final Fantasy Legend series. It was called Saga in Japan, but they renamed it Final Fantasy Legend for the US, which was a series of games on the Game Boy, the original black and white one, and they're really, really fun. Oh yeah. And also very broken. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and bananas. <laughs> fighting an iguana. This is an okay battle. It's not as good as ogres, but it's it's just barely worth us fighting. And I've already hit level six, so this is um, one of the things I'm picking up to hopefully get to level seven by the time that I turn the controller over to Fiesel here. Um, this is getting a little bit extra experience so that he can get a second spell charge, one of those third tier spells before uh, he picks up his section. We just did a hard power cycle there, so we can reset the step RNG and the monster formation RNG back to the initial state. And he's going to do some more tenting to skip some battles in the water here. By the way, did you know you can save the game on the boat or on the canoe? Those are things that you don't really think about when you start to do things like speed running, where you have to know about all these little detail mechanics that make some of these things work. 
And here you'll see him park really far away from the end of the dock, or one tile away from the end of the dock, and just walk along those bricks, and that's just to take advantage of the safe squares. So here we go, we're in Elfland. There's a lot of good stuff in Elfland, including both the Tier 3 and Tier 4 spells. Tier 3 spells, like we said, is one of the most useful uh, levels of spells here. There's Lightning 2, that's going to let us beat those wizards in the Marsh Cave. We'll be back here for Fire 2 as well, because that's really useful. But first, yes. yeah, let's, let's, yeah. let's prove that this is correct answer. So this is something Time to pay respects. that uh, there's Erdrick. Erdrick. A little bit of an inner series rivalry between Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest there. That's um, actually not Erdrick in other versions of the game. They use Link um, from the Legend of Zelda series instead. Uh, but I want to bring up now our second trivia question, now that we've revealed the first one. So when I go back to Corneria Castle here, there is a dancer. What is her name? The name of the dancer in Corneria Castle. Go boot up your Final Fantasy game and check it out. That's probably the easiest one to find from Power On in the new yeah. game. Now I threw away one battle there coming out of that because the battle come the very first battle after Power On this zone is going to be a bunch of werewolves and grimps. The werewolves are poisonous and that formation also has an elevated chance of ambushes. You'll see that um, ambushes are mostly associated with poisonous monsters with a few exceptions where they just have really annoying ambush rates in there. We'll talk about that a little bit as we get to our first major dungeon, which is going to be the Marsh Cave here. That's right. There will be a, a lot of getting poisoned, and there will be some ambushes. Absolutely. I hope not, but... <laughs> well, there, there, there will be, though. <laughs> so, I mean, what level does the, does like Nintendo Power recommend for the Marsh Cave? Like 10 or something like that? Yeah, I think something like level 10 to 12. It's yeah. a little bit over protective for some of these, although, I mean, if you're doing your first playthrough, if you're going through Marsh Cave, it's a pretty tough dungeon. It's really long. You don't know where to go, and you do a lot of exploration on the side as well. Those are some precise resets to get rid of an ogre creep battle as well as a battle with arachnids. And then coming down here, I'm going to take some plain ogre fights. Again, I want to get those levels for um, level 7 before we get through. There's a fixed fight against wizards um, that we talked about as well as a fixed fight against astos. The rest of it I have to kind of earn along the way. Um, and I can't use my ice spells, which we were doing back in Provoking here, because we need all six casts of ice for that battle of Astros. It's going to be a really tough one. That's right. We're going to use the Lightning 2 spells that we have against those wizards, but after that, we're not going to use a house. In some routes, you might see people use a house before going to Astos to get their their uh, their other spells back, but we're not going to do that, so we can't use Lightning 2 for Astos. If anyone's curious, too, just how much time these resets, these soft resets he's doing to skip dangerous encounters save, it's probably somewhere in the order of half an hour along with making the run much more uh, um, safe for completion in a setting like this. Yes, yeah, so maybe like two and a half seconds to buy a tent as well as to use it, depending on how fast you are hitting that power button. Um, and for l at least these early encounters where you can get lots and lots of camp runs, that does really, really pay off. Down in the late game where most of the time, like, you know, our first two fighters are gonna probably have like a 90% chance of running in the late game, so it's not quite as dramatic of an effect. I'll go ahead and drop 110 here. This is, um, this actually get my HP back rather than for our RNG manipulation in there. All right, we're in the Marsh Cave. Um, you don't want to go north in the Marsh Cave. There's just a bunch of junk. We don't need it. We're going to go south straight to the end here. Only a few things we're going to pick up along the way. We already have short swords, um, but we are going to grab another iron armor. There's mucks. These are actually OK for experience, but we don't want to fight them because they hit pretty hard. And this is actually part of that manipulation. When you saw me circling around the Marsh Cave before going in, that's to cause this encounter to be on the first floor rather than the second floor. If I went in directly, I'd get scorpions instead. The scorpions are a much more dangerous monster down here. And speaking of danger, we got a crawl here for the first time. This is our first paralyzing monster. Beazle is going to be absolutely terrified about paralyzation during his section. You can see already one of our party members is down here. It's only a 25% chance of snapping out of that, but luckily, Yeti pulling through there. Right, paralysis is probably one of the most unfair things about this game. Uh, if you've ever seen a speedrun of this, you've probably seen people getting stun locked and just just stuck forever, and the run's over. The paralysis is really overpowered. They w wait, watch the bat. Bat, dude. bat, bat. Okay, watch move. the bat. Okay, okay, good. You're good. Mm -hmm. So that was actually <laughs> really, really tricky because um, NPCs like bats can't move while you're inside of those interior rooms. Which means if he was standing in front of the doorway when I walked in there, he's never going to get out. So you're stuck. You have to go backtrack to the other side. Which means your step route's broken. Um, and that's one of the ones where you have to be really cognizant of what's happening on the other side of the screen from your character. Um, let's talk a little bit about safe squares. Inside the dungeon, uh, doors are safe squares, and the tile uh, above and below a door, those are all safe squares. And when you're inside a room, like right now he's inside a room, the lower wall of the inside of a room is always safe squares as well. And anytime you get into a fixed encounter in the Got dungeon... Got some poison coming up here. Oh, here is this poison sound. Let's hear it again. Yeah, oh, I love it. 
for the RPG Limit Break run, I did a uh, little bit of a challenge to go about two hours with my character poison. You lose a one HP per step, but it gives you a pretty good sound for doing that. Yeah, chat loves it when I don't have my sound on and I just walk around poison <laughs> for a while. They just love that. Uh, tech, tech, the tech crew is very grateful for that pure potion. <laughs> or I should say the audio mixer crew. Oh, poison party mix. Almost. We almost got the poison yep. party mix. Though. So this formation, uh, spider arachnids come and can all appear here. It's a two and nine chance to get all four. We call it the poisonous party mix, which is like Chex Mix, but a lot less delicious. Um, if you show up to the party with poisonous party mix, you're probably not going to get invited back. <laughs> All right, so we're about to face the wizards. They are guarding the crown. That is the next sequence item that we need here. No, this is normally a brutal battle. You can have anywhere between two and four of them. We get only two. two. That's actually bad. We want to see more of them because they're worth good experience. We're not afraid of them at all because we have lightning too. Watch how fast these things go down. Terminated. Oh, come on. Well, that was weak. And... Uh, Yeti will come up. Yeti's going to take this I've got confidence down. that the Yeti is going to pull through here. Nice. Yep, there we go. All right, so wizards down. Easy. Yeah, um, wizards who don't actually right. cast any spells. They don't cast any spells, but they're called wizards in this. Uh, you'll know them from the remakes as Fiska Demons. They're not Mind Flayers. They're another pa a palette swap version of those things are Mind Flayers. In this version, they're called Sorcerers, and that's we possibly the worst enemy in the game. Yeah. You absolutely will not see that today. Another strike first. See, again, these poisonous enemies tend to strike first, which is another jerk thing that the <laughs> game does to you. <laughs> it's about a 40% chance, and even if we're formations that... Um, has an optional poisonous monster, the chance of the ambush is actually associated with the formation rather than the individual monsters. And this is something that will slowly change throughout the game for the ambush rate. Um, very, very slowly though. It's your first party member's luck plus agility score. Every about, I think, 10 points of luck plus agility is going to give you a 1% better outcome on it. So we can't give you exact values for um, what the ambush rate is, but it's kind of estimated around like 30 to 40% for a lot of these here in the Marsh Cave. making our way back here, and you're going to see him just walking along the lower wall of here. These are all, except for those two tiles, they're all safe squares. One last chance of the poisonous party mix. We struck out. We had three shots at it. <laughs> Unfortunately, not able to get it, uh, but hopefully we'll have many more good formations to talk about in the future as well. I've got my next battle, which is going to be the last battle in the Marsh Cave against Shadows. Shadows, I really, <laughs> really hate these enemies, and it's not because they're difficult in any way. Uh, they only do about one damage or less critical hits, and even then it's not too much, but they have the highest ambush rate in the game, and it's turned out to be really slow. So it's an ambush. Surprise. What were the odds? 90% were the odds, actually. Oh. <laughs> um, and because they have such a high ambush rate, uh, we actually routed them out for the rest of the entire game. Now, they did inflict darkness, which yeah. is one of those things totally broken. That does not impact your accuracy or your combat ability at all, so probably the best status ailment to be affected with. Right. It, you'll also see that when we go to Kraken. Kraken will just keep inking you, and that's great, because it does nothing, and it just wastes Kraken's turn. That's like one of the few really beneficial glitches. Here we are, back in the overworld. So I'll actually waste two steps. Let's go explore over here in this corner. I haven't What's over, over here? here I never go over here. Oh, interesting. That's to get rid of all of the nasty monsters on the way up Drastis Castle. It gets rid of the poisonous monsters, the undead, and so on. Instead, I'm going to have two plain ogre fights. And this is something which, maybe a couple months ago, I had a slightly worse route in here. And I saw Fiesel doing a playthrough. And it's like, oh. Go up the right-hand side instead of left-hand side. Those are things like for route optimizations, even sometimes when it's the same number of steps to go to a different place, you're going to go through a different zone and get different possible encounters. Like there's so many things that you can explore that it helps to have a lot of different eyes on it to kind of go and give feedback about, hey, I found this cool trick or I found this way to swap these things around that has made the run better over time. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I sit down and start streaming this game and people just show up in the chat and just dropping all kinds of knowledge and... I don't know, half of the route it really was just con you know, me just collecting the ideas that chat throws out there. It, it's really amazing how many people care enough about this game to look into the technical details. Speaking of the technical details, if you really want to know how this works, look up the Game Mechanics Guide by Astral Esper. Uh, you should find it on, on GameFAQs. And it is an enormous document, but it is just so full of information. Like everything about all the algorithms, how everything's determined, all the stats and spells on everything. It's really a good read. Now we're getting ready to fight Astos here, and uh, Astos says his first spell in his spell list has a spell called Rub, which is 60% chance of instant death on whoever it targets. Hopefully it's going to miss or it'll hit a fighter. If it hits a mage, I have to reset and do this battle again. Yeah, we need the mages to get the experience, and we might not even beat Astos if one of the mages dies before being able to cast a lot of spells. 
Yeah, just because I believe Astos is a lot of physical defense, so magic yeah. is the way to go. Right, the fighters are going to do almost no damage to him. It's going to be mostly the mages. So let's see what he does. He might do a physical instead of doing his spell. I actually hope for spells, because then we have the... It's a physical. The drama out of the way, so it's right. a slower process if we don't see the spell on the very first turn. Yeah. But again, it's the first spell in the spell list, and that way it works is if he chooses to pick a spell, it'll go through the spell list in order, then wrap around once he runs out of them. In this case, Astos, uh, you're going to see the rub, then you'll potentially see slow, then fast, and then if, if it gets past that, it's really, really bad because it gets into the big tier damage spells. Here's rub against oh, Yeti. Nice. Yes, nice. That's great. Yes. We're going to be fine now. Alright, so more light or more ice is this is the last of our ice, so we should kill him here. Yeah, I haven't seen very good ice rolls so far, but there that nice critical crit. hit is going to make up the difference. Yeah, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Right, there that's pretty much nice. the only thing that'll get past the absorb barrier is a crit. Um, you can barely get past the absorb barrier. Yeah, so it's got very high physical defense as well as magic defense. Physical defense means you basically do one damage unless you get a critical hit. Um, magic defense is a little bit nicer because it just means that you don't get the critical damage of doubling um, the magic damage for the attack spells. Okay, with Astos down, we just picked up the crystal. The crystal is going to go uh, over to Matoya, who is going to give us the next item that we're going to use along the way. Yeah, and this this whole chain of kind of item exchanges ultimately culminates in being able to escape from the kind of very limited area of the uh, world that we're trapped in at the moment. Yeah, this little cove that we've been, uh, uh, this pond that we've been boating around in, we can't get out of it until we blast a hole through the peninsula, or the isthmus, I guess it would be, and uh, we can't do that till we've done this whole. Uh, sequence item trading quest. And he stays at the end and then walks and skips an encounter and keeps going. Yeah, I stayed in there to get my lit two charges back because we need to get some more experience for level seven. And the easiest monsters to pick it up on is going to be the aquatic creatures here. They're weak to lightning. Um, weakness is 50% bonus damage, which does stack with 100% um, bonus damage for that critical hit. Monsters that are resistant to an element uh, take half damage of that. Uh, combination basically means that there is an enormous damage range that you'll see for the magic spells. Now for the physical attacks, it will even be bigger than that uh, because of the way that armor just subtracts straight off the top from whatever damage that the monster is going to take otherwise. Probably worth noting too that uh, the, the damage that magic does is consistent throughout the entire game because the uh, intelligence stat doesn't actually work one of many things that doesn't work in this game. So that's, I guess, kind of a good thing at this point, that he's kind of doing more damage than he really should be with uh, lit, like Lit 2 and eventually Fire 2, but that also means that those spells are pretty much totally useless in the late game. Yeah, they start off incredibly overpowered, so that's why you kind of make a sprint to as soon as possible in the game, having those AoE spells. In the mid game, uh, they're still doing decent damage, but the fighters are going to really take over combat. In the late game, the spells just kind of tickle the monsters, so you have to find better things to do with your spell charges. Now here in Matoya's cave, I'm going to go ahead and grab these treasure chests here on the side. It's very important to go grab the treasure chest before you give her eyesight back. That way you've got some plausible deniability about who <laughs> stole all this stuff. <laughs> and it does actually we save can, we time We can always here. blame the brooms. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of the brooms, they do have a very important message for us. Let's see if we can grab one of them here. A magic spell? spell? What does that mean? Mm. Huh. That's the in-game hint for how to bring up the map. Push B and select at the same time. It's a really cool map. Um, but it takes a really long time to draw, so um, <laughs> I wouldn't do it here in the speedrun, but it's uh, definitely something that's impressive from a technology perspective for the NES. We do have a uh, correct answer for our second trivia question. Avin Chaos donated $5 and said, the dancer's name is Erolon. Erolon the dancer. Excellent. Do we want to ask the next one, or do we wait? Well, we're going to wait until we see Erilon. Oh, yeah, if that is her real name. If that's her real name. We have to yes. verify that's correct. All right, I did get the red segment. This helps here because this is going to be a little bit more experience. Uh, makes up for not having one of those wizards um, back at the Marsh Cave, plus uh, nobody dying on Astos. This means we're pretty much at our minimum that we could possibly have going into this section for XP. Right, we want to get to level 7 because that means the red mages are going to get two charges of the level 3 spells, which means two fire twos for each red mage uh, when we start the mummy grind. That's going to be our next grind. We're getting ready to grind mummies at Astos' castle, uh, and we're going to use fire two for that. But right now, we just got the herb, and we're going to go deliver the herb to the elf king. 
I think the prince. I, I've prince? never really kind of kept I up with genealogy. I guess pretty sure it's prince, yeah. 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 And I'm actually cutting through town here to save steps. This gets rid of 10 steps of overworld walking, which turns out to be just enough for me to get back to the boat on the other side. Otherwise, I get into an encounter on the land. Now, the evil chancellor here has been conspiring with us to uh, kill this prince off, so he was successfully put him to sleep, and now we have, you know, he wakes up again, just in time to give us this mystic key. And then, oops, our dagger is falling right into his chest, <laughs> and now the evil chancellor's in charge. Now, we do this because um, in exchange for potentially causing um, a little bit of inheritance to go on here, we do get all of the good treasures in Elfland's treasury. There's a couple of treasury areas that I'm going to be raiding throughout um, this deck section. This gets us a lot of the cash we need, as well as there's just exactly two perfect sets of armor um, from a mishmash of junk that I can assemble together. That way we don't have to ever go to an armor shop here in the early part. Right, yeah, that Mystic Key gets you in a lot of places. It gets you in right here. It gets you into the treasury at Corneria Castle, which we're going to need to do in order to get the TNT. Uh, you can also use it in the Marsh Cave to get a bunch of junk that you really don't want to do, so don't bother going back there. Uh, you can go into Garland's Castle and use that Mystic Key for some things. Um, that's actually interesting stuff in there, but not really worth us going back there. And it lets us get into the, uh, the treasury at the Dwarf Cave, which has a lot of really good stuff in it. Uh, so right now he's going to head over to Corneria Castle to get that TNT. And I'll still be going for the experience until I see level 7. Uh, I want to make sure that I pick up all these shark battles. I've rounded into this uh, four shark battles on the way to and from these different parts of the quest, and I'll have one lit two spell for every one of those, so that makes it pretty fast to move down. Otherwise, a lot of these aquatic creatures do have very high evade rates, so if you try to fight them in the early game, you just miss, miss, miss all over the place, and then uh, they'll be able to do lots of damage to your party in return. Right there, he just took advantage of a bunch of safe squares. Almost all the squares there between the dock and the, and the town are, are all safe squares. All right, time to do our next bit of fever. They do have some big burly guards there guarding the stairway, so we're not going to be able to take the stairs here today. Instead, we'll go around to the back of the castle, and they only have a couple of old men. they got some really bad eyesight and hearing in here, so we'll just be able to slip right by them and grab all the cool yeah, treasures. We're counting on the invisible man in this castle to guard it, but he's off uh, somewhere else. <laughs> All right, we're going to pick up, uh, this room on the right's got all weapons, the room on the left's got all armor, plus the TNT. We're only going to get some of this stuff, though. Yeah, but TNT's going to be our next quest item, and I have no idea how long this has been sitting in this box. Probably decades, given that it's been locked up with the Mystic Key. So this is probably pretty dangerous to be carrying around yeah. this dynamite that's been kind of just sitting there for who knows how long. It would be really irresponsible to give this to somebody who we know is going to use it, too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we are back at Trinia Town, and look, there is the dancer. Let's she see, is. what is her name? It is Correct Airline is wow. the answer to that. And we will ask our next trivia question here, and this is going to be something that Fiesel will be doing in his section, which is getting the power staff. So how much is that power staff worth? Send in your answer to that trivia question along with your donation. You can tell us how much it's actually worth or how much you can sell it for. You sell it for half of whatever its inherent worth is. Either We'll accept either answer. Shopkeeper's probably thinking, boy, you boys are going on some serious camping there. <laughs> what are you going to do with all those tents? What's it to you? <laughs> It'd be really nice if they didn't just throw away the tent. Like, you could pack it up and reuse those things. It's a lot no. cheaper. <laughs> just use it once and leave it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the litterer warriors. A great time for some quick donations while I'm here. All right, I've got one related to a recent item that was used with uh, Modus Ponens with 5450 saying, this donation is locked by the Mystic Key. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a real treat to see three such fine lads playing and commenting on this classic game of yesteryear and raising money for such a good cause. My own mother got some bad RNG in her own battle against cancer and it looks like she's not. it's not going to end well for her, but here is to ending cancer for good. Zelos357 donates $150 and says, I'm looking forward to this hype run of Final Fantasy 1 with Gyre and Fiesel, two of my favorite streamers. I'm putting my money towards the Castlevania Symphony of the Night bonus for tomorrow. Pitch in, everyone. You heard it, folks. And Smith.com with $25 who says, Final Fantasy is my childhood. I literally learned to read playing Final Fantasy 1, 4, and 6. The frustration I had playing, uh, and you make it all seem so easy. Oh, and kill the animals. <laughs> Becky R says, love seeing this classic smashed with speed, FF victory fanfare, and gave a $25 donation. All right, 
We're about done with this man and his fine mustache. Uh, so we will be seeing him again soon. This is actually particularly important that we go to this item shop. Why don't you explain about that, Fiesel, there? Sure. You saw that there are only three items available there. You could have up to five items in the shop. But you notice that every time it redraws that, it draws, you know, it has to draw each item in there, and it takes a certain number of frames to draw each one. So the fewer items that are being sold in the shop, the faster it is to buy potions. So that thing with only three is our best bet for buying heal potions. And that really adds up, because we're going to spend probably about five minutes buying heal potions in this run. Maybe. I think about 220 over the course of the run that yeah. we'll be using. <laughs> yeah, because sadly there is only one flavor of healing potions in Final Fantasy. Yeah, the weakest kind. Like high potions and X potions, ah, who needs those? Our party does. <laughs> yeah, we, we do we need him. All right, so now we're going to go in and visit the dwarves here. And this guy... Um, He's been getting all this money from some insurance fraud schemes, but we <laughs> caught on to his evil deeds, and now we're blackmailing, which I guess is our own evil deeds, but it raises cash, and you can grab the thousand gold about as soon as you get the ship there. We don't do that because it's two trips over to Dwarf Cave, which is a little bit out of the way. Um, and the, at this time, also lets us do, in the same trip, down and raid this treasure area. Now, they do put a nice burly guard here, which was much smarter than Cuneary Castle, but this guy's a bit of a mining buff, so we're going to give him some of that unstable dynamite we have, and then boom, he's just gone. Oh, <laughs> gross. Oh, the humanity. Not even a pixel remains of him. All right, some great loot in here, the cabin. It, there is a cabin inside that, that treasure chest, of course. Mm -hmm. um, some pretty decent weapons and armor. That dragon sword we can sell for a lot. Um, we'll actually use that silver knife. Hope you some. like the first few notes of the right. music for this cave, too. Yeah, the remix here. Yeah, it wasn't until much later that they actually remembered where you were in the song. Yeah, Final Fantasy V actually is the first game that actually remembers where you are in the music. And for US, was it uh, Chrono Trigger or it was, was it Mystic, Mystic Quest? Quest? Yes. There we go. All right, the last thing we picked up out of that treasure chest was a house. That's actually the, probably the most valuable thing there, maybe. It's worth 3000 to buy it. Uh, but we're going to use it because house is so valuable and so useful. It's one of the only things that will restore your spell charges. It's the only thing that lets you do it outside of town. And we're absolutely going to need houses in this. All right, looks like we made our clean getaway. We're not going to come back here again until we have our disguises on to make sure that the dwarves don't recognize us. <laughs> yeah, the only other thing that's in there is a blacksmith who you can uh, get a sword from, but you have to bring him a certain kind of ore that he can uh, turn into that weapon. Let's see where we are in experience as well. I'm thinking about 71. So if I get just a shark by himself, I'm going to be five experience points short. Hopefully we get our red snake win. Otherwise, I'll make it up to you. Fiesel gets a little bit extra there, so you are level seven here at the handoff. And of course, we get the shark by himself. So I will do that slight detour in there, and that'll just be two extra battles outside of town when we get there. Getting close to the handoff. I'm going to be taking over soon. Uh, Jair and I are going to hand off the controller at a couple points during the run. I think we broke this run up into into four parts. So he's doing part one, I'll do part two, he'll be back for part three, and I'll do the last part. One more monster to skip. Yeah, I'm not going to fight that battle. Odd Eye in there is really annoying to deal with since he does have uh, paralyzation. Okay, we're going to sell some of this stuff that we just picked up. We need um, three, at least 3,000 gold because we got to buy Fire 2. Fire 2 is going to get a lot of use in this. Uh, it's just it's basically just as powerful as Lightning 2, except it works against things that are susceptible to fire really well, including the undead. All the undead in this game are susceptible to fire, and we're going to be fighting a lot of undead. So starting pretty soon, you're going to start to see fire get used a ton. Yeah, unlike later games, like there isn't really any way to like use recovery items and undead to damage them. The equivalent is the harm spell, which we don't have access to because of not having a white mage. All right, I'll go ahead and get my fire tools. What I'm going to do is actually stay at the end um, and manipulate the next battle in there to be a group of ogres again to fight. Does a hard power there, so we're back to the very beginning of the monster formation table. And he's trying to get to what some ogres? Yep, we'll get ogres right here. Well, this will be plenty. I'll go ahead and save the game again so that you have the correct RNG to start with. 
So it's also important to be at certain squares, and it does remember which of the four copies of the town that you exited out of. Um, and for these spots, which are really dependent on how many steps you have available and sometimes exactly where you want to be doing your saving, you have to know which of those four copies to make sure that you're going to be doing the correct walking. And there we go, level seven is obtained. So that's now going to be our second charge of those third tier spells yeah. every time that we go and save. Yeah, it's important that he stays at the end after hitting this hitting certain levels too, just that he can actually use his new spell charges that he acquired. Because even though the game ex increases your capacity, you don't uh, um, you don't actually gain use of those until you either stay at an inn or use a house. Oh, All right, and I'm going to skip the first battle here. That's still those werewolves and grimps if you go over to the left immediately. And we're going to have um, pretty much all the battles skipped here. These are going to be ogre creeps here coming up. No! What just happened there? Here, just do a hard power. Could you use a potion instead of the tent or something? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I used the tent. Here, let's go. Let's try it. So we should start back here again. Okay, that's yeah. what's supposed to happen. I don't think I, I hear, I might, might not have heard the jingle there. So it does actually have a certain spot in that cycle where it's actually doing the save to record the save data. So that's something where if you're trying to cut it really, really tight, and we do throughout here to be like as fast as possible with the resets as well as the power cycles, um, you can save like while it's in the middle of that process. Right, yeah. just uh, in case we die during this, or in case someone dies during this grind, we want to save it right here. Yep, these are going to begin the ogre, gr or not the ogre grind, the mummy grind here. So um, there's going to be two to five mummies for each of these encounters. We're going to hope for, generally on the high side, fire two is going to mow them down really fast in here. So basically, no matter how many mummies show up, one fire two is going to pretty much take the same amount of time to do the battles in here. Yeah. I no, mean, even though there aren't regular encounters in Estos' castle, there are what we call trap tiles in front of uh, the two chests on the side there. And, like, our first encounter with the trap tile was the wi the uh, wizards that were guarding the crown. But uh, there's numerous other trap tiles out throughout the game. And, I mean, they're basically I they're infinite, too. I mean, if you, step up, if you fight the battle on the trap tile, if you step off and then back on, you'll get into the same battle again. So... Um, we're going to be exploiting that as a source of really fast uh, battles for leveling up. Nice, wow. and we got five mummies here to start with. Now, you did see Fiesel pick up the power staff there. Again, once we get back to town, he's going to sell that, and we're going to see what the answer to our trivia question is. I've got the answer whenever you're ready for it. Well, I guess, why don't you tell us? So, Rayland McStone donated $5 and says that the power staff sells... This may be incorrect. Power staff sells for 12345 doesn't yeah. sell for that. That's how much it's worth. I so we'll take either answer there. That's probably so what he meant. We would take either 12, 3, 4, 5, or 6, 1, 7, 2, which is the amount of gold you have. And hey, yo, Raylan, you certainly played a lot of fantasy, Final Fantasy, my channel, as I've been doing these practice runs throughout there. So thanks for joining very much to the marathon here. Yeah. You'll notice the first fighter just woke up because after getting put to sleep by the mummies, too. It's. I, I think we touched on this a bit earlier. It's a little debatable whether it's intended, uh, an intended game mechanic or a bug because the two are kind of one and the same in a lot of cases. But if a uh, character has, uh, I believe it's 81 hit points or more, they will they are guaranteed to wake up the next turn after they get put to sleep. Yeah, if a character has 81 or higher, um, guaranteed. Less than 81 is a sliding scale up to 80 uh, for the max for that. Monsters will always wake up, and that's what I think might be the actual bug. Okay. Uh, but in Dungeons & Dragons, there's a bunch of spells which have hit point totals or hit dice um, for whether or not they're going to be effective, like sleep and power word kill and power word stun and things like that. So that's why I'm guessing that they used similar types of mechanics here, because again, you're going to see a lot of Dungeons and Dragons inspiration for um, deriving things like the spellcasting system, and a lot of the monsters are going to be appearing there as well. So am I right in that this mummy grind is what we're doing instead of the Peninsula of Power? That's correct. So correct. back when we first kind of rounded it th this out, and what I did for my RPG Limit Break Run, in fact, a couple of years ago was do Peninsula of Power. Um, I went up to like level 12, I think, which makes Earth Cave so easy. Ice Cave is pretty easy, or, or deals is easy as well. We're going to do Earth Cave at level 8 to start with, which is going to be a lot more of a challenge, but it cuts out a great deal of the grinding. And if you're going to do a lot of levels, Peninsula Power is the best choice for it. But if you just need a couple, since we're going here anyway to pick up the Power Staff, these mummies are much faster than it would be to walk all the way to Peninsula Power, buy like 10 more tents, and try to do all the RNG manipulation setups to get the good Zombolo Troll fights there. So do I have some time for donations during this grind? Yeah, go ahead. 
All right. Let's see here. We've got uh, a couple without comment, but one from Anonymous who just donated $250. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, one down. Pierpont Lemkin donates $225 without comment as well. And another anonymous donation for $256 who says, 8 bits for Final Fantasy and good memories of co-op games with my ex. So um, he used a house there in order to recover his uh, spell charges for going back to fight more mummies. But he used a house, which is the best um, kind of overworld recovery item in the game, immediately followed by a tent, which is the weakest, uh, even though the house topped him off there. And that's because of another bug, which is where when he uses the uh, house, uh, the game actually, or the game will actually save his game and then recover his spell charges. So um, if he'd have just used the house and then reset, he would not have actually gotten his spells back. Yeah, so tent, cabin, and house all start by recovering your HP. Tent, 30 HP, cabin, 60, house, 120. We'll kind of upgrade over the course of the run once tents become obsolete. Then they all save the game, and only the house recovers the spell charges, which I can imagine is what caused that oversight for not realizing how bad that is. Like, if you press reset, <laughs> like, it looks like your game was saved, but, you know, suddenly you don't have the spell charges that you expected when you walked out of that. All right, so we have one of our mages get really beat up there, so you see him pretty much curing between each of these. We don't have anything else to do with these cure spells, so you might as well play it really safe in here. The mummies yeah. hit very, very hard. In addition to being able to put characters to sleep, so if they sleep, the person that's going to cast those fire twos, well, you might not get to cast your fire two that round, and then it's another round of dealing with these guys over again. Yeah, and he does not want anybody to die, too, because <laughs> like, as is often the case in older RPGs, um, Death is a pretty big deal. I mean, um, there's no there's no items in this game that recover from death, no phoenix downs or anything. Uh, the spell to revive characters isn't something you get until pretty late on, especially in the speedrun. And uh, like at this point, if somebody died, he would have to go back to Elfland and visit a clinic in order to revive them. Yeah, rather than doing that pretty much any time somebody is going to die in a spot for this run, unless it's like at the very end of the dungeon, like you're fighting the boss and you die somewhere on that, you probably are going to be using one of these backup saves that we have. And this is one of the nice things about doing RNG manipulation is you've got backup saves all over the place. You're taking a couple of steps in there. We're seeing level eight there. That's what he's looking for for his main thing. This was the third battle in the cycle, correct? I think it is the third. It's yeah, the third is the most time. typical. Um, if you're really, really good luck with the XP, you might get it on the second battle, but it's pretty rare. Um, and if you're kind of unlucky, you'll get on the fourth battle. If you're still not seeing it, then... Uh, you might need to do some backup strats to make sure that you're not going to run short on XP before the end of this. Another reason death is a big deal, too, is that you actually cannot revive dead characters during battle in uh, the original Final Fantasy as well. It'll let you try, and it'll cost you your spell charge, but it'll just say missed. It's, it's <laughs> wonderful. It confuses new players to no end. Um, and even if you do have a successful life outside of battle, it revives them with one measly hit point. Uh, so they just fall over on the next imp that they fight if you forget to go to the end after that. There we go, our mummy grind's gonna be complete here, so Fiesel's gonna move on to the next section of the game, which is going to be going up to where the Earth Cave is. And there's actually two passes that he has to do through this. The first pass is going to be fighting the vampire, which is like the, I guess the first mini boss that we have uh, for this game, followed by our first real of the four fiends, Lich. Um, and Lich is gonna be pretty dangerous. He has, as his very first spell in his spell list, Ice 2, which can do 80 to 160 damage to the party. And we don't wanna see those 160s, um, and part of the reason why we wanted to get level um, 8 here is so that by the time we're at Lich, we'll be level 9. It's the very first time that the Red Mages have a chance to be 161 or higher on their HP. We're hoping for good numbers on that, All right, but we don't always get it. And there it is. Power staff, <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4. <laughs> All right, and so we have our next trivia question, which is, where do you find an inquisitive broom? We've already met a broom in this game, told us a magic spell, but there's one broom that's just going to ask us a question. You need to name what town that broom's located in. Fiesel's here walking over to the item shop. This is really far out of the way, which is why we don't like to use the item shop here in Elfland, but we need to get four soft potions. Um, those are not going to be used for a really long time. It's not until the ice cave that we have our first um, risk of petrification here. There's three um, characters that get petrified in the very first battle, and then one against the eye monster himself at the end of the ice cave. That's why we buy four right there. He also buys um, a house, which is what's going to let him recover his spell charges in between the vampire and lich trips at Earth Cave. It's a really long walk back to Melmon, so um, rather than do that, we just avoid it entirely. Yeah, the real estate market is booming in Elfland right now, thanks to us.
And again, we're continuing to do the manipulations on the overworld to make sure that we get rid of all of the small encounters. We will fight a couple of ogres uh, around the Melmond area, depending on how much XP we see the party has coming out of the vampire trip. This is something which you have to do a lot of improv for to make sure that you're going to be um, getting exactly enough experience points for ideally that level 9 before going in on that second pass. There we go. Fiesel expertly skips the town of Melmond. It's not a very interesting town for us here. Um, the town of Melmond, for plot reasons, does not have a clinic or an item shop in it. Those were both destroyed by the vampires. And unlike modern RPGs where you do the quest, you beat the um, enemy in there, then magically everything's restored. It's going to take them years to rebuild that, so we're never going to have um, those facilities throughout here. That means it's actually really dangerous to die at this section of the game. There's not a lot of options for recovery except for sailing all the way back to the Elfland or Crane area there. Yeah. So now that we've escaped from the kind of lagoon type area where we start, um, thanks to the dwarf blowing open that street there, we're going into kind of our first elemental themed area, which is kind of the domain of Earth basically, where uh, the fiend of Earth is, I believe, causing the Earth to rot. And uh, we're going to do something about that. Yeah, we're going to fight these bulls here. And this is actually a trip in to get some extra experience. So we're going to fight the bulls. And then we're going to do um, actually taking advantage of more of the trap tiles. There's Earth Mentals guarding a treasure chest here, which you're meant to go uh, run into this and be like, oh no, there's this crazy powerful monster. At least I got the treasure chest. I'm never going to come back here again. But we're going to do this battle twice. Um, Earth Mentals are weak to fire, just like the undead were. So we'll take 50% extra damage. Two good fire twos uh, should take one of these down. If we don't get good fire twos, then we might be in for a tough fight. Here we go. Earth Mental number one will do two passes on these guys again. That's almost the minimum possible value for fire two. 45 to 178 on these single target ones. Um, normally it'd be 45 to 180, but there's some kind of weird interaction between critical hits, elemental weaknesses, and single ter character targeting um, that causes it to max out at 178 here. If you have a group that you're fighting, it can actually do 180 on those fire twos. There we go, Butt's taking it down, so making sure that we are not going to go without, and we do pick up the treasure chest here to get some extra cash. Makes up for the fact that the Earth Mentals give us a little bit less money than the mummies do. Um, otherwise, Earth Mentals are about equivalent to five mummies worth of experience points. Yeah, and generally, if he needs to heal during battle, he's going to be using uh, magic to do so instead of uh, heal potions, both because of the time and cost factor of buying the heal potions, but also because I believe there is a random factor to how much healing you get out of a heal potion if you do it in battle that's not there in the field menu. Yeah, so heal potions um, and cure one spells work the same in battle. They do randomly between 16 and 31 healing. But outside of battle, heal potions don't use the same algorithm for some reason. Instead they do. <laughs> nice job on the door glitch there. Uh, heal potions instead do exactly 30 every single time, whereas cure spells work the same inside out. I don't know why there's that kind of weird difference. Um, partially it's because they implemented the in-battle system as the drink menu. That's what uh, drink is standing there for, so that you can drink heal potions or cure potions. Strangely, you can drink a potion on somebody else's behalf, which I have no <laughs> idea how that works. I guess you just kind of throw it at them, hits them in the mouth, that's close enough for, for purposes here. Or you give them a toast with it or something. Yeah. And that's why they had to do it for a different uh, code path in there. I guess they just, uh, whether it was you know during the design, I guess it, it's it they, they could, unli they could unlink that from what's in people's like personal inventory. Exactly. Now we're going to go down to the vampire here. We're going to start with the bullfight. Um, these are fights that we're taking to get more experience points. And bulls are like the upgraded version of ogre. There is another tier of ogres beyond green ogres, which is the whiz ogre. Uh, we'll see him later on when we get to Gregor Volcano. But um, he's not really in the spirit of ogres, which is just a monster which does a lot of physical damage. Really tough, got a lot of HP. Instead, it turns into bulls, trolls, zombulls as the further upgrades for those. And you'll see... Those tend to be the best monsters in general for a lot of grinding because easy to beat, um, good XP relative to the amount of time it takes to kill them. Okay, Fiesel's going to be going and grabbing the Coral Sword, assuming this bat lets him go by. This is probably the most frustrating dungeon in the game for bats. Um, you remember that step route we're on? Well, he cannot take any steps to the side, can't take any steps backwards. Um, if he's pushing against the bat when it moves, it might cause his character to just rush forward all of a sudden. These are really easy ways to get off to the step route. And for this route, uh, we built in a couple of safety steps, but there's not like a huge number. So if you get even a little bit off, you might start getting encounters that you don't expect. And there are some really bad encounters here in this dungeon. Um, we're on the second floor right now. Once we get down to the third floor, as well as the fourth floor on the second trip, 
you'll fight some of the worst stuff in here, which is number one, cockatrices. Those things will turn you to stone. Those um, basically look like little birds, and you do not want to see them at all here. Um, number two is going to be Spectre Geist. And I used to have a bunch of Spectre Geists in my route um, until Feasel found a way to get rid of them. Uh, Spectre Geists um, have paralyzation. Let's go for the second door glitch here. Oh, yes, yes. there we go. Hey, thanks, Nace here. <laughs> it's actually not guaranteed. So Feasel somehow has this knack for it. I just never get the door glitch <laughs> when I try it. But every time in practice, I think you got the door glitches 100% of the, the time. The door whisperer. <laughs> just a drawing bug that happens. It has no actual in game consequences as far as we can tell for that. Why don't you talk about some of the stuff we're avoiding in here? Because this is an awful dungeon. All right, yeah, back to that. So the third monster that we're avoiding here on this floor is wizards. We do have to fight one wizard battle. Um, this was the compromise. So again, Feasel found this route through here, which swapped out the Spectre Geist, um, which had all those paralyzations. And in exchange, one Spectre Geist turned into a wizard on this trip, which I don't really mind. You have those lit two spells just like we did back at Marsh Cave. We got a little bit more armor and HP, so it's a pretty safe fight um, considering the odds for it. Certainly considering how dangerous it would be to fight nine of those Spectre Geist in an ambush. That is not a good sight to see. And on the second trip through, we're going to do some really fancy walking to make sure that we eliminate all of those bad encounters. And I was just kind of floored when Feasel found this because there's like no obvious setup that he's doing. Like it just looks like the normal um, overworld skips. And then he comes in here and it's a perfectly clean uh, trip through there. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I know. The bat tra traffic jam is giving us a really hard time. But those are not even the hardest bats. Um, in front of the vampire's room is the worst bat in the game. It has about like 15 squares in a row, which are single tile wide. And at the end of the corridor, which is where Vampire's Room is, there is a door. Bats cannot go through doorways. This is not him. We'll see him around the corner. You might want to just on. push into him. Just push him. Yeah. All right, there you go. I don't like to leave the bat uh, that we're talking about here to wander around there. That's Yeah, you don't want to give that guy there any time to start moving. So if he gets down in there, since it's 50-50 whether he's going to move left or right at that point, if he gets all the way to the right, it's about a 1 in 1,000 chance he's going to wander his way back out there. I had this happen like maybe two, three weeks ago. <laughs> I gave it a couple minutes and just like reset, try this dungeon again. Yeah, because all of these bats, as soon as he goes under this floor of the Earth Cave, are loaded and moving around too. All right, Vampire's only got 156 HP, and our Fire Tubes again do 178 max. So let's see if we can even one-shot this guy. It's not super common, but uh, really nice when we boost it, because we want to save a Fire 2 ideally if we can get it. 174, oh, no, good nice. job. That was pure skill on Feasel's part yeah, to get that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so that gives us an extra fire, too, that we can use in case uh, some of the undead come after us. In fact, you might even want to take a fire, oh, an undead battle here uh, that looks good so that you can get some extra XP, because we know that with only two wizards, uh, we're going to be a little bit behind where we want to be for level he, nine. He meant the two wizards in the marsh cave oh, guarding yeah. the crown. Or I guess Ooh. these two, yeah. Weak. No, those wizards, too, are actually unrunnable, too. That's kind of a common thing in both 8 and 16-bit RPGs. This could be a good one. Good one. Um, this one? Yeah, fire two on a chest to strike first. That if the game ever reuses an enemy group that's, kind of, that's either kind of a mini boss or like a chest guardian group or something, uh, all future encounters with that same group are inescapable, as is the case with the wizards here. And that will finish off this last image. And the reason I was kind of encouraging people to do this because I was counting up his XP on the side here to look at level 9. And he'd have to do like three ogre fights outside there if he didn't get some extra XP from doing this battle. Yeah, we get one more image battle. Uh, with five of them, though, we'll probably not do as well in the next one. So yeah, I guess it is a good idea to do that one. Yeah, the big worry is that the person that's casting Fire 2 is going to get paralyzed. At that point, you have committed all three of your other characters um, to be fighting in here. So this will at least be able to get some chances to run away before the images do their damage, hopefully. You now there's Getty. He's the one that's got the lowest chance of running, so actually that's the that's best fine. person for him to there get paralyzed go. on, and we're out of that battle. That is pretty scary, because six is the max that can appear in that formation. Two to six for those image groups. He escapes the bat of, well, not quite doom, but really, really slow pushing down that hallway. That's another one of those like 15 tile long corridors. Fortunately, there is an opening on the other side, but you probably lose like 30 or 45 seconds if you just push a bat down there. NPCs um, kind of react more quickly if you're pushing against them, but if there's a whole series of movements that they need to take, it doesn't really help except for that very last step. Now, 
Garfield's going to have to put his characters back in order. And this is actually something that we need to think about because normally we name our characters A, B, C, and D. Uh, we use Ace Bill Calendan, both of us, uh, to make sure that we can memorize what the party order is. It's really nice to have alphabetical. That's why we picked for the top four names um, that order in there so that we can remember them. You need to have good knowledge of your character orders because that's going to determine what's got the menuing going on as well as spell charges. So if people get shuffled around, you really quickly lose track of you know who's got the fire two left, who's got the silver sword on. Those are things that you have to know just bang, bang right away during these combat sections to make the right decisions in combat. Yeah. Right, and your inventory is going to get all messed up if your guys are in the wrong order when you pick up new items. Yeah, because when you get st certain status conditions um, after battle, the game tries to be helpful by reordering your party to, I believe, push them to the back rows. Very, um, very helpful. And because we've got our best characters in the front for defense, it means whenever it's reordered, it's going to be characters that are much squishier and more vulnerable in front instead. Um, and there's also some bugs with how reordering works. Um, they impact um, some of the reorderings that have more than one character with a status element. I think of like the 256 or so possible reorderings, like 100 or so are bugged, uh, which will <laughs> cause it to not give it the correct order. It's, you'd think it'd be not that hard to sort four things in a list, but uh, that's actually a pretty difficult programming task. So um, they get um, a slight bug in how that algorithm works for the last comparison. We're 355 away from level nine, aren't we? I think. Should be right. That seems like a lot. You've got two ogre battles here outside, as well as the ogre hyena group. Yeah, because remember that even though they're manipulating uh, monster formations they're encountering all throughout the game, there is still a lot of randomness as far as how many monsters are in each battle, too. So as tightly manipulated as this game is, I mean, they still have a lot of work for speedruns to stay on top of like what they're fighting and how much experience they need to hit their level goals in time. The reason, the way you do these quick calculations is, okay, green ogre plus ogre is 119. Okay, throw in the other ogre, 169 in there. If we have the ogre hyena battle, you get a guaranteed minimum of 49. Hyenas might show up because it's one to four ogres plus zero to two hyenas. So you can't quite fully calculate that in for how much you can guarantee here. But as soon as I see the ogre plus, or the two ogres plus the groger, I know that Felix is going to have enough experience if he takes all three of the battles to get him through there. I think if he got an exact minimum for all three, he would have been in a little bit unlucky, but uh, that would have basically been, you know, very low odds. You would have 50% chance for each of the ogre fights, um, and then one to four plus zero to two. I guess that is one in 12 for that hyena battle getting the minimum. Like I say, as, as we try to make it, you can kind of calculate those things out and go, okay, I'm willing to take a one percent or a five percent chance on these certain things going wrong, as long as we have enough safety throughout the run to make up the difference over time. Fizzle skipping these two battles right here. This is to actually shift the encounter groups relative to the step count. Uh, this is a really subtle thing that uh, when you're first rounding the game, it's very tough to get your head around. But he is moving one of the battles um, that would be in this cave from this trip into the next one. And you know, why does he want to do that? It's because it actually gives him more steps when he gets back to the Earth Cave uh, to be able to pull through that third and fourth floor that we talked about. I feel so bad giving that Titan the ruby. He's got a terrible ruby addiction, and we're just kind of just being enablers for him. Mm. Time for a couple donations here. Okay. Yeah, this would be a good time. Uh, we've got $10 from Shawnee, who says somewhat cleverly, the shopping in this game is intense. <laughs> we have an anonymous $1,000 donation. Ooh. for that. We've got $75 from Whoosh, who says, one of my first donations to a GDQ was during a Fiesel run of TMNT on the NES years ago, so might as well keep it up. FF1 was the only, one of the only Final Fantasy games I actually finished, too. Keep up the good work, and I'll keep up the donations. All right, so Fiesel's going to do a save right here, and he's got another one really quickly after this. This is one of the closest spots in the encounter cycle. And I miss this like all the time. You have to do it on the top square here. If you go down one step, you fight tigers, which are probably the worst monsters in this overall section of the game. Tigers have elevated critical hit rates, ambush rates. They do three attacks per round. They're just like destroying machines on wheels or claws or whatever those tigers have. We don't see them anymore, so I have no idea what a tiger looks like. Tigers have wheels, I think. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, it's another challenge to doing these step routes too, is uh, kind of putting these tent reset points in places where they're fairly easy to remember on, on the run too, just given how many uh, there are over the course of a game, because you're gonna need to balance both efficiency as far as minimizing the number of times you need to do it with just making it uh, something that you can expect to remember. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to, you could cut every single one of these one step before the battle, um, make it super tight in throughout this, but uh, we do have, you know, for safety purposes as well as for easy memorization, um, specific routing picked out throughout uh, for this entire run. So if he's going to get another 119 experience points, that's going to put him close enough that he should be able to get the remaining XP in this final fight against Ogre Hyena. Hopefully we don't get a gigantic pack of these things so that he doesn't spend too long in the battle, but we do want to see level 9 before we go into the cave. Now, if he doesn't get level 9, it's actually okay. I see Todd there at 139 HP. He's going to definitely get that 161 barrier. I don't see what Yeti had. I hope it's not 121 as his max, uh, because that would certainly be pretty far away. Usually ice the hyenas. Yeah, we can go ahead. Uh, you can fight over the hyenas and then ice the ogre. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And if you're curious about why you would do that particular strategy, it's because ogres have got one of the lowest magic defenses in the game for these early enemies, so they're going to get that critical hit on the ice spell more often. Ice will naturally do 20 to 40. Uh, if it was weak, it would get halved. Um, if it was oh, resistant, it would get halved. If it was weak, it would get 50%. If it was critical, it would be double. So in this case, ogres will see 20 to 80 for their range. That was an awful round of combat there. That's better. It's actually pretty rare to have to take this fight. Normally, yeah. we're going to come through here. I think we had uh, pretty much the minimum number of wizards as well as bulls, um, which are kind of the big factors in there that can vary between them. Also, a little bit about um, just how many mummies that you get. If you want to be safe in this, um, one of the things that you can do when you're first learning the route, if you want to uh, make sure that you don't get into a tough situation here at Earth Cave, is actually whenever you see one of those two packs of mummies, just two mummies by themselves, actually melee them rather than use one of your fire twos. That'll guarantee you that you'll get enough XP during those sections in order to not worry about level nine. Here's the critical numbers. Let's see what Todd is going to have here coming up. 167, nice. he's great. That's excellent. Yeti, 150. Oh, oh, that's bad. So that's bad. Yeti might get one shot on the very first round of the battle glitch. If he was going to house up there to recover his spell charges and go directly into the earthquake. I love this. Um, I used to have a whole bunch of skips outside to get through encounters, and this route does, does none of that. It just walks straight in. Yeah, I think I first used this in my uh, any percent world record route, this, this earthquake route here. Don't let me forget to pick up the money, by the way. Okay. <laughs> There's Ask, the one and only time they appear in the speedrun. Now, the money Fiesel was talking oh. about is that on the first floor, or the second floor here, there is a coral sword, and on the third floor, there is some cash, and you can do those in either order, depending on how um, your step route works out. We do the coral sword first, and then the uh, cash second. And that 3,400 gold is pretty important for our gold total. It seems like we've got cash coming out of our ears at this point, uh, but there is one spot later on in the run where money is extremely tight. Um, it's like counted down to like the individual gold piece. Time for any donations in this dungeon? Sure. All right, we've got $100 from TFO01. Dedicating this donation to a coworker that was diagnosed with breast cancer. She's in my thoughts and prayers. Ada, we wish you a great recovery. Donation goes to Poexel's choice only because he cannot fight the wrath of the Demon Chocobo this marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I almost wore my Demon Chocobo shirt for this, but this is a Final Fantasy one theme shirt. This is um, one of the shirts that was available for RPG Limit Break back when I did my Final Fantasy 1 GBA run for the, that this year. Um, and there is a Final Fantasy shirt by the Yeti, uh, who is the namesake for our Yeti Red Mage down there. Uh, I believe it is um, one of the stylized ones after um, Final Fantasy 1 Dissidia for the characters in there. Um, Warrior of so, Light yes. versus Chaos. Thanks for the donation, t -Bow. Fiesel, don't forget the money. Thanks, hey, Dreyer. See, Fiesel forgot, didn't forget the money. <laughs> I 
I wouldn't feel too bad. There's some backup strats, how to make up a few thousand gold if you really need to. All right, now as we're coming around the corner again, the third and fourth floors are where the real dangerous stuff is. We've already seen a bit of the third floor, and the fourth floor is even worse. It's going to replace a lot of these good encounters, like those green ogres and um, other sort of easy monsters with uh, more powerful things like trolls and giants that we haven't seen yet. Uh, but if you walk straight through down to the fourth floor, you'd run into a group of cockatrices. And if you stay up here on the third floor, you're going to run into Spectre Geist, and those are both terrible fights. So how do we solve the problem? It's actually by some really careful bouncing up and down between the two floors to make sure that we are never taking steps. They don't quite align on those encounter tables that Feasel talked about earlier in the run um, between those. So we can actually avoid both of the bad encounters, uh, but it's very, very tight on steps getting through this. And if, if there's donations for my choice, those can go towards the Symphony of the Night bonus run, if that hasn't been met yet. Roger that. All right, we're going to shatter this three and a half inch floppy disk here. <laughs> nice. I like how the game gives us a little clue that there's stairs underneath if we open the menu. <laughs> A clue or potentially a bug, depending on how you <laughs> want to look at it. <laughs> Never sure for some of these things for the game. It does actually help out, though. And yeah. for it, th that troll there has to be one of my favorite sprites from this uh, game, too. Uh, not like this. Not like this. <laughs> All right, so Fiesel's now going to walk back and forth to this one specific tile because this is actually the closest stair or closest step to the stairs, which has encounters. Everything around those stairs are safe squares. There so you have to be um, very specific. Otherwise, you just walk around the staircase itself. You'll just never get into a battle and you're wondering what you're doing wrong. What are we avoiding by doing that again? Uh, that gets rid of the cockatrices down here to get uh, that battle upstairs. And they'll turn you to stone. And it's really expensive to uh, get the soft potions that unturn you to stone. We didn't get any giants. So this is a formation of giants, grimps, and werewolves. I've, I've always never really understood why they threw these monsters together. Um, because they never appear together elsewhere in the game. In fact, this is the, like the only formation which has changed between the Famicom and NES versions. Famicom is actually a guana grimps and werewolves, which are all together at the Provoca and Elfland areas. Um, I don't know if that was something that was mistakenly done during translation, just or whether it was, you know, intended by the designers to make that code change that didn't go out into the original version. We're getting trolled here. <laughs> yeah, those trolls can hit pretty hard. Up to this point, we haven't really seen monsters attacking more than one time per round. Um, so we got in the Spectre Geist battles, we'd have seen three chances per attack to paralyze, so uh, that's, one of the, again, one of the reasons why we want to avoid them. Uh, but we're starting to see monsters get a little bit more powerful as well as more creative with their skills and spells. All right, there's your images. And then one more bad battle on this floor, which is going to be trolls and bulls. Now, it's one to two trolls plus zero to two bulls in this formation. So you could get anywhere from a really easy troll fight up to something which is really, really painful to get through. They or all four of them could hit really hard. And I'm eyeing that bat down by the Lich's door. It's looking oh, like good. that's a good spot. Yeah, it's looking like you'll be able to make it, and you get the perfect formation here. So only one troll showed up. Yeah, you don't want that bat to go all the way up to where that door is by Lich, because we'll be waiting around forever. It's not quite as bad as the vampire not as bat, bad. but um, it does take a little bit of time to clear out. Now, Fiesel's going to heal up the party before we go in and fight Lich. Again, this is our first major boss of the game. We've got to fight four fiends throughout here, and. Everybody say a good word for the Yeti, because yes. Ice 2 is probably coming. You don't want you, Lich to get lucky. You can see a Ice 2-less um, Lich, but if we lose the mage here, that's a lot of our damage output. Lich is weak to fire, um, and if we get super high rolls, here nice. we go 60, 120, 154, 56, oh, 57. Oh, excellent, nice. wow. Okay, so Todd is actually the one that's going to be in a perilous uh, position. If he gets meleeed by Lich, um, he would probably die for that. Those are terrible fire two casts. Really well, bad. at least we have two mages to follow up. Um, you can one round Lich if you get perfect fire twos in there. Um, I've seen that happen every once in a while, but more typically it's going to be two, three rounds for this fight. This could do it. No, not with 85. Uh, yeah, this will be taking a nap. One. Mm -hmm. This will definitely do it then. There we go. Our first boss is down. Woohoo! And that effect is actually what lights the um, orb at the end. So if you don't touch that, uh, you don't get credit for the boss kill. Now Fiesel skips one battle there coming out because he actually needs a couple of steps before he sets up the RNG for the walk to ordeals. Um, ordeals is going to be the longest RNG setup in the game. Uh, but we can actually hide most of this by um, 
the trip that we need to take to Crescent Lake here for quest reasons anyway. So it's going to look like we have almost no um, encounter manipulation at all going on, but really this entire walk is planned out to arrive at Ordeals at just the right time. Another little subtle thing to remember too when running this game is that when you do the hard power reset, you do need to change the battle message speed back to fast too, because when I, uh, all of my playthroughs of this game that I did as a kid, were, I didn't really ever think to change that, uh, change that message speed. So a lot of these battles took a very, very long time, especially when we had like large groups of enemies that could do multi-target attacks. Yeah, the difference between battle speed one and eight is enormous. Even between seven and eight, you feel it um, when you're doing the speed run. Like you'll see me do um, the hard power reset, and I reset again, which there's a glitch in the game. I know you're <laughs> astounded that there's bugs. <laughs> yeah. uh, but there's a glitch that'll cause it to go to battle speed zero, which is not normally accessible. Battle speed zero doesn't do anything really funky. doesn't crash the game or anything like that. It's just kind of the same as battle speed one. Um, but if you press left, which normally takes you to battle speed eight, instead it'll take you to battle speed seven. I, I will sometimes do that every once in a while. I just have to be kind of paying attention whenever I do one of those hard resets. Guizzo likes to do it from pressing start on the menu, which is um, already missed by two steps. So that is... I should be good. You should be good. Uh, there's enough built into that so that you can get back should to the boat. Should we fight these? Let's do these. Uh, you can go fight these. This is get you some extra XP as well as gold, so you don't have to worry about the level 10 at the end of ordeals. So these are optional battles. You're going to get uh, Troll and Bull. This is the same formation I talked about. Fiesel lucked out in Earth Cave not getting this, uh, but he did get it here. And we'll have two more fights against Trolls coming up to um, Crescent Lake itself. Now the Fights um, do drain a lot of your HP, and so you want to save all of your cure spells if possible for a deal. So if you get into the situation where you're going to take a lot of damage, you might as well um, get the XP and gold and then stay at the inn at Crescent Lake to get everything back. Time for a couple donations. Hey, go ahead. Got fifty dollars from Unwise, who says, who asks, what do you call dreaming about the last test of the school year? Finals fantasy. Mm. Ooh, thank you for that laugh. Uh, we've got seventy-five dollars from Poochie Darcy. Greetings from Sweden. Go Fiesel, go from all of Volt Crew to our favorite streamer. Oh, thank you. And I do have the answer to the latest trivia question. Well, tell us where this broom is going to be. I'm really curious to find out the answer to this. Well, Silent Sword provided the answer for with a donation of $10 and says, you'll find that broom in the town of Gaia. All right, so Gaia is actually going to be coming up here as our, I think this is the next town that we do go to in this game. Counting the ones that we have already seen before the revisits to uh, those, yeah, the, the next, next new town. town. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be a little bit of time before we get there, so uh, we'll have a little bit before we can verify that that is actually the correct answer, but we'll take that for now. A rare instance of staying at an inn and then not, uh, not immediately resetting to get back out of the town. You want 10 here. Right? Yeah, let's go ahead and get 10 cameras. I gave you some extra tents there at the start just right. in case we had to burn a few extra, but you rarely um, want to be too far off of your total of recovery items because at certain spots in the game, we actually have to manipulate how our inventory looks. The game will order it so that all of your quest items are first in a specific order and then all of your consumable items in a specific order. Now, some of the spots are much more advantageous for accessing things, like the bottom left-hand corner is my favorite because you can do it with one flick of the D-pad to get access to them. So you have to say, okay, I need to get rid of all my tents or I need to get rid of all my houses or things like that in order to manipulate uh, some of these things so that when you're using 99 heal potions, you can get to them much, much faster um, if you know where the menus are. This right. game is way before you had you know, memory cursors and things like that. Just getting a little bit extra here. Oh, look at this guy being so conservative. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. All right, we're good. We'll use those heal potions, absolutely. The pure potions we may or may not. We got poisoned quite a lot, I feel like, so. Now, right here, he's going to sell off all of his gear, except for the body armor on the fighters. Um, this is actually a renaming between Japanese and English. It's called uh, Silver here, but it was Mithril in Japanese. And Mithril is one of those Dungeons & Dragons concepts that you're just kind of expected to know about. Uh, mithril armor is associated with things that are lightweight. And so they've implemented that in this game by uh, making them very low uh, for the evade penalty. Now, the one exception, um, even though everything's better for evade, is that the body armor is actually worse on defense than the iron armor. That's why we're keeping hold on that for a little while longer. Well, a lot while longer. We picked up that body armor about 18 minutes into the game, and we've got maybe two more hours, or two hours from there, um, before I actually get a better replacement for it. 
coming up on one of the most important items. This will get a lot of use. The okay. canoe. Yeah, we go to go visit the old men doing yoga in the park here, and they happen to have a spare canoe that we can borrow, <laughs> which is really helpful because there's no more spots in the game that you can get access to right here. Uh, we need this canoe to get um, into three additional dungeons. You've got Gurgle Volcano, which all of the old men are going to recommend that you go visit immediately. For casual playthroughs, that's definitely your best choice. Um, but there is legitimately two other spots you can visit without uh, being considered secrets break. There is Ice Cave, which normally you would do after Gurgle Volcano in order to get the floater in the airship, and then finally Ordeals, which most people probably did by um, flying there in the airship, which is a really far uh, away parking location for it. But it turns out that there is a little backdoor entry spot. Um, if you get directly out of the boat into the canoe, that lets you get into Ordeals much more quickly, and there's a lot of good items in there. So we actually do the order instead of Gurgu Ice Cave Ordeals, we do Ordeals Ice Cave Gurgu. He does need to defeat Lich before he can get the canoe to... Yeah, that's the one restriction. If it wasn't for the fact that Lich is checked for giving you the canoe, you could actually do the bosses in any order. Um, so once you get past Lich, if you want to do Tiamat, Kraken, and then carry, you can. Final Fantasy, RBO, oh. we'll have to wait for another time. And I guess when you get there, you probably use two cabins so that you yeah. get Yeti fully healed up. If you bought extra tents, though, we're going to have to use those if we want to end up uh, out of tents by the time we do Volcano. It might be enough for one cap in the tent there. I think he's down at like only at 91. I will do one and one. It's sort of hard to, to tent past the encounters in the ocean just because there's not a lot of features to look at visually. You can use an audio cue, but it's pretty tough. I have no idea how Bishop does that. I just give <laughs> up and try to like say, I'm going to plow through these battles. It's like a complete featureless void in all directions. It looks like a loose, repeating tile squares. So we're just going to skip past with the faster battles. movement speed when you're on the ship. This gets rid of the really bad encounters around here. There's which the Catman is, Which is important because he is here way, 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 way before the game expects him to come here. This is like the only real battle that we have to throw away to make this step route work. Um, inside, he's going to get Whiz Mummies and Zombles, probably the only two fights that you can realistically take in this area. Inside, otherwise, is going to be Sorcerers, the worst enemy in the game by far. They have an instant death spell, um, resistance death effect on their melee attack, which is probably a bug. There is associated with each of the enemy's um, melee attacks actually an element, and that's the element that it checks to decide whether or not you're able to resist the status effect. Normally, you'd think that, oh, you know, instant death detection would let me avoid um, being killed by something like this, but instead, because they've got no element at all, there's nothing. Not the ribbon, not the pro ring, nothing that's going to protect against it. Um, they also have an all-party paralysis spell, which is probably the least um, enjoyable thing to see when you first get into that sorcerer battle. But, you know, putting those guys aside, you've got man cats and argoyles who cast fire two. Fire two, probably two casts would wipe the party uh, with our current situation. We've got zombies, which are the boss, just wandering around at random. Uh, Medusa's who can turn into stone. It's a really nasty dungeon, and so we found routes through here, which get the only two fights that we can realistically take. And since they are undead monsters, they'll go down quickly with fire too. We can actually get the XP. Hopefully, we're level 10 by the time that uh, Fiesel beats the boss here. Otherwise, you've got a backup strat uh, on the way to Ice Cave to pick up a little bit of extra XP for that. So, as much of a so, despite ordeals being a teleporter maze here, it's. Fortunately, pretty easy to remember where to go exactly to get to the end. Yeah, it turns out it's always the bottom pillar, so if you thought you had to write like really complicated notes and memorize all this stuff, it, no, it's pretty simple. We talk about linked chests here, there's one. Yeah, so up in the upper right hand corner, you might look on a map and say, oh, that's what the Zeus Gauntlet is. I'm definitely going to get those because that's a good item, but um, there's a lot of linked treasure chests in the game, which means that there are two treasure chests that have been assigned the same item. The very first time, regardless of which of the treasure chests you pick it up from, you'll get the item, and all the rest will say empty. So if you've ever seen like discrepancies between like FAQs and walkthroughs and strategy guides about saying which treasure chests have empty and which have items, it's because of this linked mechanic. I think a lot of people just kind of wrote down the notes about what they saw in the playthrough and didn't realize that this was going on behind the scenes. And this allows us to actually get the Zeus Gauntlet at a more convenient spot, which will take less steps. Unfortunately, it does mean that he has to do these next battles without it. In fact, speaking of next battles, we come up on one of those really strangely positioned trap tiles, which is going to be a group of nightmares in here. And luckily we could run away. These nightmares actually have one of the highest agilities in the game. So if you're playing the remakes where running is not broken, you have to um, pretty much reset the game until you get um, a chest to strike first, which gives you a guaranteed run on that first round. Go ahead and pick up the heal staff here. And this is a neat little trick which only works in the NES Famicom versions, which is going through that corner. They filled that in 
in the remake versions one of those really small architectural things that makes it tough to go between the different ones if you're doing speed running and they did a lot of landscaping and interior redecorating with some of the maps and uh, this game for the remakes and a lot of it's just really subtle like one or two tile changes Yeah, you want to save two of those fire twos for those Amides at the end. I will also have the Zeus Gauntlet available for one of the mages, so if he uses the fire two up and we haven't killed the Zombies, then we'll at least be able to do some AoE damage for that. And it looks like we're going to go on to another round of these. So this is like one of the Fun. dangers of the mummies is that if you get enough people put to sleep, um, you kind of prolong the fights in here. This can kind of stretch out and do more damage. Now, it looks like his HP totals are pretty good here, so we don't have to worry about running through all of our cure spells and dipping into our precious heal potions at about two, two and a half seconds to buy them back. Um, you don't want to use them unnecessarily. We'll be spending enough time as it is in that guy's item shop. <laughs> Whoever decided how much money is in these chests had a really fun day, too. He's going to go ahead and do all of his equipping here. All right, close enough. Oh, wait, we should heal these guys. Don't forget to heal. Yeah, we try to pack as many things into a single menu trip as we can, just because the menus are relatively slow for moving around in that cursor. And here we go, Zombie Deeds. We get one Zombie Deed or two, just like the Wizards. This is an RNG-based boss. So we got one Zombie Deed. So we'll be on the low end of our XP. I think he had a decent number of mummies, uh, plus that fight you took outside of Crescent Lake. So I think we're going to get level 10 here regardless. Also, coming out of this um, fight, Fusel's going to pick up the tail, which is an important quest item. So let's Hopefully I will. Yes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the music loop again when even Fiesel picks up the tail. Not really necessary, just in case. All right, there we go. All right, so let's see. Do we get level 10? So I should hold up right now, right? No, that would be a bad <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. So we go level 10 for our party, and we're going to press left instead and pick yes. up that tail. Um, this step route actually only has two free squares in it. Um, so if you make a mistake any of your walking, you'll probably get into Argoyles, who you definitely don't want to see. If you go outside without the tail, you'll be really sad, because that tail is how we do class changing later on. Class change lets the uh, fighters use additional uh, equipment, as well as get some spells for the first time, and it unlocks a bunch of really valuable spells for the Red Mages. So you can bite, beat the game without class change. Um, in fact, all of the character classes have successfully beaten the game solo without class change, uh, which is a really amazing feat. Um, but we will be doing class change because it does make um, the second half of the game much faster and safer. And so we've now proved our courage by finding a rat tail in a uh, monster infested castle. Yeah, we'll be back to Bahamut later. We can't actually do class change yet because you need the airship as well for that to work. Um, and Fusel's sailing off here to go to our next dungeon, which is going to be the Ice Cave. The Ice Cave is probably the hardest dungeon in the game, both for casual play as well as for speedrunning. It's just packed to the gills with all kinds of nasty monsters, and we'll talk about that when we get there for what horrors are inside as well as what things he's able to successfully avoid. Pretty rare seeing a bunch of can't at this point. We talked earlier on about our run chances, so like at the end of the game, we're going to have about a 90% chance on our fighters, 50% on our third slot character, and a 10% chance on our fourth slot character. And that really is based on the character slot. So if you reorder re the positions, it would follow them um, for what uh, their run chances were like. And here that we're like level 10, we're getting pretty close to about two thirds of the way up there. So seeing four can't runs at this point is fairly rare. And we hopefully are not going to see that at any point during the ice cave. That'll be pretty bad for those undead encounters that are going to plague most of our journey through there. Probably read some donations now. There's really not much going on besides overworld travel. Yeah, but until we get to the cave itself. Okay. Um, I did actually just want to take a moment to remind people donating. Uh, when you donate, you can do a couple of things. Please check out the prizes that you can uh, make yourself uh, eligible for in the raffle format. Um, there's some cool NES-related stuff and some Final Fantasy uh, perlers and stuff up there right now. And also, I want to remind people of a couple of upcoming bid wars we have that you can choose to put your donations toward. Just look for these in the tracker. So first of all, we've got a bid war for the River City Ransom file name. Um, and if I look 
here. Looks like the current winner for that is Abbott Bowl with $736, and the next closest one is $200. So if you want to take control of that, get those donations in. And then we also have a bid war for the Ori and the Blind Forest category. Uh, there's two different categories that uh, we could choose from depending on which one uh, wins uh, in terms of donations. And the explanation for those category differences is in the tracker, so please uh, check that out. The game also does make it fairly clear who gets the uh, yeoman's work of uh, rowing the canoe by the silhouettes. You can see whenever it's moving uh, from side to side. So you can just barely make out that very distinctive hat that the red mages have in there. All right, so now that we get uh, Freeze will get close to the ice cave, we're going to skip over a couple battles. Uh, we can skip two battles here. Unfortunately, the first three battles after Power On are all mummy cockatrice fights, so he has to do one really tough battle right at the start, followed by about ten more really tough battles before he gets to the mini boss, who is really tough, followed by some more really <laughs> tough battles before he gets out of this place. Yeah, this cave was designed by some uh, pretty uh, sadistic programmers. I think also we might be like 10 or so levels under what we're supposed to be going yeah. through here. That might contribute a little bit to Trip, the difficulty. The trifle here. detail. Okay, how many birds? How many birds? Oh, it's actually not too bad. Three, yes, we can deal with that, I guess. So this is two to six cockatrices plus one to five mummies. So he almost got the perfect formation, so can't really complain at all about this. If you get six cockatrices nice. and three mummies and they ambush you, man, that is probably in for a bad day right there. Man. Something you'll be seeing him do for some of these battles where he, all he really cares about is just getting out as quickly as possible is queuing up run, but also um, combat items with his characters that uh, innately have low chances to run. Right, in particular that Zeus can take out those birds, so that's why we want to use that. But some of these other ones will use it even just uh, to partially damage some of these enemies. In case we get stuck, it'll make it easier to clear them out. So we saw race in the last battle. This is image and race mixed together. And wow, wow. chance of wow. both of these. This is yes, really lucky so far. Um, race are basically super upgraded versions of the images. So they are both monsters that have one attack and a chance of paralysis. But the Wraith can do up to like 150 damage on a critical hit, uh, which is most of the character's HP right there. Images are a little bit less dangerous at this point. We have to fight a lot of image race to get through out there. The other nasty battle coming up is going to be after this Frost Giants and Frost Wolves. Zero to two frost wolves are going to be present in each of those encounters. We'll have three of them throughout the dungeon. And ideally, we do not see frost wolves because 25% of the chance to do frost breath uh. attack, um, which is really big damage to the entire party. So hopefully, butts can get well, out of here. We should yeah. fire two. Yeah, you, you probably want to fire two on the next round if you don't get this. Sure. Oh, nice. Very nice. Oh, that's very nice. I'm just going to overheal because these. This is uh, probably the worst encounter, and we can't. This is unrunnable, and we can't avoid them. We got three of these encounters to get through, double and it's a double frostful. This is bad. So every time that you see a range, like I say, zero to two for these frostfuls, it's equal odds, or as close as equal as it can make it, uh, given that there's 256 possible values for the RNG you see to pick from. So 256 divided by three ways, not quite perfectly even. And we'll say one third chance of zero, one, or two frostfuls. And there's the frost breath. We did not want to see that. I see Weasel's going to be plowing through those heal potions like no tomorrow now. <laughs> Fortunately for this part of the game, it's oh. going to be Feasel's responsibility to rebuy those later on. <laughs> um, in the final bit, he's going to leave me with some number of heal potions, and there's two parts of the game where we have to buy up to 99 heal potions, once before Gurkha Volcano and once before the very last bit of the game. And that, um, you actually try to be as conservative as possible so that you can just reduce the amount of time that you're doing that shopping trip. But for the, the marathon run today, you know, we're not going to worry too much about exactly how many heal potions we need to buy. There we go. First of our three Frost Giant battles are down. And again, because those are unrunnable, it makes it even worse the fact that you have to deal with that Frost Wolf Watch. You might want to heal up before um, dropping yep. down in there, so you'll do that together with the Flame Sword. Mm -hmm. Because coming up is probably the worst square in the dungeon. There's a trap tile, um, and I call this an overstep template where they schedule more than nine monsters to appear. You can never have no more than nine monsters on the screen at once, but if there's more than that scheduled, it'll just fill up the screen, and then once it's done, it'll stop placing them. So it's very easy to have the max monsters here, and these are all stun-locking enemies. Oh, this is so good. Look wow. at that. Might even save the fire, too. No, I'll use them both. We don't want to mess with this. I 
that particular formation. Images, race, specters, and geists can all appear together. So the specter geists work together to stun off your party, and then the race come behind and just really clean up while you're you're down. But with that, um, we're through the first loop through this dungeon. This is a pretty complicated one to kind of route out. Um, we'll go down here to the southwest corner and get 40,000 gold. And we'll go up and fight the Eye, who is uh, the required boss in order to get the floater here. And hopefully no more Frostcraft. Yeah. And we're totally okay with wasting those attacks. We're like, even though we described earlier sure. on about the importance about being able to spread your attacks out to make sure that you don't have overkiller um, attacks that are ineffective, for difficult monsters, um, you want to make sure that you never let them get an additional round if possible. And so those are the times which you'll typically see us put a backup attacker on something to make sure that it's definitely going to go down. All right, there we go. Second of our three Frost Giant battles is down. And when we go over to pick up these treasure chests, you'll see that Beetle takes a rather unusual walking pattern through it. It's because in between the two rows of treasure chests, there's actually a trap tile with like seven frost wolves that can show up there. It's so, so terrible. And as an extra joke in front of it, um, that treasure chest, which is the only one that's blocked by it, has 180 gold. So these are like thousands and thousands of gold. And you fight this tough battle, it's like, okay, I better be getting something really good. And it's like, wah, wah. heal up because we do have one more. Oh, look at that. I have to use some of your heal potions. How do you like that? Uh, some of your heal potions, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. I have to rebuy these. <laughs> we come up. We've got our last Frost Giant battle. And part of the intention of this route was I scheduled it so that all of the Frost Giant battles were done before the eye fight. At the eye, there's a really high chance of somebody dying. We've lucked out so far with nobody dead on Astos. Astos and the eye are like the two highest early game monsters uh, for killing somebody in the party off. And speaking of that eye fight, the reason he's so tough is because his first spell, XXXX, um, is instant death unless you've got three or one or higher hit points. Three or one for your current HP that's going to be checking against. And until you're level 11, nobody in the party even has a chance to do that. Even at level 11 on these fighters, um, a lot of the times you're going to be hovering around the 297, 298 range for that. So rather than grind out level 11, we just kind of go through and say, you know, it's probably not going to work out to be safe. So instead, we're going to plan other ways to make it through this ice cave. Now coming up, you've got three treasure chests here, and if you think that you're ahead on tents and you want to skip the middle treasure chest so that you don't pick the tent up there, that would get you Let's one less. Let's do it. That's something I do in the GBA route, where you don't bother picking up um, low-value items because you can buy stuff in bulk. Here in NES, you usually pick up every single heal potion, pure potion, and tent, and so on. And you see that he doesn't heal up for this fight. This is because it's mostly going to be instant death or petrification or other nasty uh, spell effects. We go and bye see you later, bots. Uh. That's not at all unexpected. Hopefully, we can still get um, the eye down this round. Now, we did put the best sword on Mr. MV, who is our second character. That way, he's less likely to be targeted. I don't think we've even talked about uh, targeting chances in this game, so I'll go ahead and do that. The first character slot's got a 50% chance of being targeted, and I will pause here so that Fiesel can pick up the floater. There he there goes. Go. I get a little cameo by the Red Mage spray, too. So 50% of the first slot being targeted, 25% of the second slot being targeted, and roughly 12.5% for each of the third and fourth slots. Uh, it's not quite perfect because of a bug in the game <laughs> uh, for how it does that last calculation for the fourth character slot, but it's really close. Oh, and I do want to heal here. Yeah, he's about to drop down uh, into uh, that trap tile again, except now we've got the ice shield on. I explained earlier about why the sorcerers were so bad, because there was no element that blocked their instant death attack. Well, these guys are associated with fire, uh, so we lucked out here, but even if he had gotten some attacks in there, that ice shield should have protected Mr. MV from the paralyzation status effect. It doesn't affect the damage, it doesn't affect the hit rate, it what? just affects whether the status effect happens. What is happening? All these strike or er, these uh, surprise attacks. You're going to pay for this so badly yeah, later Yeah, it's going to come back. <laughs> on, in your segment, it's going to come back. So he has one more battle through um, a bunch of race to get out of here. I don't think you even need to heal since he just walked over a oh, little bit of ice. We're good. So this again, um, we should be immune to the paralyzation effect. And I say should uh, because if a monster gets a critical hit on their status roll, 
it's actually a three in 256 chance that it will bypass whatever um, status protections that you have. Um, and that is really dangerous in the late game because you know, you're expected to have instant death protection for all your characters and there's suddenly a character is out of the fight. Um, can cause a lot of complications to your strategies. Oh, because of the pet strike, yeah. Yeah, so you'll be able to use up your last tent here um, doing the skip outside of the four corner area. Probably squeeze in a donation or two here. All right, <coughs> I've got a two hundred dollar donation from Ruprecht von Hobwurtschnuvinkel. <laughs> this is for Fiesel, Duckfist, Sinister, and many others I cannot remember. <laughs> uh, we've got one hundred dollars from Jonk One Twenty One. Been watching AGDQ for years and love everything about it. Great job for everyone keeping this amazing event going. Excited to be up at 2.22 a.m. for the Fury speedrun. So one more Caribou here. I call these guys Caribou. Um, <laughs> Carib is actually, I think we looked it up, a particular uh, language native term for Piranhas, which is the original name for these monsters, um, the Japanese versions. They had to be pretty creative with the translation process because of the limitations in terms of the number of characters that are available. Plus they kind of edited out references that they thought that the American audience wouldn't be able to pick up just from the names. And so, you know, the limitations that you had back in the day, there's a lot of restrictions for naming things. And um, they did actually put in some new features to uh, solve that problem. So back in the Japanese version, you'd be spell out, you know, ice sword or flame shield. So you would know the item type just by reading the name. But when you shorten it, it's just ice. It's really ambiguous about what you're talking about. So they added another icon, which is a really helpful way. And I think the those got uh, reused throughout all the other Final Fantasies as well, even the ones in Japanese where you had enough space to display everything. Well, we're talking about version differences. Do you want to mention the sad history of the last boss, too? <sighs> I guess I can leave that up to you. Okay. Before, so. Yeah, so the eye, which was the uh, boss guarding the floater that he just traded in basically for an airship, um, was originally a beholder in the uh, Japanese Famicom version, but uh, in... Um, Localization due to kind of some fear by uh, Squaresoft of um, lawsuits by uh, I think it was TSR at the time who owned the uh, the copyright for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, they just completely axed the, a really cool looking uh, be 8 bit beholder sprite and replaced it with the eye, and then that, that sadly was permanent too. Even Japanese remakes of uh, Final Fantasy still use that eye sprite instead of the beholder. Yeah, it's really a shame. They also made some other changes, like changing all the crosses in the game to other things. So it, this set of candelabras here, these were all crosses. Uh, probably was a really uh, intense moment for uh, the censorship crew there to go and get rid of those. Um, they also uh, changed the crosses on things like the clinics. So those used to be churches and priests and turned into clinics and um, doctors in there. Um, they put a little bit more clothing on the Green Medusa and Medusa. I've never seen the difference between the two, like even <laughs> looking closely at it. The total is like one or two pixels are changed. Right, two pixels more clothing. Is added. That, <laughs> that, that was for the children to, to protect them from their, their delicate eyes. And then um, most of the other changes in the game were just about functionality, um, so that you had different things for like the fonts and how some of the menu structure worked. They made very, very few changes to the actual gameplay mechanics themselves. We talked about one, which was swapping out that um, iguana fight for giants back at the Earth Cave. Um, when we get to the very end of the game, they actually had encounters on Chaos's floor down at the bottom, which they removed. But for the most part, you can pretty much take this exact same route um, that we're showing on the NES and play it on the Famicom as well. Now back at Karina Town here, we're going to go ahead and get Ruse spells for everybody. Ruse, uh, Ruse. is um, a way to increase your evade rate. We're going to use this in one particular battle. Even though we have a dead fighter right now, we can still teach him <laughs> um, some new tricks here. And even though we haven't actually gotten spell slots for our fighters yet, um, we can learn spells there as well. That's something which you probably aren't going to notice unless you do a speed run. But uh, if you're under level 15, your knights are actually not going to start learning spells right away. You have to be level 15 or higher, and you get one spell charge on each of the odd level ups. So 15, 17, 19 um, is where we would learn additional spell charges for this particular run. Our Fusel's going to get me even more pure potions, and he's also going to buy up to 99 heal potions right here. So this is going to be a little bit of mashing going on. <laughs> There's actually t different techniques, so um, I know Fusel's kind of trying to 
do the tap method. Um, I go for more rhythm where I kind of focus on a part of the screen where I can see the redraw happening so that I can try to time what it is. If you go for like super fast mastering, like you know you're a, a hardcore APM uh, player that can do mashing at you know, 15 hertz in there, you actually are probably going to buy your heal potions a little bit slower because the menus are um, locked out for whenever these redraws are happening. So you want to actually just time it for exactly when that unlock um, takes place so that you can get through this optimally. It does save a couple of frames and multiply that by 220 or so heal potion shopping trips or, or purchases in there. That's probably like 15 seconds of the course of the run. Do you want to kick it over to E-Mister for some more donations then? Yeah, it'll be an excellent sure. time. Alrighty, <coughs> we've got $25 from Hagure, who just says, Shoutouts to long RPG runs. I really appreciate the explanations of all the crazy manipulation going on. And then we've got $100 from Anonymous. This donation is in memory of my father's two sisters. Five days ago, he lost his second at the same age as the first to the same aggressive cancer. May we speed run our way to a cure. $100 from Lars V. So many hours playing Final Fantasy. So fun seeing it be ripped apart. Thank you to the players, organizers, and the fuzzy animals. And I've got $25 from Tonka. Hello again, AGDQ. RPG runs are always among my favorites, and I couldn't miss again, miss donating again during the RPG that started it all for me as a kid. This donation goes toward Wexel's choice. I feel really, really bad for anybody waiting in line behind these four guys to buy some uh, stuff in this shop, too. Yeah, one at a time, individually hand-numbered and crafted for these potions. I kind of theorize that those barrels in the back are actually what a heal potion is. That's why it takes us so <laughs> long, is to fill up an entire <laughs> barrel full of this stuff. Um, I have no idea where we put it, but we do actually have a bunch of houses and cabins in our backpack <laughs> as well, so those must be pretty big. After a while playing this game, you do hear this music in your sleep. <laughs> Pretty much 24-7, <laughs> you're going to be hearing this tune going. Imagine being a shopkeeper. Just got to hear this all the time. <laughs> got $100 from TailJS, who says, Yes, I finally caught AGDQ live. Props to the runners and setup crew. Kupo, Kupo. Now, Faisal's going to do one more power, hard power here to set the RNG for Gurkha Volcano. So we'll go ahead and get that ready. We can do any of the ins along the way, or you can even do it with an extra 10 if you want to. But um, it's easiest to do it at Cornelia because that's a relatively easily accessible in, as well as being completely surrounded by safe squares. So you don't have to worry about your route at all. So up here, he's going to buy Cure 2 for everybody. So this is going to be the only um, slot or spell that the Knights have in their third tier slot. And for the most part, there's fire twos and lit twos that were so good are just going to tickle the monsters from the rest of this game. So we're going to decrease the amount of time that we spend attacking with them and use their spell slots instead for curatives. Um, this reduces the number of heal potions that we need throughout the game. And cure two does do more healing in battle than the heal potion would. So you can actually sometimes save a character by casting it at just the right moment. We'll also go ahead and buy the fast and ice two spells for our wizards. The fast spell is our I guess only real um, offensive buffs that we have. Most of the offensive buffs in this game are broken. Um, there's a really great spell called Temper, which is a second tier spell you can get back in Provoca. Uh, we'd love to have it here in the NES version. It's really valuable to have in all the remakes. Um, it was supposed to increase your attack power, and it does stack with itself. So you can get ridiculous amounts of damage output by casting Temper over and over again. But because we don't have that, it actually makes the game significantly harder. Again, most of the bugs in this game um, are increasing the difficulty rather than decreasing. So when they fixed them in the remakes, it made the game so easy that they had to start increasing the amount of HP that the bosses had and make them more difficult to compensate. All right, Gurgur Volcano time. So Gurgur Volcano is completely full of lava here, which in addition to flashing um, and making a wonderful grinding noise. By the way, you can only see this um, on Twitch if you are at source quality. So you want to go up to source there so you can get the full 60 hertz effect. If you're on 30 hertz, you might see that it's being either completely dark or completely bright while he's walking. Uh, that's because it can't quite uh, capture the flicker effect correctly. Um, but the reason he's also walking all those tiles is because for one damage, um, it's all safe squares. And so he's been able to cruise through this dungeon with only four random encounters. There might be four, more than four encounters during the dungeon, but only four of them are going to be random. 
And um, in comparison, like a normal dungeon, we have like a dozen or so for Lent. So this, if you've ever played this game casually and you, know, you tried to avoid all the lava, then you might have realized how difficult the battles were, especially things that can do you know, cremate or other um, multi-target attack spells. Yeah, because he's taking, I mean, this damage is one, only one per tile, but it does add up because of how many he's stepping on. So he does need to make sure to heal before certain encounters he's going to be getting just to uh, minimize risk. can't go below one though. You'll just go down to one and it'll stay at one, so you can't mm -hmm. die from the lava. Yeah, that's true for both poison as well as lava. Um, you can never kill yourself in it, but as soon as you're into battle, you got one HP, you're uh, pretty easy pickings for these monsters. And for poison, you lose two HP for every round, um, so that um, after that first round of combat, you would instantly fall over dead. Now, poison is broken for uh, monsters, so it never is going to work on them. Um, <laughs> And the opposite effect, regeneration, is also broken for monsters. <laughs> uh, there's supposed to be a category of monsters that were regenerating. Uh, which trolls. Was, with trolls. Mm -hmm. um, some weird ones. I think Warmech is a regenerating monster <laughs> officially. Uh, Selfix. And so they were supposed to get two HP per round, the exact opposite of poison, which look at the HP of the most of these monsters. They're completely irrelevant to it. So it doesn't make it much of a difference, the fact that poison doesn't actually work correctly for regeneration. Now we'll go ahead and pick up these treasure chests here. So... We'll go ahead um, and also get into one of these trap talent cards. This is to guard the flame shield. You can skip this if you uh, want to stick with those silver shields you have now. I like getting uh, the flame shield because it does let us uh, sell the silver shield off for a little extra cash again. It seems like we've got so much money. We have um, probably like 120,000 coming out of this dungeon, but we're going to use every single one of those gold pieces um, once we get through this. With the armor, we're going to trade the silver for the flame. Well, I was going to put on the Zeus Gauntlet there. All on the Zeus Gauntlet. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, we can't use that until the class change, even though we've had it all this time. We actually can't equip it until the Red Mage turns into a Red Wizard. And so you can use Lit 2 uh, even before that, but um, you get 6 extra absorb by putting it on. So we're going to be fighting in a monster called the Agama for a little while. Uh, this is going to be our um, pretty much major grind for the game, so we're level... Uh, 10 or 11 coming into this dungeon, and we'll be level 15 when we exit. The reason we went level 15 is because that's where the mages get a 5th tier spell charge for the first time. 5th tier, if you want a reference for what you'd expect it to be at casual play, is the spells that you get at Melmont. Uh, so you're normally going through Earth Cave and starting there over level 15. We are having to do um, so much more content until we reach that spot. Uh, but this is like by far the best spot, and almost all of the uh, routes for this game have converged on grinding on these Agmas. They give you very consistent battles. Only one Agma, one Agma every time is worth 2,472 experience points. Divided by four ways, you'll see a number in the 600s for that, but 2,472 is his base uh, XP value for that. And so, you might look at some other monsters and say, why don't we grind on those? Like the Eye back at uh, the Ice Cave is worth 3,225, so you'd have to fight probably like a third fewer Eyes than Agmas. However, uh, we saw how dangerous the Eyes instant death was, plus all the other nasty stuff back at the Ice Cave. You know, there's sorcerers and frost dragons and mages that we never saw in there. Um, eventually, they're going to show up if you take enough steps going back and forth. Um, although I should bring up, that's also another great reason for this particular egg grind spot. There is actually two trap tiles next to each other, so you can, people can walk back and forth without worrying about the step count at all. So if he needs two extra Agamas or one fewer Agama, depending on how the route went, it doesn't impact the step count here in any way. Um, other great options that we always hear suggested is like uh, uh, the zombie D's back at ordeals. Um, they're pretty good, um, but since they are random one versus two, you'd have to get like perfect luck two zombie D's every single time. Plus, you'd probably run low on your attack spells after a little while, so they're uh, tougher to take down than the Agmas are. And then Peninsula Power, again, a great uh, spot to grind at up until like level 11 or 12, but we want to go um, to 15 in order to get our warp spell in there, and so that's why that's not available to us. And Warp is the fifth level spell that we're going to get at Melmont coming out of this. And that is so valuable for backtracking uh, purposes. Like the next two dungeons, we could skip entire floors if we've got Warp. Uh, astute viewers might notice that Todd is attacking the uh, Agama with a flame sword, too, which uh, might seem counterproductive, but. Uh well, uh, weapon elemental properties, like many things in this game, do not work at all. So, um, uh, weapons are how much damage you do with weapons is just purely based on their attack power stat. Yeah, it was intended that certain weapons would do extra damage to uh, enemies, like a dragon sword would do more damage to dragons. 
Um, the wear sword would do more damage to regenerate creatures. The coral sword would do ma more damage to aquatic creatures. Ice sword to flame and so on. But none of those work. Absolutely none. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we sold the dragon sword back at Elfland. So the dragon sword sells for 4,000, which you can use to directly buy a silver sword that has better stats. And critical hits don't work either, too. Uh, that's another completely different reason for that bug. Uh, yeah. That's also one of the reasons why the thief class um, is not nearly as good as it could have been. Uh, thief class was supposed to have the best critical hit weapons in the game, uh, like the katana and other stuff that was thief exclusive or ninja exclusive, had really high critical hit rates, and most of the other weapons topped out at a much lower value. But instead of um, looking at, in this table of critical hit values, what the value was based on the index, instead took the index itself which means the first critical, first weapon has the lowest critical rate at half percent, the second weapon has a one percent, the third weapon has a one and a half percent, and so on, up until the magic, which is the very late one. So all of the late game weapons are gonna have really good critical hit rates, um, especially the night gear, which tends to be the ones right at the very end of the list, because you get Excalibur right near the end, as well as uh, things like the Sun Sword and defense. Another thing worth noting is that Jire mentioned a bit ago that these are two trap tiles that Fiesel is just stepping back and forth to fight this Agamo over and over again. And uh, um, just because of a lot of factors that um, have happened in the run so far, the amount of experience that he needs to get, I believe it's level 15 for all of his characters, is going to be different from, uh, from playthrough to playthrough. So because uh, trap tiles do not advance the step counter when he, uh, when he steps on them, uh, that means that he can grind uh, to his heart's content without um, having that actually impact his uh, manipulation route for uh, the rest of the volcano. And here we are hitting level 12, so I'm going to take a break while Fiesel continues on this Agamemnon grind. Normally we have about 45 Agamemnon to get through, so I'll have enough chance to go outside, stretch a little bit, take some water, and then Fiesel will get a chance to take a break while I'm on my part of the game, which is going to be coming up right after Druger Volcano. All right, and this would be a pretty good time to read some donations. All right, sounds good. We've got $30 from Cyclone. Greetings from the audience behind you. Final Fantasy is one of my favorite games and I've watched both Fiesel and Gyre a lot. I also have one of those sweet white mage shirts on today. And that new Final Fantasy themed shirt on the Yeti looks amazing. Speaking of the Yeti, I wish Yeti the best of luck in his upcoming adventures. Surely nothing bad will happen to him. Split my donation between the two runners choice. We can probably get those from you at the end of the run. Got $25 from DTSKD. First time donating, been watching for a while though. You guys do awesome work and I wanted to help support it. My dad was diagnosed with cancer last summer and just finished his chemo a few weeks ago. Here's to preventing cancer. The main thing that we do not want to see on these battles is the Agama using its heat attack, which is a, uh, it's not, I mean, it's, it's a AOE attack. It's not terribly dangerous, but um, just because of how many battles he's fighting here, the, uh, if, if enough of them do that, in addition to the animation being kind of slow, he will eventually have to go into the menu and heal p via potions, which he will then have to rebuy later on, too. Another interesting thing about these battles is uh, we call an RNG loop. The in-battle RNG, it's based on a table of numbers, 256 numbers in memory, and every time the game needs some random number for computing a damage value, a hit or miss, or targeting, or something like that, it'll pull from that table. It'll take you know the next one in that table and then advance the pointer. And so what happens is if during a battle or a pair of battles you use up exactly 256 random numbers, you'll be back right where you started again at the, at the start of the next battle. So sometimes you'll see, um, you know, in like two agamas in a row, you'll have exactly the same things happen on a loop. Like every two agamas will be exactly the same. And it means that between those two battles, it's totaling up to exactly 256 numbers. And some of those RNG loops are good and some of them are really bad. In fact, the fewer party members you have, the more likely you are to see those RNG loops because every time it's looking for a target, and if that if that uh, character is not there, it rolls again. So it needs to, to keep you know pulling more and more random numbers out. So you'll see ra uh, RNG loops quite a lot in uh, in runs where fewer than four characters are alive. For yeah, instance, the world record route. Yeah, because like in that route, I mean, well, he's never he pretty basically never has has the f his full party because he plays most of the game with three characters and then. While well, he's doing this grind, doing grind yeah. yeah, he does start killing off some of those characters in order to route more experience to, uh, in particular, one of his fighters. Well, 
but there's still not much of anything going on, so you can keep reading donations. All right, well, on that note, we have a $1,000 donation. Lord Bobot says, an awesome event as always. I'm just sorry I will miss so many of the runs due to work, but that means I'll have something to hold me over until SGDQ. And that's right, don't forget that as soon as the event is over, you'll be able to start watching any uh, VODs of the runs you've missed on the YouTube channel for Games Done Quick. I think in a lot of cases before the event is over too, a lot of them are being uploaded in real time. I forget how fast it works sometimes. We've got $10 from Schism, who says, Hey, Poexel, hey, Gyre. Nice to see the Final Fantasy run. Always enjoy watching y'all streams. Schism here. Wish y'all the best of luck. Well, I say RNG, but whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, those chests are still twice the size of the sprites. I always remind Gyre of that. Great run so far, and I'm enjoying the run. G uh, good job, Fiesel, Gyre, and Poexel. Hey, Schism, thanks very much for joining. Thank you. This look like the loop. Let's see if we get in here. So have you explained what the RNG yeah. loops are? Yep. Great. So hopefully we do have some RNG loops sometime during the grind. I probably get it maybe every five or six playthroughs in here. Uh, we'll go ahead and it looks like he did not get the chance to strike first. So I'm going to guess he's going to break out of it um, during this section, but we'll find out. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Better luck next time, Fiesel. You'll have another chance at level 14 is probably your best shot for it. Like early on level 14 um, is the best chance to get an RNG loop as well as the most ideal time to have it because you'll have so many of those battles coming in. That's right, because the RNG loop does get messed up when you get a level up. Because when a level up happens, it needs to pull from the uh, the random table in order to figure out your stat gains because the stat games, are, stat gains are random. So if that happens, it'll just pull a few extra numbers and it'll ruin your cycle. By the way, did you ever get the bottom treasure chest one coming in? I did. Oh, right, so I you've done the one thing that you're supposed to <laughs> have me remind you of twice now right. so far during the run. <laughs> so I'm we actually had actually. a bit of trivia sent in by a viewer. Would it be okay if I gave you guys that trivia question? Mm. Sure. All right. Legaya89 sends $25 and says, You gave us some trivia, so I'm going to give you guys one. If you answer this one right, I'll donate more. In this Final Fantasy, what is the rarest enemy to encounter besides Warmack? Warmack is not enemy encounter. I'm going to go with Iron Gauntlet yeah, because it's Iron only on Gauntlet. one floor. It's a 1 in 64 encounter that's found only on Team S4 and Temple of Fiends. That's right. The Warmack is not actually the rarest encounter. That's a 3 out of 64 chance. I, I did already get it. Uh, yeah, there's actually an even rarer encounter than that, even on Warmack's floor. So what was that answer? Was Iron, Iron Golem? Iron Golem. Okay. The answer we got here is T-Rex. I'm not sure. T-Rex is also in the same boat. Um, that is only in one zone, one sixty-four encounter that can be found in the desert area around Mirage Tower. So those are equally <laughs> true. <laughs> They're pretty interesting. Yeah. All right, the guy eighty-nine Gyre just dropped some knowledge on you there. So process that and see if you can donate some more. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. <laughs> I believe there's been some debate too on whether you're trying to use the heal staff during these fights to counteract the uh, heats is worth it or not, and I think the answer is no at this point. Very slightly better to use the heal potions. Um, it depends though, if you've got all four characters in need of healing, you can go and pop one of the heal staffs, but every once in a while when you do that, you're going to get the Agamemnon extra opportunity to get an attack in, or in the worst case, an extra heat that's going against you. Um, so I usually don't use the heal staff unless I have a chance to strike first, or uh, we're level 14 or higher. Um, and that's just because at level 14 you can do enough damage with your other characters that they'll probably kill the Agamemnon even without Yeti's help here. Yeah, because you do need to keep in mind that anytime um, use of heal potions happens, it's going to need to buy them back um, at some point before the end of the run. So in addition to using the potions itself, there's like, what, a three second or so uh, cost for buying it back? It's about a little bit more than two seconds, yeah. Okay. Alright, so Fiesel's hitting a level 14 here. That means that he's only got one more level left to go. It's about a dozen Agamas for level 14 to 15. Each of the levels that we're getting around this point is about one Agama more than the previous level was, because um, as you go up in um, levels for this game, you get more and more experience required to get to the next one. That's how they kind of stretch things out and make sure that you have to fight tougher and tougher monsters over time. 
And for these early levels, it's not too bad of a penalty. Uh, but once you get to the late game, like you actually try to grind up to the max level of 50, you'd be fighting just forever against monsters in order to get that. In fact, anything past like the high 30s or around 40 or so is probably um, out of the question unless you've got a lot of patience. Or doing like a single character challenge? Single character against Warmech, I guess you could do over and over again at 40s, but uh, even then, that's a pretty uh, tough thing to get through. Got $100 from MS Kane. Says, as a life lifelong RPG gamer, what better game to donate during than the original Final Fantasy? Watching Fiesel and Jyrx play this never gets old, especially with the awesome couch presence of Quexel backing them up. This money goes to uh, goes to Castlevania Symphony of the Night because the awesome blindfold run of SGDQ needs a follow up, right, Quexel? Absolutely. Are there any incentives for upcoming runs later tonight that uh, still need to get met? I'm looking. Um, we have the River City Ransom name the character Bid War. We do have Mighty Number no. 9 Maniac difficulty, which is only at 2,900 out of 9,000, so that's definitely something you could show some love to. You can also, there's a Bid War for the soundtrack choice for Mighty Number no. 9. And then there's also playing the Ray DLC for Mighty Number no. 9, which is at 450 out of 3,000. We also have a pretty <coughs> close one, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, the co-op run coming up later. <laughs> there's a donation incentive for the group to sing. There is. Uh, <laughs> 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 it's okay, Fiesel, not, not trying to distract you. Uh, it is to sing Freddy's nursery rhyme. <laughs> I'm doing that run, so I, yeah. so I, I was not aware of this. <laughs> well, that's only got $200 left. It's at 1,063 out of 1,234, so you may be doing some singing later. Mm. Got $30, $30 from Jason T, who says, Seeing Final Fantasy at AGDQ is very sentimental to me. I lost my father at a young age, and playing this game with him is one of my favorite memories. $20 from one of your fans. Hello, AGDQ. I've been a fan of this event for years, but never had the honor of seeing it live or donating. But that changes today. Final Fantasy on the NES is my favorite Final Fantasy, and I'm overjoyed that you guys are finally doing it. Thank you to uh, the runners and also to the amazing staff over there. Cheers, my friends. We should be coming up pretty close to the end of the Agama grind here. We're waiting for those level 15s to pop up. And normally this is around the 185th battle in the game so far. If you've been counting along, right <laughs> in to tell us how many battles we've done. <laughs> I have a game that I play, which is called Fantasy Final Fantasy, which is a bot that watches the stream in real time um, and then does scoring based on uh, what all the monsters are doing to try to pick a group of monsters that are going to troll the party the most, give you the most um, a bad time. That's something I actually picked up from Fiesel, uh, who kind of came up with that back in the day to make those world record runs a little bit more sustainable so that you're not going crazy watching him reset and do the first 20 minutes over and over again. Uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do Fantasy Final Fantasy um, here at the event because of the way that we have a different capture set, but uh, you know, I would love to get uh, more people excited into that as well. It's a great way to make it so that even if you're not having a good time at the speed run, everybody in the channel is enjoying it um, at your misery and expense. Do you want the fighter to level 15, or should we just let him stay at 14? Uh, the, the one that's been dead, he can, he can stay behind. Okay, so then we're done. Fighter's levels are almost irrelevant up until the Battle of Chaos, so it's really the mages that are going to be important here so that you have um, those spell slots when you need them. The fighters, uh, we will get them uh, some extra XP at the end. We've got a couple of tricks that is going to help them power level uh, without having to do any more grinding. So the rest of the volcano is pretty much the only part of the game where we're anything resembling a kind of recommended level for uh, this area. Yeah, this one boss fight, and that's it. And I think even this one, we're still low because you're supposed to be like level 15 around the Earth Cave, so probably mm -hmm. like 18 for the volcano is what. If I went back and looked at the Nintendo Power Strategy Guide, it would probably be telling me.
people there serenading the boss with some beautiful music, which soothes and lulls them to sleep. And we'll go and get into this fight with Carrie. The Carrie fight is pretty straightforward. This is the first time that you actually have fast spells available. So we'll be fasting the fighters, uh, which is going to give them twice as many attacks per round. In the later Final Fantasies, fast um, makes your ATB charge. ATB gauge charge up faster, so the attacks more quickly. Um, we don't have ATB here. Um, instead, we're going to go from three attacks, typically on these ice swords, to six attacks, which means if we get some really good hits, we could actually one round carry. More likely, it's going to be like a three or four round fight, though. Yeah, because every time one of these characters swings their weapon, they're actually attacking multiple times. And like, if you watch uh, um, the messages displaying at the bottom, it'll tell you how many times you hit exactly, and then each one um, is a separate damage roll. And those breakpoints are based on your accuracy score. So after you get a certain number of accuracy points, you get an additional attack. Like when we were back at the beginning of the game, level five plus the short swords gave us um, two attacks per round versus one. We saw that earlier here when Fusel was doing the grind. It went to, you got a level 11, it went from two attacks to three attacks to those sides. It's all um, pretty complicated formulas in there for uh, computing how many hits you're going to have. And there we go, two bosses down. And with that, I am going to take over again. We're going to go on, do a little bit of shopping before we go into our next section, but uh, we will soon be doing additional bosses. This game is pretty heavily backloaded uh, for a lot of the action here, so we do a lot of preparation, making sure that we're able to kind of cruise through these remaining dungeons without any uh, significant fights left. All right, and Fusil's left me, it looks like, plenty of gold here for this section, so we should be good. I'll start by buying... Um, Two warp spells, one each for our mages. Warp is a really useful spell. It takes you back to the previous floor of a dungeon. There's also the exit spell, which takes you all the way out of the dungeon, but we don't go up to a high enough level to be able to use that. And I'm not even sure we can. I think it's red a white mages. spell. Yeah, I think a white yeah. wizard only. Yeah. Uh, but we will get a lot of use out of warp, saving us a lot of backtracking. And here I'm flying up to the caravan, which is one of the required spots to go for a quest. And this is actually a glitch. You can land directly on top of the caravan. You wouldn't expect that because it's a desert tile. But the way it's coded is it has to be doing this variable check depending on whether or not the bottle quest is done, whether that shop appears. And because it's special codes there, um, it doesn't block the airship from landing. And here we go. The town of Gaia is our next destination. We'll be buying a couple of items in here. And that bottle we picked up, it contains a fairy. We're about to use it. Here for I see a broom. Let's see what this broom has to say. Oh, here we go. Do you have great power? Well, now that we've fought these Agamas, I think we've got uh, enough we power do. to get on to the next part of the game. So That's Gaia was the correct answer for that trivia question. We'll go ahead and get rid of our silver gauntlets here. That's going to be on each of our fighters as well as our silver shields. That gives me just enough money to buy three pro rings. Unfortunately, we've got four characters. Um, Another route that I had, which is about 45 seconds of detour, does get 20,000 more gold in treasure chests, so you get a pro ring for everybody. But this is good enough, because we're going to get in a ribbon pretty soon there for Todd, so he'll be able to uh, resist instant death from that. He won't have as good defense, um, but the difference between Zeus Gauntlet, oops, I want to sell there instead of buy. The difference between Zeus Gauntlet and pro ring is pretty minor. Let's go ahead and get rid of our swords. Yeah, he doesn't really need to attack things, so you know why have any swords at all on him? Yeti's more on the uh, more about the fist of cups than the uh, the metal. And now I'm gonna go ahead and buy one house, which is gonna be used to recover my spell treasures in between waterfall and sea shrine, and then buy a whole bunch of cabins. This is hopefully enough cabins to get us through the entire rest of the game, so that we never have to buy these things again. This is a good one because it's the very first item in the spell shop or the, the item shop, so you can see that they don't have a consistent order for things, and so you have to know which shops are the best ones for doing certain purchases. That. Even as a kid, I've never bought heal potions from this shop just because of how far down the list it is. And there we go, our fairy is freed. And while we're walking over there, let me ask the next trivia question, which is, um, we're about to go visit some mermaids at the Sea Shrine, but there's one ex-mermaid in the game. What is her name? The name of the ex-mermaid. Uh, on that note, I have a response from our previous trivia question asker. Uh, we have Lagaya89 with a follow-up $10 who says, Well done. Both of the monsters you named had a 1.6% chance to encounter. Keeping my word with another donation. Well played. Thank you. Nice. So 
Do I have time for a couple more? Sure. Yeah. All right, we've got $25 from Anonymous who said, after hearing about the co-op uh, Elm Street singing incentive, I couldn't help but donate. Warm up those vocal cords, Fiesel. <laughs> 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 All right, let's see if we get our friend Greg Peed here. Let's make sure that I am on the correct step route. There we go. So this is one of those really rare times where we do not do a hard reset coming outside of a major dungeon. So I want to make sure that I am on the step route before we go into the waterfall here. And this is just to get better encounters in Waterfall Cave, right? Plus, I don't have to do the hard power resets. Um, the hard power resets are a lot slower um, for those setups in there as compared to the soft resets. All right, here we go. Waterfall. Waterfall is a one floor dungeon. So once we get the quest setting, we can warp back out of here by using our warp spells. Um, I'll go and fight potentially some of the encounters in here, depending on which ones are going to be worth more than an Agamemnon's worth of experience. That's my unit of measurement for everything for this late part of the game is in terms of Agamemnon's. You probably have seen so many that you're an expert in weighing and measuring Agamemnon's, so it's useful now to compare them to everything else. All right, this formation is a little bit less than one and a half Agamemnon's, so I'm going to go ahead and take this. You can get between one and two um, whiz mummies, plus up to, I think, six regular mummies um, accompanying them. Seems like this game uh, brings up a lot of good memories with people. Uh, I have some of myself, I'm sure you guys do as well. We've got $75 from Last August who says, Final Fantasy is the first game I beat with my dad. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for your effort. I lost a grandma to cancer last year, but you are all awesome. And on a similar note, $15 from Xanth, who says, Final Fantasy was the first game I bought on release day with my allowance. Good to see it get love today. My mom took me to the store to buy it, and she lost her battle with cancer last May, so I have to donate now in her memory. So this dungeon here, we don't have to do this before the Sea Shrine. The thing you get here is the cube. The cube is what lets you get from um, Mirage Tower into the Sky Palace, which is not going to be until after we're done with yeah. Kraken. But it pays to do this now because we get a couple of things. We get the ribbon and we get the defense sword, which are both really good items. Because we can't even get into the Mirage Tower yet, too. We need right. the chime for that. All right, I'll do one last fight here. And after this fight, I want everybody to be looking off into the inky greenness of space <laughs> down to the south there. There is one bat. We had nope. a really, really, really good sighting last night in practice. Yeah, of all the bats in the game, we've, we've cursed and said bad things about them. But there is one bat who is our friend. That's Out of Bounds Bat. He actually spawns Out of Bounds. Um, sometimes he gets so far out of, out of bounds that we can't find him. But hopefully we have a good Out of Bounds Bat setting. We had like an amazing one last night. I want to see Out of Bounds Bat here. So everybody, come along. Hope right. that we get him. Look down. Come on, are we going to get him? Where is he? Oh, uh, he's gone. Oh, man, uh, he's so far out of bounds. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. That is one of the many, many glitches in the game. Ask him. Let's go yeah, ahead. Only two birds. The Perilous can be instant death, and those cockroaches can turn you to stone. The mummies are prioritized over the birds, so you often don't see birds at all, but we've got not enough mummies to be able to, to push the birds out. Yeah, all right, we're fine, though. If it had been five whiz mummies there, I would have definitely taken that, but only one whiz mummy. He's the primary XP source for that fight. There's the cube, lets us get into the Sky Palace, but that'll be much later. Another case of hoping that we all enjoy the first few notes of the uh, music. And now, oh. Now we're gonna get some use out of that warp spell so we don't have to backtrack. We can just warp right out, really good. Next, for a one floor dungeon, the warp spell does effectively the same thing as the exit spell, which is meant to be better. Now I'm going to be doing some sailing here while using my cabins. The reason is because we want to skip four battles before going into the sea shrine. This is a relatively recent update to the route that I did. Um, there's the very first battle, which is against uh, a Naga monster who casts the Lit 2 spell. Lit 2, pretty damaging at this point, so you want to avoid it. And then I used to have three battles against this monster called Wiz Ziglet. It's one of those really strange unrunnables. And it gives you really terrible experience points. So I would take an unrunnable if it gave me good experience points, but a bad one, you know, it's just a waste of your time. And Fiesel kind of gave me a, a route which had zero of those. Um, unfortunately, it kind of gave me worse XP overall, but it inspired me to go find um, a setup here that let me get only one Wizzig when while still getting enough XP to get hopefully level 16 by the end of this dungeon. Yeah, routing in this game is really fun. Just 
once you know how it works and you've made up some charts to help you, you know, see what the encounters would be, you're just trying out the different possibilities of, you know, what if I skip this many here, or, you know, what enemies can I get where, there's, I would think there probably are still even better routes through some of these dungeons than what we're using, just because the possibility space is so big. And right there, I was checking soft potions. I forgot if he's allowed to use any soft potions back in not. Ice Cave. I did not. Um, you want to get back um, at least up to two at this point in the game. So if you had to use a bunch in there, then you would have rebought them right at that spot. Because you need soft potions at the very end. You won't quite spoil why yet. <laughs> and for a game like this, just the routing and exploration and stuff like that is kind of what the meat of the speedrun process is like. Just because, I mean... There isn't really a whole lot of like technically difficult uh, execution in this run, other than just, and to some extent, accurate movement. Well, menuing, yeah, I mean, you can lose so much time to menuing, especially with the healing. And the execution is mostly in the battle, just keeping track of how much damage you've done and which, you know, which enemies you need to split your guys up on. But yeah, a lot of the work goes in ahead of time when you're planning your route, and then once you actually execute it, it's just a matter of, you know, paying attention. Now here, we, here we are in the sea I'm going to pick up the opal armor, which is going to be the replacement for that iron armor. We've got all the way back in for Vulcan. You might imagine, how can we get through a game like this, which does so much damage on all the attacks without doing armor upgrades? It's because um, of the picks that we take on the monsters, um, as well as knowing where to heal up ahead of time. If you know that you can get up to full HP, a lot of times it's not possible for the monsters to one-shot you, but towards the later part of the game, you definitely need all the armor that you can get. And uh, this is the best of the upgrades that we've seen so far. The Kruger Volcano had flame armor, but you have to fight a red D plus two more of those Agma battles in order to get it. Ice Cave had frost armor, but you have to fight one to two frost dragons there. That's a really tough battle. Um, and then there is no guardian for the steel armor. It's well, like it's guarded by a shopkeeper. He demands an exorbitant amount of cash for it. Mm -hmm. Take a lot of grinding in order to be able to get that. All right. Well, now I'm going to take my little break. And I'm sure Jared will be fine without me. I'll be back in just a minute, guys. All right, we will wait for your return. It's coming down here. I'm going to be fighting a bunch of battles against uh, sharks here. So whenever I see two gray sharks or gray shark plus big guy, these are generally pretty good battles for experience points. So um, I'm picking out the ones that are going to be the most efficient. Like normally I'm going to say I'm going to be picking through one and a half agmas or better worth of experience. And once you get a little bit later on in the game, two agmas worth of experience. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to do a slightly different route because we need to fight Olmec. And so I might be getting some of that experience a little bit, a bit early. This, by the way, is my favorite dungeon of the game, which is why I actually specifically asked to do it. Uh, Beazle's favorite dungeon is Temple of Fiends. Um, that's a little bit of uh, how it influenced our run. The reason I like this dungeon so much is because it's the first part of the game where it feels like you have complete um, flexibility for all of your characters. Everybody's got enough attack power to attack things. They've got spells. They've got usable items. So there's many more choices than just holding down the A button, which the beginning of the game uh, kind of feels like that um, to some extent. Whereas here, you've got a lot of different combat possibilities. You have a very interesting dungeon in that there is two separate routes entirely. Um, you don't often see this. Like, there's a lot of complaints about Final Fantasy being linear. Well, the very first one has a non-linear section in here where you can go and do the mermaid's quest so that you can get into Tiamat's castle, or you can go um, and fight Kraken instead. There we go. This is my one Wiz Zaguin battle. So we are now through the Wiz Zaguins. That's always going to have nine monsters there. 50 50 whether you get one with Sigwin or two. We got one, which means it's only two thirds of an egg worth of experience, and it's just so slow waiting for all of them to do their attacks. Let's go ahead and grab the Mage Staff as well. Mage Staff is going to fall into our second fighter's inventory. I actually wanted to have it on the fighter because um, he's able to now be a third source of fire twos during combat. Uh, that means that all we encounter those undead packs later on in the game, uh, we'll actually be able to pretty much mow them down without having to uh, go to a second round of battle. I mean, I believe really that's another small optimization where he arranged for the first fighter to have a full weapon inventory so that the mage staff would automatically go into the second fighter's uh, list and then he wouldn't have to spend time opening the menu to move it. Here we are coming up to our top floor. This is where the mermaids are. Have we gotten an answer to our trivia question yet, by the way? I don't think I've heard one. We're about to reveal it here on stream. All right. <coughs> we actually do have our answer. And Avon Chaos provided it with a $5 donation saying the mermaid's name is Daryl with two R's. 
That is correct. Nice. So her friend Daryl uh, left the mermaids a long time ago and became a human. That's actually a reference to the movie Splash, which uh, starred Daryl Hannah. So hmm. if you know your 1980s movies, that's where you can get the reference from. That is hilarious. <laughs> this is also our rare chance to hear a complete music loop in this game. Somewhat interrupted by talking to the mermaid, though. You have all the plots, spots that you're at. Because you're opening treasure chests and getting the battles and going through floors so often, you never hear the music cycle all the way through. Unfortunately, we interrupted that to go uh, do our trivia question, but uh, that is the one spot where you can hear it. If you go all the way from that opal bracelet up to where I just got the slab. So I'm going to go ahead and drop the silver armor here, as well as the silver helmet. That opal armor or opal bracelet is the best armor in the game for mages. Unfortunately, there's only one, so we're gonna have a pretty extreme asymmetry between our mages uh, for the rest of the game. So we got one mage, Todd, who is uh, probably going to do much better in these battles than uh, Yeti will. But Yeti was gonna play a very, very important role at the end. Um, so definitely don't count him out. to making awesome t-shirts with uh, charitable proceeds. Now throughout this uh, dungeon, you'll see me doing these really small optimizations for walking. We explained earlier on about safe squares in dungeons. Uh, but again, in front of doorways, doorways themselves, and in the south edges of interior rooms, they're all safe squares. So I am trying to intentionally just barely brush and kiss up against them in order to get uh, some extra free stuff in here. This gets rid of one encounter as well as moves the encounters to better floors. I've got my Grey Shark and Big Eye here. Big Eye is one of the best XP monsters in the game. It has like no real damaging attacks. Um, it's got a single target paralysis, which you can mostly ignore at this point, and it's worth way more than the Grey Shark actually is. There we go, just hitting up against that doorway right there. zones, but there's something like seven floors. Yes, because you're actually going up and down the dungeon quite a bit, it doesn't uh, have a really clear mental picture for it, but whenever you've got the same um, five floors of this uh, dungeon, B1 through B5, down to B1 for Kraken, up to B5 for the mermaids, it's going to reuse it. So if you count the up and down stairway transitions, you'll know what floor that you're on. Same thing happened back at um, Ice Cave, for example, like the really tiny floor we went through like only three steps, that's actually the bottom floor of the dungeon. So that's where a lot of the really dangerous monsters are as a result. Yeah, my guess is that if you could go out of bounds, you would probably find that you, you might encounter other floors just within that same map. I bet it's all implemented in the same map. I would guess so too. I've actually never tried it because this game is relatively robust. There's many, many bugs as we talk about and things that, you know, we kind of say is, uh, you know, a flaw or potential thing. But it's actually really well programmed for sequence breaks and out of bounds, uh, making sure that um, there's no way to kind of uh, solve the game more quickly than intended, at least on the US version. Right, unless you're a bat. If you're yeah. a bat, you can go out of bounds. <laughs> <laughs> or a door in some cases. Go ahead and grab the ribbon here. So now we've got two of those. And I'm going to get 9,900 gold here as well. If you want the bottom trench chest, you can get there with no steps at all. But we have enough money for our route as it is. Yeah, ribbon is basically is, well, it's the ultimate helmet in this game. It has kind of varying roles throughout the Final Fantasy series. but. Uh, yeah, we want to get every ribbon we can for really good uh, magic defense, especially. But sadly, there's uh, there's three ribbons and four light warriors, so it's going to have some unfortunate repercussions later on. Yeah, it wasn't until the Donna Souls version of the game where they added some additional uh, dungeons and content in there that they gave you a fourth ribbon to be able to play around with. I'll go ahead and throw up one more heal staff here if we can get a chance to, but this point, I'm really just trying to conserve Yeti's um, Cure 2 spells particularly. Those turn into Lit 2s for the Kraken battle. And all four of the bosses in the first version that you fight them have a weakness. So Lich is weak to fire, Carry is weak to status ailments, Kraken's weak to lightning, and Tima is weak to poison. But um, when they get the refights at the very end of the game, there's going to be a, a boss rush for that. Um, all those weaknesses are removed in addition to making the bosses stronger. Only one 
what I'm missing here, but I did get three in the first battle as well as already hitting level 16 thanks to a decent number of Gur Sharks. So we are generally going to be good on experience coming through this. 16 is my target coming through this dungeon, 17 in Mirage Tower, 18 in Sky Castle. That's actually the end of the game. Um, 18 is where our mages are going to wind up, 19 for the fighters. Again, we've got a, a special trick to power level them um, so that they can get one extra level for the chaos battle. Yeah. I believe all of the elementals, except I think the air elementals, are inescapable too, which is why he bought that, even though he didn't need it. It's, it's experience. Yeah, except for the elementals, or when the elementals come with the companions. So like if you get uh, Naga plus Water Elemental, you can run from that. And it's really nothing like special about the coding for the game about elemental types. Instead, it's which monster formations were used to guard treasure chests. Um, that's generally what I found the pattern is. Like obviously, there's nowhere written down explaining exactly what the intentions were, but. For the speedrun, what happens is you have to memorize all kinds of locations for where these battles are going to take place. So Kraken is graciously uh, waiting for us to heal up before facing him. All right, looks good. Now, let's see how many attacks our uh, maces are going to take with the face. This is probably one of the first times that you see a boss that could just absolutely destroy your party. There we go. Luckily, he again went against the fighter there. If he had gone against the mage, that's generally a one-shot. We do want to get these fast spells off so that our fighters can do more damage. After the fast spells, we're going to go and start doing lit twos. Um, you'll see the lit twos sometimes do even more damage than the fighter's attack, so hopefully we do keep the mages alive here. Kraken's got 800 hit points we need to get through. Ink is probably the best move we can do. Darkness, um, explain this earlier, has no effect whatsoever, so it's one of the glitches in the game. So this makes it so that's pretty much a waste of his turn. Nice Zeus, 148. Possibly dead this round. There, oh, he, there goes. he goes. Good job, Yeti. Kraken will be back, though, and much, much <laughs> angrier. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Three of our four fiends have been defeated, but we do have the fourth and hardest one left. That is Tiamat here. I'm going to go ahead and skip two battles to make my walk down to um, the airship again a little bit easier. This saves me having to do a bunch of really awkwardly placed um, cabins while sailing. So I just have to remember the one corner square here. That's to get rid of a battle with uh, nachos, or as we call them, the poisonous nachos. Um, nachos um, give you decently good experience points, and I used to actually go out of my way to fight a lot of them here, but uh, since they're only barely more than one Agamal with experience points, uh, it turns out it's better to get them out of the route because they do like to ambush you and poison you quite a bit. Remind me to talk to Dr. Rune here. I mean, everybody knows who Dr. Rune is. One of our fabulous um, NPCs that uh, is world famous, but every once in a while I forget to do that after doing this spell shopping. We need to learn the Life Spell. This is a really, really nice spell, um, as well as Cure 3. Cure 3 is mostly going to be used for uh, the final boss, although um, it can come in handy during the battle with the team out there. And I had plenty of money left over. Um, I could have even skipped that 99. 9900 gold has been fine. <laughs> yeah. That's a tomb. Ah, there's Dr. Rune. Yeah. They look pretty similar, but <laughs> he's able to teach us the Lufanian language in mere seconds there. So we're uh, now equipped to go to the town of Lufania. You can get there beforehand. Um, and when we get to Lufania, I want to know how much is it going to be to buy both the Life 2 and Nuke spells? Life 2 plus Nuke. How much is that? This area that we're flying over right now, this is, if you were to go to the Peninsula of Power, in fact, we saw almost a little glimpse of the Peninsula of Power there, this is the monster zone that that pokes out into. So these are the monsters that we would have gotten if we had fought a Peninsula of Power. One Zomble, though, that's pretty weak. We would have liked to see four of them. Yeah, one to four Zombles plus zero to two Trolls in this formation. So this is a one in 12 um, chance of getting a really bad encounter here. Fortunately, I do have three chances at doing this. I mean, even Ice 2, um, which is a little bit more powerful than Fire 2 and Lit 2, uh, aren't, isn't particularly effective at taking them down. Now, I can do that if I am uh, concerned about my experience points and I see four giants there, but 
probably tonight I think we can go ahead and give him a pass. Yeah, three zombies is a little bit better. And we're getting some use out of that mage staff. It's going to cast fire two. Three out of four of us casting fire two. We should be able to one round these things. And thanks to the uh, intelligence stat not actually affecting spell damage, the uh, fighter using fire two via the staff does the same damage as a wizard casting it. Directly south of here, this is where the Peninsula Tower would be, like about one screen or so south of him. All right, here we go, navigating the Toga Party first. We need to get the Chime, which is um, actually in that southern, southeast uh, NPC there, but there's all these guys blocking the way almost every single time. Five of them uh, can really plug up this bridge. There we go, we've got the Chime, which is our quest item now to get into Mirage Tower, plus uh, the cube that we had earlier. We'd normally warp to get out of here, but we have a bit of a fact-finding mission. Yeah, we need to find out how much those spells do cost. Let's go and reveal that here. So, of course, our white magic shop is going to be where we buy Lurch 2. And it's, well, it's not 860,000 gold. It's just because it runs together on the screen. <laughs> Things are costing so much. It's really 60,000 there for Life 2. Let's go in for Nuke as well. 60,000 there as well. So, first person that had entered 120,000 gold for that shopping trip. Uh, was correct on that. You can see the town kind of wrapping around like that. Um, that's actually something that is true for all the dungeons in the game. It just generally you don't s ever come close enough to the borders to see that happen. Right, we're heading over towards Mirage Tower now. The last of well, it's going to take us to the last of the four elemental dungeons. But only one zombie. This is pretty bad. Jar is going to have to uh, improvise a little bit if he wants to get his experience up. What we want to do is be level 18. We want to have the mages be level 18 by the time we enter Temple of Fiends. And uh, that's going to be important for getting them spell charges. That level 18 is going to get them a third charge of the fifth tier spells, the level 5 spells, uh, which includes life, warp, and cure 3, all three of which we hope to use. Well, we hope to not use life, <laughs> but we, we hope to have it. If we need it, we hope to have it available. It'd be really great if we didn't use Cure 3 as well. So right. ideally, we use a single fifth tier spell charge, which is the warp charge. That saves us some backtracking. Um, basically, eliminates four encounters right at the very end of the game. But um, often, you do want to have those Cure 3s for chaos. And every once in a while, hopefully not tonight, we're going to see those life spells broken out as well. So I decided to go ahead and take the giant battle since we did get four of them. Yeah, that's yet another reason why red mages are used instead of black mages for... Uh, for a run like this too is because with black mages you have no healing magic whatsoever which includes no way to revive characters so basically if anybody dies in the final dungeon then the run's over right the nice thing about black mages though is that they get spell charges at uh, uh, an earlier level they get more spell charges at an earlier level than the red mages do There's my ankylo, so I manipulated it so I wouldn't get to Sandworms. That's probably the worst monster in the game for this section right here because they have a skill called Crack. Um, crack is instant death if you are not resistant to the earth elemental type. And except for the ribbon, you don't have anything that grants earth resistance. Okay, go ahead and put your ribbon on. And again, like we said, probably like an, at least an hour and a half ago, when you use a house, it recovers um, HP and also um, spell charges, but it's bugged in a way so that it's, it doesn't recover your spell charges until after it's saved the game. So whenever he's going to be using a house and then resetting, he needs to use either a uh, tent or a cabin, or I guess in theory another house, to uh, um, make it so that when he resets, he actually gets his spell charges back. So this uh, first three battles here is going to be guard, vampire, guard, and I'm hoping for actually a decent amount. Hey, five That's vampires is good. Mm -hmm. This is the one. exact same vampire we fought back in the UFK. Let's see how many, how many one shots we can do. Yeti got a one shot before. There's two one shots for Yeti so far tonight. Uh, Seems respectable. Again, 156 is how much uh, HP the vampire has. You can see the fire too is just absolutely devastating on these guys. And they do give really good experience here. So that's two and a half Agamas worth of experience that I just fought. This first trip here in the Mirage Tower is actually to pick up items. I'm going to grab the Sun Sword, Dragon Mail, um, Aegis Shield. There's all kinds of good stuff around here. I'm going to go ahead and Mage Staff you as well. So this two-trip version of the Mirage Tower is uh, an innovation that Gyre came up with. Um, other uh, routes haven't been using that. Try to do this in one trip. 
and you know, sometimes you'll run into uh, the, some bird encounters, perilous encounters, and uh, or you have to end up skipping the Aegis Shield. Which you know, it's nice to have the Aegis Shield because it gives you elemental protections um, for the person who doesn't have the ribbon. So you're gonna see him come in here, get some items, leave, and then come back in again, and then go straight up to the top of the tower. There we go. Our good section of the dungeon is down. Now we have to fight the Catman. Catmen only appear one time in this run, and that's because, well, they are mostly going to ambush us and poison us, so you definitely want to avoid them. Yeah. Cat Catmen, not to be confused with man cats, which is a different monster. Yeah, man cats, much, much worse. And I'm being pretty picky about my predator right here because we do have a lot of menuing and item swaps that are going on in this dungeon. Once we're through um, this section here, really there's not much equipment left to get for the entire rest of the game. Dragon there's my armor. Thor hammer, my dragon armor, and my sun sword will up downstairs and grab our Aegis shield as well. Sun sword is the best weapon that we have so far. We'll see how many nightmare and bad men we get. Yeah, feels bad, man. So we have only one. Um, you can get up to two here, which is worth a decent amount of experience. I'm going to go ahead and fight this anyway, just because we did get a preemptive. Um, so I'll be able to take these uh, down without we'll to worry about uh, them taking turns during this fight. This is also one of the nice things about doing the two trip version is that you can really burn all the spells that you want getting experience here makes those fights much faster um, whereas you would have to pretty much conserve things much more carefully in the uh, one trip version all right we're gonna go ahead and throw away that ice shield it's been pretty good to us so far but we're picking up the aegis here i'm gonna go stand on this uh, one tile safe square remember to do both weapons and armor i will probably need to be righted again after i do this that looks correct and everything. Maybe weapons and arms. There we go. Right, Thor hammer. Okay, here we go. This is Mirage Tower for real. And it's important to be on your step route here because after eight really tough floors, there is a monster up at the top named Wormack, who we will be seeing tonight. Um, we will not be seeing him in this trip. I'll actually do a second trip out here um, after beating Tiamat in order to grab the Wormack fight. Um, that's just because uh, our odds of beating Wormack are pretty low. Um, we'll definitely fight him, and this is actually something that was um, talking about that trivia contest that we've been doing throughout the night. Uh, the very last bit of the competition was to take a photo with Warmack. So everybody tonight, take a picture next to your Twitch stream or your TV in there. Your selfie with Warmack. Warmack. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you two can win the prize, which was to have your name entered into a future Nintendo game. Um, it turned out, many years after this contest was run, that that Nintendo game was linked to the past. Um, so there is a hidden room um, with the winner's name in it. I'm not going to spoil who the winner is, but if you find the hidden room and look to the past, you'll find out who got their um, winning entry in the picture with Wormack contest. You need to work to find that hidden room, too. They, they did a good job hiding it. And with two vampires, we'll go ahead and skip it. We've gotten a decent amount of experience points, so we'll have about a 50% chance of having a good enough fight here to be worth taking. Um, and so over these six encounters, I'm hoping for about three that are um, at least decently usable. Time for any donations in this dungeon run? Yeah, I think we got a little bit of time going up. Okay, we've got $30.30 from Hazel. Thanks, AGDQ, for your awesome work and all the mind-blowing speedruns every January. My husband James and I watch every year. Final Fantasy is one of his favorite games. It's really cool to watch him enjoying the run. We lost his mom to cancer in 2015, so let's kick cancer to the curb. Keep up the great runs, and here's to the announcer's choice. Hi. Um, then there was a couple others. We've got $100 from Dekana, who says, Thanks to everyone for this amazing event. Here's a donation for a series that started an amazing series as well. Also, my employer will be matching this donation, so remind everyone to check and see if there is will too. And that's really good advice. A lot of employers will do that. And one that I have to read, we have $10 from 
Big Bird 89 on the back couch. Shoutouts from the back couch, Diesel. I want to hear you sing later, so let's put $10 more toward the goal. All right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time for the Blue D now. So this guy's got Thunder as his only skill. 50% chance of using skills on this monster. That means if he decides to Thunder, he pretty much is going to be doing it over and over again here. So it's just kind of a race to see if we can kill him as quickly as possible. Now, Thunder is not the end of the world, but um, it is pretty tight on a lot of my uh, healing throughout there. So there's our Thunder to the face. I like the fast on the spike. Hmm, that's an interesting strategy. Yeah, since, since it's been a while since we talked about how enemy AI works in this game, um, it's random each turn whether a monster does a physical attack, a spell, or a skill. But once that's been determined for the skills and the uh, spells, there's a fixed order that, that follows every time that type of action is chosen. Yeah, the priority is towards spell, but if it doesn't do a spell, then the, it next checks if it's going to do a skill. If it doesn't do a skill, then it finally falls back to a physical. And that's very important for s certain bosses. Here we go, fighting the Gur Naga. So the Naga here is actually much better than the Naga we had back in the Tichuan. Even though she's got spells that are almost always going to be um, buff spells and defensive spells, unless you let her go really far into her spell list. So this is um, kind of like free XP here as compared to getting lit to over and over again. We already saw enough of that from that blue D, so I'm gonna glad for a change of pace on it. There's Mute, probably the only time you're ever gonna see Mute in the game. We also just received a $500 anonymous donation with no comment. All right, we'll have plenty of time for donations while I am buying 99 heal potions after this dungeon, so we'll probably hold all the rest of them until then. Noted. Now here I've got a couple of good items to pick up. We're going to first, though, have a return match against our friend the Ayer, as he is in the Japanese version of the Beholder. So let's see if we can kill him a little bit more quickly than we did last time. I think he looks like Kang and Kodos from The Simpsons. <laughs> This is unrunnable, by the way. Um, because, because it was used as a boss right, earlier. Right, because uh, it was used as a boss, yeah. Yeah, he tried to um, glance against our lead fighter. If he did get the second fighter instead, that's actually possible for the eye to still take somebody out. Uh, fortunately, it's petrification rather than instant death, so you could fix it pretty easily with a soft potion here. Uh, but it's because Mr. MV does not have a ribbon yet. We're about to pick that up just two steps away, or I guess three steps away from it. his shield and helmet there and go start picking up some replacements. I wouldn't get the opal shield other than the fact that it's literally directly on the path where the ribbon is. And you can see us having to do juggling because of how full the menus are getting. Um, the last slot is going to be da or, um, Yeti picking up the white shirt here in the southeast corner. That's going to completely fill up our armor now. Uh, we've had to like really throw away and go through some very nice items in here. I'm going to pass up the black shirt because unfortunately we just don't have the room to carry it. Black Shirt casts Ice 2, I think? Yes, it does. And that is the weakness of these Nightmares that I'm fighting here. Nightmare plus Evil Man is a pretty good battle for XP. It's also very, very unlikely to be dangerous, but it can happen. So around a 1 in 3,000 chance of those Evil Man using the nuke spell. Um, 1 in 4 for him doing spells. He'd have to ambush us, pick two spells in a row, and go before our party on the second round for him to nuke us. But that's 200 to 400 damage to the entire party. We do not want to see that. I've never seen it in a run. Uh, but in theory, it could happen. And the white shirt. Filling up our last slot in the inventory. The white shirt casts a defensive buff in the whole party. It's like the ruse spell, and they believe it's half effectiveness. Correct. And then the white shirt and half that half effect and stuff in the full Ruse spell do stack with each other, so if you cast Ruse enough, you'll actually max out your evade at 255. And because of the way that does the damage formula, there's a bug in how it does the two-hit calculation, so it caps that at 255 first before comparing it to evade. So if you max out your evade, you're actually completely immune to physical hits unless the monster gets a critical hit, in which case they ignore what your evade score is entirely. Yeah, only a three out of 256 chance of that happening which doesn't mean it won't happen. It has happened during practice runs. We've had, we've seen some crits. 
Yeah, we've not only seen crits, but also the 3 and 2 to the D6 chance to penetrate through your status resistance yeah. as well, which is generally much more devastating. And we picked up the Adamant, which is going to let us forge the Excalibur, the second best weapon in the game. Um, so we're going to give Excalibur initially to Mr. MV, but it's going to get passed to Bucks at the very end. Mr. MV is going to be our Mazmean ruler here. Speaking of Mazmian, I would like to know how much the Mazmian is worth. So either the price of the Mazmian you see in the screen or the value of the gold that you get for selling it. That is going to be our last trivia question here for the night. Not that you would ever sell it. It is the best sword in the game by a long shot. And to get it from the Temple of Fiends Revisited and, then, and to make your way out would require you to backtrack to refight all of the refight bosses, uh, except for Tiamat 2 and then to cast the warp spell to get out, because there's not even an exit in Temple of Fiends Revisited. So you'd have to go through a lot of trouble to make out of there with the uh, Mazmian. We'll burn that extra step off later, it won't matter. I'm having to burn steps here anyway, so... Oh, we can't go visit the window, though. Yeah, but unfortunately we can't visit the window here, but this is uh, actually intentional for me to burn steps here to skip this encounter. The reason is because for these couple of floors, there is always like a really bad first encounter over there. Like this floor, uh, the reason I got that uh, extra nightmare evil man fight is to get rid of four R hydras. This fight against Sentry Guard gets rid of man casting Medusas, and then I'll do one more skip upstairs. That actually doesn't get rid of a bad encounter, uh, but because the top floor of this dungeon is the highest encounter rate in the game by far, uh, by doing one battle on this next floor, it actually gets rid of two battles upstairs. So I'll go, let's say, right and up here tonight. You can go any combination of two horizontal and two verticals. Um, as long as you don't walk in a straight line, you'll eventually reach where the exit is. And we get three whiz vamps here, so this is a lot of damage, but good XP hauls. Whiz vamps, um, now they got Dazzle. They also have a spell called A-Fire. A-Fire is completely busted. Um, A-Fire misses itself, which is great, uh, so it'll cast it on the rest of the party, but then but when it goes to check to see whether or not they're resistant to fire, it uses the uh, static battle data, um, what happened before it loaded the party in, versus what's currently in combat. So A-Fire doesn't actually give it any protection at all. <laughs> yeah, the list of, uh, of buffing spells in this game that actually work as intended uh, is pretty low. And some of them, like Locke, actually do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I know about that one. It's supposed to reduce the enemy's evade, but instead it increases the enemy's evade? I think so, but then it's like bugs that it doesn't actually check evade. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't even check evade, so who cares? <laughs> there we go, one last delay here. We want to make sure that we do not fight Womack here on this first trip. So we're going to get another sentry and guard here. This is pretty good experience, although the sentry does hit really hard. Yeah, MV might be in trouble, but we do have the life spell, so it's not, not that bad. I prefer not to just because I want to hold on to all of my secure spell charges. They're useful for tier threes in the TMF battle. Gives me a lot more strategic options for how to deal with that fight. It's probably gonna be one of the longest fights that we do. Uh, usually it is the longest fight in the game, even longer than Chaos sometimes. Um, TMF um, can go 10 to 12 rounds, depending on how things go here. All right, this floor here has the highest encounter rate in the game, I think. Yeah, by, by a pretty long shot, so if, um, you kind of look throughout the game, you always see that there's a certain number of steps before minimum in the next encounter. This is the only floor you can actually have back-to-back -back encounters anywhere. It's one of the nice things about having a fixed step cycle as opposed to just pure RNG for step counts is that you don't have to worry about really unlucky clusters of battles. Right, you ever play a Dragon Warrior game that's just like a battle, then one step, then a battle, then one step, then a battle. That won't happen in this because there is a minimum. Or even remakes of this game, too. They completely change how the encounters work. Make it pretty much impossible to manipulate it. I'm gonna save one cure two on each of the mages as well as all my cure threes. So if I wanted to play this a little bit more aggressively, I wouldn't use these heal potions here, but for tonight we might as well go and make sure that we're gonna be safe here on Tiamat. And here we go, 1,000 hit points. He also has really, really high physical defense. So unless we get a critical hit, you're gonna see the fighters do basically one damage. Um, that means probably a lot of rounds, 
Luckily, though, critical to do about 50, so that was two criticals in there. Throw about 100 damage into the fight. Now, we all have elemental resistances right now, either from the ribbons or from the Aegis shield, so that's why a lot of the damage spells that he does aren't going to hurt us that badly, but this fight goes on long enough that we do have to worry a little bit. And Team Metal mostly use um, skills, which are going to cycle through a list of all the different elements. Uh, she can also bite people in the face, which uh, for the mages it's pretty rough, but the fighters can more or less shrug it off. That's probably like the best thing that can happen on one of these rounds. All right, so we're coming up on the halfway point in the fight. I'm feeling pretty good about this one so far. Like a perfect fight is probably a four rounder. Um, I've never seen anything faster than four rounds in this. And certainly up to probably a dozen rounds is not without um, precedent here. In the world record route, we just used the Bane Sword. How many tries did it take you to get the Bane Sword to work? I can't remember in the in the actual world record run. I don't remember how it, it but some it's about four on average. But sometimes it, you can get up to like 16 rounds and, and just die. But it's pretty random. There we go. We got Tiamat down. So all four of our fiends have been defeated. There we go. Level 18. Does everybody get 18? Let's find out. Yeah, but I think it was the only other person who's been yeah. dead so far. So perfectly on our XP route for that. Thank you for that. And level 18 is going to give us three charges of the level 5 spells that is going to be uh, on the life, warp, and cure 3. But here, because we met our donation incentive to fight Warmech, you're going to get to see a rare treat. Jire is going to, well, he's got to go get the Excalibur first, get the upgrade our, our weapons a bit, and then we'll get back to fight Warmech. I'll also buy those 99 heal potions. So I'll get that out of the way. You can do it really in any order because you don't need a lot of the heal potions for uh, the trip up to Warmech. But this is going to be probably about 10 minutes uh, to get to Warmech in there and to do the fight. Uh, so that's why we kind of budgeted the time in there for that incentive. But at this point, probably be a good time to read some donations. Now we should probably just watch these 99 heal potions. Oh, okay. no, I'm just <laughs> <That's> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we actually had a correct answer, I believe, to the last trivia question. The Gaia 89 donating five bucks to notify us that Masamune is worth thirty thousand, but sells for fifteen thousand. I, I mean, you did say thirty. I believe it's sixty thousand value sells for thirty. I have never tried it, um, so I will trust that thirty thousand is one of the two correct sides <laughs> for that. So we'll, we'll accept that. Controversy. <laughs> we'll see how that works out. Uh, we've got some cool stories of uh, memories surrounding this game. Mutated Scott donated $20 to let us know. I got a loan from my grandpa, a cancer survivor, for $20 to buy Final Fantasy when I was a kid. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that until this run. I can't remember if I actually paid him back, though. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks for the awesome run and the commentary. And Corrosive Frost donates $25. My uncle and I played through Final Fantasy together when I was a kid. It was probably the best bonding experience we ever had. I would constantly rent the game, but never really made it beyond the Earth Cave. So I was happy to discover my uncle playing the game and offered to bring my Nintendo Power strategy guide over, and I rode shotgun while he demolished it, with my help, of course. He lost his battle with cancer more than 10 years ago now, but I thought this would be a fitting time to donate in his memory. Snacks72 donates $20 to say, Great music in the FF games. My mom survived breast cancer this past year. She caught it early, but it was still a tough fight. Save the animals. $75 from B90. Both my sisters are cancer survivors thanks to early detection. Thank you, AGDQ. Please go fight that super hard genocide boss. And that's a reference to Undertale, which is our finale game look at the incentives for that. We have $50 and 20 cents from Laser Bomb. Someone showed me another donation which kind of put things in perspective for me and showed me that I should really still be dona donating. Donate to fight the genocide boss and kill your friends. And that's also a reference to <laughs> Undertale and not actually killing your friends. Uh, Dustin98 donates $100 and says, keep up the good work, guys. And as my potion buying thumb gets a good workout here, we are going to have more time for donations when we get um, the walk up to 
War mech there, so I'm going to be basically going through Mirage Tower a second time and Sky Castle. I'll be skipping a lot more battles um, than you saw the first time, just because uh, we can get through there without having to worry about too much about the encounters. And I don't need to do any grinding since we did hit level 18 already. Now we're going to go over to our Dwarf Pit. We're going to actually do one more encounter skip, probably. Um, in a normal run, this would be the setup for um, the RNG going into Temple of Fiends. There we go. And you remember we robbed these guys all the way back at the beginning of the game. Fortunately, we've got these disguises on now, so we've got the class change. They don't recognize us, and we're able to go ahead and get the Excalibur. And there's a funny um, <laughs> check that they did, because this is like, the, I think the only time they put a weapon or armor piece into your inventory directly. And so if your weapon list is completely full, it'll actually say, don't be greedy uh, when you talk to that dwarf. It doesn't <laughs> fortunately give you um, a loss of the, ex of the adamant, so you can go and forge it again later. But it's actually nice that they did kind of customize something, because that could have been like a really generic and bland error message for that. burning off a few encounters here so we can get a good set of monsters leading up to the war mech and get the war mech in the spot where we actually have a chance to fight it. Not one, but twice. But twice, because we might have to run away from the first battle and fight the second one, depending on if it strikes first. The war mech is actually a runnable encounter, uh, which is surprising to most people when they find out that information. Yeah, because the odds of getting war mech if it ambushes the party is pretty low, so this route is designed just to give two chances at it. Well, two chances at at least being a normal battle. I've got two more of these skips to go. There's one. Oh, this will be the last one. I'm going to save one more time. This is actually not to get the RNG saved because it doesn't remember what the RNG was if you were to power off, but um, that does get me uh, another 60 HP back, so almost all of our party is back full health. And we should see the same trap tile monsters that we had back at the waterfall for two battles on this floor. I'm looking like we've got this setup correct so far. And in Mister, you can pretty much read donations up until we get to, um, let's say, the floor before Womack. Okay. Uh, we've got seventy-seven dollars and seventy-seven cents from Ichi Giki. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> from the land of the rising sun. Hope these lucky sevens from Kyoto, Japan, speed you on your way to victory over chaos. Yeah, I used to live in that city too. Uh, we've got two hundred dollars from players A plus B. Great run and thanks for sparing us the poison sound effect this time. <laughs> 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 and Iconoclast donated ten dollars to remind us, hey now, that anonymous five hundred dollar donation definitely deserves some applause. Come on everybody, show some hype out there. All right. $25 from Ashes of Iran, who says, I had to donate during one of my all-time favorite games. My family has just been hit with a recent cancer diagnosis, and I wanted to help contribute to ending cancer. It's been a pleasure watching both Fiesel and uh, Chire run this amazing game. $10 from Dark Eagle, who says, Longtime watcher, first time donator. I had to donate during the original Final Fantasy. It was such an important game to me. It's one of the earliest games I can remember playing and really sparked my interest in D&D, video games, and music. Donation goes to Poexel's Choice for being my favorite GDQ commentator or runner. Thanks for the compliment. We've got $100 from Serotonin2501, who says, Hey everybody, Serotonin2501 here. 
bringing you my early, my yearly donation. I was not able to submit for AGDQ this year due to computer issues. It doesn't stop me from donating to a great cause. My donation is in my grandma Mar Margie Smith's name, who lost her life to cancer a year ago last October. Thank you to all the runners, organizers, and fans who make GDQ what it is. You all give us gamers a good name. Good luck to all the runners, and above all, stay happy, people. And here we are coming up to the third floor of this place. I'm going to go skip one encounter here. This gets, um, again, rid of some bad battles upstairs. You don't have to worry nearly as much with the setup that I do. Basically, the reason why we did those nine battles ahead of time is to get rid of most of the bad stuff going up here so I didn't have to delay very much um, while I was waiting for Warbeck to appear. Warbeck is, um, even though he's a 3 and 64 monster, uh, because it's the highest encounter rate of the game, you can actually get some pretty good spots where you have one or even two Warbecks within a series of a few battles. up and right last time going left and down just to show the floor does wrap around in all directions. All right, here we are. This first one I don't think is going to be Warmick. I think we got one encounter first. Nope. But after this, keep an eye out for gigantic robotic chickens. <laughs> all right, so Fizzle, we got a one tile wide quarter here. Nothing on either side. Do you see giant killer robots in my way? Because I don't want to fight one here. here. I see nothing. So okay, far. so just in case, I'm going to heal up. Uh, let's go ahead and start doing some cure two here. Those are not really valuable at this point. Let's put Yeti in charge of the party. All right, here we go. All right. Okay, no Ooh, strike first. That's nice. good. No strike first, very good. So we'll take this one. Let's see if we can make it work. Uh, just to give you some context, we have never done this successfully in practice. I've done it on emulator a couple of times to, to prove it could be done. Uh, but Warmech hits really hard. He's got nuclear, which does 160 to 320 damage to the whole party. He'll almost always one-shot the mages. That's really good luck that he did not do that there. How many hit points does he have? A lot. <laughs> he also has a broken regen effect, too. So Butt's almost down there, so if he gets another hit in there, I'm not sure if I can bring him back. That 359, really nice, though, really is really good. good. So far, we're in good shape. I'm liking a lot of the preemptive cures. You see, I'm dropping the cures on the person with the Excalibur to ideally get them the best chance of surviving through this. If uh, Butt's dies, that's bad, but not the end of the world. We're going to go straight into all cure threes now. Get bad turn order there, losing our cure threes before we're making us to go this round. Let's see what he does. Ooh, Mr. Oh, Mr. MV gets a punch mm. in the face, so now it is a damage race. We are really, really close. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to double cure three again. This time we do want the mages to go first. We want anything but a nuke. There oh. it is. Oh. This could be it. Yes! Come on, Mr. Come MV. On, come, come on, on, Mr. MV. Mr. MV. Come on. Come on, come on. Yeah! yeah! Really so nice. that's never happened before. It's never <laughs> 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 so Fizzle, I got you some extra experience points for these characters. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get the 32,000 for Mr. MV alone, but um, this is now a bug in the game. Uh, if you earn more experience points than is possible for a level, uh, you'll get experience points only one level up here, and you'll get your next level in the next battle. Um, you have to get a, any experience points at all in that fight, but... Uh, that was pretty good through there. Wormek is the highest XP monster in the whole game. By a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll see a Wormek grinding route, but <laughs> not today.
So even though there is another war mech waiting on this bridge, um, he would have to farm extra encounters in order to actually run into it. Just barely. I'm going to barely <laughs> get off of this before um, we'll fight another war mech because uh, this does have the highest encounter rate in the game. Now, fortunately, most of the squares nearby where uh, Team Ice Lair is does have a huge strip of safe squares, so that's the only reason I can get out of here um, in one piece. Uh, in emulated practice, I have actually beat war mech twice in one go through, but you really have to have perfect setups for both of them. Uh, you don't need any experience here, so we are good for that. I can go ahead and start using these houses. Make sure that we're down to zero before I give you the playthrough again. We want to have no houses or tents left in our inventory at the end of this. Yes, the idea is that we want the heal potions to be located in the lower left corner of our inventory, so it only takes one cursor movement to get there. So we're just manipulating how many of the consumable items we have so we can get the heal potions right in that spot. Yeah, so approximately half of the planned heal potion usage for this run is in the Temple of Fiends alone. Yes, and we very well may use all 99 of them. Good thing about it. Let me go get you your replacement heal potions because I did use a bunch uh, before fighting Gormak here, as well as revive these characters. Time for a couple donations during that. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Got uh, just $100 from Adam G. With no comment. Thanks for very much for that. We've got $50.12 from Giselle, who says, Original Final Fantasy equals the best Final Fantasy. Thanks for running this classic from my childhood. Light Warriors are here to fight cancer. Thanks so much for raising money for this great cause. This donation is in honor of my mother. Or did you want the Thor hammer there as well? Thor should be in the first slot of Ace. Okay. I'll move that here after I get through this. Equip it. Yeah, I know that looks good. That looks great. Be fine. And now that the light warriors have been suitably patched up after getting uh, blasted by Warmax. Trying to do my normal route here, which is not usually going past Warmax, so there we go. <laughs> Inventory good? Yeah, I think so. I should have one encounter taken on the overworld. Let's go ahead and get the rest of them off here. So I'm going to hand this over to Feasel to finish so I got this game out. One more in the yes. overworld now. Yep. Okay. Because now that all four fiends have been defeated, we are capable of uh, finally finding out what the story of the game is, too, because we've just been kind of going around killing fiends and collecting uh, orbs without uh, really knowing why. But uh, now we're about to get involved with some time travel. And we do a mix of encounters inside and outside of the dungeon here because we do want to get um, the correct uh, set over here. Let's see what battle this is before you reset on this. I that saw zombies in there, which I didn't like. Oh, okay. Sorry, you said you wanted to see that battle. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, I think that, that might be right, though. This is a long one. Spider. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that we got this correct because it's really important for Fizzle to have the right RNG getting on the start here. How about I just go up and walk here? Except for the bats. Actually, I, uh, Fizzle, I'd recommend let's do the hard power on here and do the three battles outside again. Right, I want to make, make yeah, total sure. certain that we have this correct because there's a lot of manipulation going on in this last dungeon. What I saw was um, an encounter that I was not expecting right before he uh, flashed it um, inside the temple there. You want to do three outside, right. then five inside to make sure that you've got this correct. Right, right. Wait, was that two outside? Yep. Okay. Here 
we should see some wolves in the background really quickly. There we go. This is the spot where the game began. So we have kind of a reuse of our very first engine of the game for the very last one. Uh, we weren't able to show off the uh, window to the world, which is uh, a spot in Tiamat's castle. That's the only clue that you have that Temple of Fiends is the final part of the game, unless you were spoiled, because there's a lot of information that was provided um, as part of the game's pack-ins. Uh, it had maps and lists of all the monsters so that um, you kind of knew what was coming. In the Japanese version, they didn't have all that information, so it was a real surprise when you got to the Earth Cave. You thought Vampire was going to be the big boss there. Instead, you found out that Lich was going to instead be coming up there. And you got Zombie next? It should be Zombie next. All right, so I think we both agree on the correct RNG here. So you want to take this last battle as close to the Black Orb as possible so that you get the maximum number of steps once we go back 2,000 years in time, we, we go, go from really, really basic encounters. This is the only time we fight zombies in the speedrun, and it's not really um, difficult here, but now we're going to fight all kinds of dangerous stuff. We're going to have Frosties, Chimeras, Jameras, and Badmen on the way to Phantom, who is uh, the first of the six bosses that we have to fight in this place. All right, let's hope not too much Blizzard here. Yeah, this Blizzard Breath is really annoying. It's basically a heal potion every time you see those numbers pop up. Um, they could get a lot of Blizzard Breaths, especially if there is an ambush. There's one more Frost Dragons that we're going to have to fight before we go um, down to the Elemental Forest. We'll also delay a little bit here to get the Chimera and Chimera group. If we went straight ahead, we'd run into a group of Gas Dragons. Gas Dragons uh, are unrunnable, and their only weak element is Ice, which at the same level of Magic tiers as fast, we just absolutely cannot afford to use any of those. All eight spa fast spells are spoken for. And here we go, bad men, five to nine bad men in this formation. We have to uh, not worry so much about these um, because they do not do area effect damage, but if they do kind of all gang up on the mages, they can kind of uh, get a big yeah. attack in there. So eight yeah, bad men right. in an ambush, five to nine in this formation. So this is on the high side. And the ambush means that we have to sit through all of these attacks. Now, fortunately, they're going after the fighter, so feels very little damage. Feels very bad, man. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think they came up with the idea for this enemy? Hmm. It doesn't really look like anything. It's kind of random. All right, so we got to swap Butts and Mr. MB. MB's now in the front for a bit. And the reason is because Butts does not have a ribbon on, so he's weak to the time elemental magic that... Phantom is going to use. You might say time elemental magic. Well, there's actually eight elemental types in this game. You've you guessed the fire, ice, and lightning. You might have gotten like poison and status elements, but there's also death, time, and earth. Um, if you've played Final Fantasy Tactics or later oh, Final Fantasies, you would see those type of elements also appear in there. And Fizzle just destroyed Phantom. Yeah, oh, that was crazy. All right, that we loot. We should have skipped the loot, but I guess since we got it, we may as well play yeah, it. We may as well use it. It's best time to do it. And I love those treasures just in the side by the Phantom. It's got a bunch of gold, which is completely useless at this point in the game. Are there any hints whatsoever in the game that you're supposed to use the loot there? Mm, I don't think so. I, I don't really remember any. I mean, other than that, um, the princess says he's handed down the loot for generations, so it implies it's a very old artifact. And since you're now in the past, this is where it was sourced from. Coming up on Purple Worms. Uh, this is a pretty high XP encounter. It's also unrunnable, so people are going to go ahead and take this fight. Oh, just one. Easy. Yeah, one to two. Uh, Butts doesn't really need any experience points, so he's doing pretty good. Um, Mr. Envy. Actually, I guess it's the other way around. Mr. Envy's got a lot. So we'll have, um, we might actually see level 20 on one of our fighters here, which is going to be atypical. Normally it's 19 for both of the fighters at the end and 18 for the mages. Oh, good. Oh, good. All right, now we're going to enter the elemental floors of this dungeon. And these are really cool. They're themed after each of the four fiends. At the end of the floor, uh, you have to fight the refight of the fiend. And Lich has been super buffed. They've given him, well, they've given all the fiends 100 extra hit points, but they have much better stats and skills. In particular, Nuch is, Lich has got the nuke skill that. Um, we have been talking about for those evil man, 200 points damage to the entire party, uh, which is more HP than our mages have. So if they were 
to be killed by this nuke spell, the Ren would be just dead at that point. There's no way to continue past it. But we're going to manipulate it in the next fight to be Green Medusas and actually take off our Mage's defensive here, put them in the front, and turn them to stone. Uh, when Mages are petrified like that, they're no longer eligible targets in battle, so it's much easier to revive them with a soft potion than it is to hope that either they both live or one of them can cast life. Yeah, because remember, own. there are no Phoenix Downs in original Final Fantasy. You might want to kill one of the Green Medusas here. Should I actually attack them? Do you think? Yeah, because if that's too many, yeah. The only way to revive is with the life spell, and but if they get petrified, um, then he can use a soft potion to do really it. Really nice. Okay. That's, excellent. Excellent. Nice. That's excellent. That's so we've got some cooperation there. We need to have um, the Green Medusas turn our Mages to Stone, which they did. We need them to not paralyze our fighters because they need to fight their way out of this. But uh, we did get one defense sword on Mr. MV, so he's less likely to be paralyzed here. He also has the Mage Staff, which does more damage. That's part of the reason why we want the Mage Staff down there is because he's going to probably get more turns in this. Um, but might get through it. Uh, he has no protection. And if he does, he gets to use the Thor hammer, which does about half uh, as much to it as the Mage Staff will. There we go. Good first round. So we should be able to take him down now that we've gotten uh, only two Gurmaduces left. Uh, significantly reduces our chances of paralyzation there. And we're going to heal up before Lich and get ready for that battle again. One extra hit points to all of the fiends here. So Lich is going to have 500 here in the refight. And maybe one out of every 10 battles, you'll see a Nucleus Lich. Uh, let's see if we get it tonight. It saves you a lot of heal potions as well as time spent healing. Yeah, because I believe it's 75% chances for a spell in the first turn and then a 100% chance for that spell to be nuke. Diesel's using his advanced strats of holding the A button down very hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the fight at Garland again, so there we go. No! No, so short, so close. All right, but we got it. I think we got it here. There nice. we go. Nuke Nucleus Lich. Lich. Wow, that's great. So that saves us a lot of heal potions. Yeah, so pretty much we don't have to worry about our total heal potion count And a here. bunch of time, too, because of not having to use them. We're going to go fight um, Carry next, but first we have to get across the fire floor. And we're going to leave our mages petrified here, uh, because there's a battle against fire elementals coming up. That's another one of those unwinnable battles, three to four fire elementals in that formation. And normally this is where the Egg fighters would get level 19. Hey. Remember those guys. This time they come in packs of four, which would be great to have back at an early part of the game. Uh, Akamas are weak to ice, so you can just mow them down, but we really don't need that much more experience points. We have, after these fire elementals, one group of purple worms on Tiamat's floor, and that pretty much finishes things out every single time. Oh, there we go. Next up, Diesel is going to intentionally waste some steps here by going down and picking up the Pro Cape. Um, I mean, Pro Cape is a nice uh, piece of armor to have, um, but we need to waste steps at some point during this dungeon in order to manipulate where the encounters are going to be located. We need to get rid of a group of sorcerers that would otherwise be on Tiamat's floor. So after this next battle, he's going to put on the Pro Cape. It's the only uh, really useful piece of gear that can go into the Mage's Shield slot. There's Bucklers back at Crescent Lake, um, which is two defense. This is eight defense, so um, a much better trade-off here. So Go ahead, soft them, heal everybody up, uh, put that gear on. Definitely don't want to forget to put the ribbons back on because uh, you are fighting Carrie next. And she's been upgraded to go from Fire 2 to Fire 3. So without ribbons, you take a lot of damage for this. That all looked good. Here we go, Carrie time. Now Carrie's got 700 hit points, and we're going to fast just the person with Excalibur. That's here. this person, right? That's Mr. MV, yes. Okay. Uh, I can't tell by the names and not just the names. It's Unfortunately, he just jumped the gun there. Uh, yeah. Excalibur uh, fighter can actually one-shot carry if he gets a really good hit in. My personal best on this is 733 damage on carry, uh, but usually it's a pretty quick two-round fight. This might be a three-rounder given how badly our fighters did there on that first time. Let's see if Mr. MV can redeem himself here. There's that fire three we talked about. And it's not, not really anything if you've got the ribbon on, but... Um, otherwise, a fire three puts you into really perilous territory for a carry to finish one of the mages off. There oh, we go, 5'11", that's, that's, that's nice going to finish nice it off. Shot. Mm. And Fiesel being very careful with his walking. Um, if you take an incorrect step, because these are just trap tiles for these fiend fights, you fight the boss again if you take a step backwards. So it's uh, important that you don't do that, because these are 
going to suck up in your very limited resources, whether it's your heal potions or your fast charges or other things. And on to Kraken's floor here, we've got two kind of bad encounters just in terms of time because there's a large number of enemies. So if they strike first, it sucks up a, a probably a good 30, 45 seconds there. Coming through this section here, Fizzle's going to take another intentional two safe squares um, out of the route. Uh, this is to move a battle with Gersharks and Big Eyes uh, in front of Kraken instead of behind. And this is like really, really um, important that you're confident about your step route because he is one square in front of Kraken right there. Heal up again. Make sure everybody's at full strength for this fight. This is one of the. This is probably the fight that I am most nervous about overall because Kraken can one shot the mages. We're gonna put up a bunch of buffs. If he goes first though and decides to attack the mages, um, it gets yeah, very very Kraken, hectic. Kraken here. can do more damage than the HP cap in this game too. Yeah, we're gonna I start by rusing, ruse, 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 and white shirt. And yeah, so the. You think the HP cap would be, you know, 999, so damage will also be 999 for the max, but uh, Kraken can break that, and it does display correctly. Of all the things that are not working or not tested in the game, they got four-digit damage totals to display correctly. Uh, fortunately, we did get the buffs up there, so that reduced it from eight hits that he would normally get to four hits. If that had been a mage that's a one-shot, um, even for the fighters, if they get um, good luck on the criticals, um, they can be one-shot still through there. So you do have to hope that you get the buffs up there in time. Now once we have the fast spells out, um, it's generally up to the fighters to go and finish this guy off. We can do more buffs with the mages just to be extra safe. We're going to ruse and the white shirt again. Uh, two white shirts plus a ruse is pretty much enough to get you to the max cap for evade. Uh, Kraken can get multiple critical hits per turn, so it's not like he's going to miss every time. Uh, but you know he's down to like two or three attacks, I think, depending on what you are in the um, RNG cycle once you've got that up. Uh, Yeti could actually even get one more Ruse spell here because he's just gotten the two white shirts. Uh, let's see, she should, he should Ruse. He can just fight. No, I mean, probably can't because he's already he's fully maxed. maxed. Uh, and he can Ruse. Okay. There you go. Yeah, so nice. There we go. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I would say that's the hardest fight in the game, but he just beat the actual hardest fight in the game, so. <laughs> Yeah, people have actually done uh, ROM hack, which pitted uh, Warmech versus all four fiends at the same time, and Warmech wins every <laughs> single time. <laughs> <laughs> so now here on Team Matt's floor, we've got our final elemental floor to get through. But first, before going after the boss, Fiesel's going to pick up the Mazmu. Mazmu is the best sword in the game by a long shot. A lot more attack power, accuracy, and critical hit rate than anything else that you can get your hands on. This is going to be Mr. MB's weapon at the end. So Mr. MB is going to be very important to protect, make sure that he is fully buffed um, and ready to go in all the fights that are coming up. It's noteworthy too that the Mazamune can be equipped by any character regardless of class too. Like, I mean, my friend that I played this with um, as a kid and I kind of had different schools of thought. Like he liked to give it to his white mage so that she had something to do when she wasn't healing. And I like to give it to I th either a red mage or a knight, I think, to... Uh, buff them up even more, but for the speed run, I mean, we, we want to basically pump our knights up with as much offensive power as possible, so one of them is getting the Mesmion. And this purple room formation right here is the second highest um, XP formation in the game. We've gotten four purple rooms at 16,000, but that, even that is half of what Warmech gave me, which is 32,000 for winning that. Very nice. We're down to our last couple random encounters. It's the last random encounter in the game that we have to fight. We've got the battle with Team at left, and we've got the battle with Chaos. So the rest of them, Air Elementals and Rock Elves, we're just going to run away from. Fortunately, these are the only runnable Elementals in the game. This would be and a much weird. slower floor otherwise if that wasn't true. Okay. Like there is, um, because of the sorcerers that you have to dodge around, not a lot of good paths through here. Um, if you're taking more steps, you're going to start running into Zombie Ds and Whiz Vamps. Yeah, that's a really tough battle. Um, I picked the Purple Worms over the Zombie D Whiz Vamps because uh, even though the Purple Worms do a lot of damage, they're not going to paralyze you. That's the big fear um, here in the late game. 
So we've got Mazarin, that's going to go on Mr. MV. We're going to pass the Excalibur down to... Excalibur equipped, Mazmian equipped, Defense equipped, Sun equipped. So now we're going to warp with Yeti. Make sure that we go back to the previous four. This saves us about four encounters because Tiamat's so close to where the entry stairs is. Um, Fiesel's got the last random encounter in the game right here, Rock Golems. The fiends One more are run. getting restless and they get progressively further away from the uh, stairs they're supposed to be guarding on each floor. I just like it's a really big surprise for this one. You get nowhere near the exit stairs and you just run to the boss like right in the face. This is where it'd be really nice to have some visual indication where the four fiends were standing, but nope. Here we go. We're going to fight, fight, and fast, fast. So this is more traditional. Um, this is one where even though Tiamat has even more hit points and even more physical defense than before, the Excalibur and Mazmian do so much damage in here. Um, if we get a good, fast hit Mazmian shot in, it's like 600. It's much, much uh, easier to deal with this one. And this is typically a two-round battle. This might be a three-rounder of shame, though, for Fiesel, unless we pick up the pace. I'm um, working on it, sorry. I'm really, I'm <laughs> pressing this A button so hard right now. <laughs> All right, Bing, cross your fingers. Three and 256 that it kills somebody. Okay, oh, good. All right. I had that happen to me two weeks ago um, where Bane killed the fighter with the Mazmune on. And then this fight gets really scary because that's the reason why you're able to deal with Tiamat so quickly. The Excalibur, you know, it's nice, but uh, nowhere in the same league as Mazmune is. All right, here we go. Four Fiend refights are complete. We have one battle left. But before we get there, we need to do a little bit of shuffling. We're going to put the ribbon onto our front fighter. We're going to heal the party up. And in thanks for all the things that the Yeti has done for us, it is time to put the Yeti in charge of the party. He's going to lead the fight into chaos here. All this shuffling here, too, is just designed to take advantage of the predictable targeting that Chaos will do to these characters, depending on what slot they're in. We want the character with the Maz immune to be the least likely to be targeted, and uh, the uh, mage that does not have a ribbon to be the most. Here we go. Battle with Garland. This is pretty easy when I did it. I don't think you're going to have any problem now that we've done all this grinding, Fiesel. I guess not. There we go. Oh, oh whoa, Chaos. Oh, oh. 2,000 hit points to get through here. This is yes. a really tough fight. So he's going to fast and fast. He's using the top mage to fast the person with Excalibur because Yeti could actually die here as soon as instantly um, once we get into the fight here. Chaos, though, decided to use the ice spell. So this is the first of his four spells. If he gets four spells off, that's cure four. We do not want to see that. All 2,000 hit points come back. And we've done about th 400 damage here so far in the fight, so this is something where uh, we need to worry about our progression versus um, chaos here. And if you get chances, I would just do cure threes on Yeti because he is not long for this world. You want to keep him alive? No, just on uh, on anybody else. Oh, from Yeti. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So now we did get a punch by chaos. Um, that's actually really scary because he can. Um, paralyze somebody, but fortunately he picked the Yeti. Um, if he paralyzes the fighters, it is really, really critical that they snap out of it in a hurry. Oh, there's some good hits in there. I'm liking it so far. But again, four spells in Cure 4. That's there a second goes. spell, so now it's a race against the clock. He's got two spells this left. This next spell is going to be slow, too, and we do not want him to do that on Mr. MV. Oh, Mr. MV. He punches the mage. Uh, that's bad for him. Um, Todd is probably going to die here, but this is really good for the rest of the party. We do have a very good shot. There's our third yeah, spell, but yeah, hopefully this, this round. Come on, come on, come, come on. on. Oh, that was weak. Oh, weak. No. That was so weak. oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Now so it's his next spell is cure three, four. Todd. On oh, Todd. Yeah. Oh, okay. We want to try to keep him alive. It's here not guaranteed that he's going to do it this turn, but yeah. if he does cast come the spell. On. No. no! So now we have 2,000 more hit points to get through. This is now where it gets really dangerous. Eighth spell in his spell list is Nuke. We absolutely cannot let him get there. We do not have enough healing left. So we're going to continue trying to drop Cure 3s. Uh, I would say, let's take the last Cure 3 from Mr. MV. Yeah, I agree. There's Crack. Crack is a skill. That would have killed Yeti because he does not have Earth weakness. But fortunately, that's not a spell. It's not advancing the spell count yet. 
Okay, we're seeing some more good damage numbers for our players. If only we had seen that before the Cure 4 went yeah. off. All right, so Cure 3 MD, I think? Uh, I'd say the Cure 3 for the Aryan. Let's Cure 2 yeah, on Todd cure here. Todd. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Now, the big thing, once we get past the next skill, which is Inferno, then it gets to Swirl and Tornado. Those are non-elemental. They do a lot of damage. We're getting close, though. Yeah, we want to see more of those good hits. There's Inferno. So this okay. is where we have to worry about the fighters starting to lose a lot of HP in our hearts. So this is where we're going to save that Cure 3 for Mr. MD4. We want to get him back up to full HP. The next one, Swirl and Tornado, could kill Todd. So this is like a race here to just get all of his useful right. spells out of the way. But come, come on. on. Come on, come on. Oh, Yay! Yay! It's time, by the way. <laughs> Sub four. Nice. Sub four with Warmack. Wow, nice. That was a really good run overall. Yes. So I am really happy with that. Without Warmack, that would have probably been a sub 345, um, which was my personal goal here. 333 is the best that I've done with this route. Um, it is definitely one which is really challenging, and we had almost nothing go wrong in this. We had no dungeons that we had to retry. We beat Warmack, which I'm still in total shock that that happened. I think only one party member death to... Um the eye in the entire right. Run. One to the eye. Well, Getty's there as well, oh, but you oh, know, yeah. he's he's kind of that, an unfortunate that's, that's casualty. That's expected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here we go. We're going to watch the end credits here. This is actually part of the speed run because at the very end of these credits, which tell you finally what the game's about, um, all the story that you don't have throughout here gets gets stuffed in at the very last bit. Um, but at the beginning of the game, you might have remembered that I got a counter with five imps and I had a chance to strike first. And I actually knew that I had five imps and that chance to strike first. And nowhere else did we really know what was going to happen combat-wise. It's because by watching the credits all the way through, when it draws the end of that cursive script, it actually reuses the battle RNG seed for whatever reason to draw those out. So by watching it, you know what the very first battle of the game is. And without that, you'd be facing those imps with those party members that have like terrible chances to run. That's why, you know, it's so important for doing these speed runs to complete it every single time. Um, and again, my personal record, 25 can't runs in a row in that first battle, obviously. That's not a good way to start, but being able to get that guaranteed run is such a great feeling because it makes it so consistent up through at least Garland. But with that, you know, Feasel, how do you feel about that run we just did? That was, you know, really intense through there. There's a lot of butt-clenching moments in that chaos battle. We had a lot of luck. Uh, I remember a lot of um, surprise attacks. We surprised the enemies a lot, especially in the ice cave. That was probably one of the most worrisome parts mm -hmm. of the run, but that went so smoothly. Yeah. Got a Nucleus Lich, too. Yeah, too. the Nucleus yeah. Lich, exactly. You defeating Warmack. I mean, all kinds of good things. Uh, none of the mages dying uh, when we needed them to level up. Yeah, really yeah, rub, rub whip yeah, missed from yeah, Astos. Yeah, rub missed on Astos <laughs> against one of the mages. Yeah that, yeah, that was crazy. Well, Poexo, what did you think about the run? This is the f fourth or fifth time you've seen me do a Final Fantasy run in the marathon. Three mm -hmm. different versions of the game. Um, I'm impressed. I mean, both both at the both at the run, uh, but also just the amount of planning that it took in order to make this possible to to get a run that was about close to 20 minutes faster than your uh, RPG Limit Break run two years ago with fighting Warmack on top of that, too. Uh, yeah, and definitely I, job well done. I enjoyed this run quite a bit. You know, we did, I think we just crushed it. I don't think there's anything left to show in Final Fantasy 1 for the NES here. So I'm glad that we got this into AGDQ, showed all the content in here, did the impossible, and <laughs> made sure that we even still came in under, like, our conservative estimate was four hours without Warmack um, when we first put pitch this um, as part of the submission process. There we go. The, the Light Warrior is returning home 2,000 years from the past, except for Yeti, the yes. left behind. Unfortunate casualty. <laughs> it's probably where the loot got left behind as well. I just want to take a moment to let you guys know that while this run was going on, and we had some ground uh, to cover to do this, we topped $450,000. Nice. <laughs> And just want to take a moment to thank all the fabulous uh, Final Fantasy-related donations we got. I wasn't able to get to all of them, but they were all read and, and much appreciated. Thank you very much for all your donations. Mm -hmm. Sick. May the orbs always shine. shine. Here we go. Now we can just see where a lot of the budget for this game went. <laughs> so we only had one cutscene in the entire game, which was crossing the bridge, but now we get 
Etch-A-Sketch finale. I mean, Nasir did a tremendous amount of really brilliant programming. Uh, one of the things was it was just so difficult to port over that they had to completely rewrite these games uh, for all the ports. So the Wonderswan version was the first major rewrite for it that was then got used for GBA, PSP. Uh, you can get it on iOS and Android now. There's all kinds of different versions of the game. And they all tend to have their own little quirks and charms for speedrunning in here. You didn't mention uh, his name in the credits. The check, the, the check on it. Oh yeah, that's one last thing I guess we'll put in there. <laughs> yeah. Nasir uh, actually did put some copy protection at the beginning of the game. If you change the word Nasir in there, uh, it crashes the game on the start. I guess it was something that um, they were kind of worried about back in the day, but that's the end of Final Fantasy. And with that's, that, that's that's told by the game itself. All right. Take it over, host. All right. <laughs> All right. All right, thanks very much, guys, for that fabulous run. We're going to kick it quickly over to a Twitch ad. Folks, thanks for sticking with us here as we plow our way into the North American late night hours. We've got some excellent games uh, for the NES coming up here uh, with another run by Fiesel and Mythical 9. They're going to be playing Gauntlet here next. Following that, we'll have Kabuki Quantum Fighter, also by Mythical 9. And then Cobra Triangle by Shining Dragoon and the Cryon Conquest by Bad Breaks. So stay tuned for those. <laughs> 